The Metal Gear franchise turned 35 years old this year. As a celebration, I, Suggestive Gaming, decided to take this opportunity to cover the extensive storyline of my favorite video game series. I'm going to be handling this video slightly differently than others I've done, as I'll be tackling all of the events of the series, not just the games, in chronological order, or at least as much as possible. While this does take the punch out of some twist reveals, I think it's the best way to really appreciate the depth and complexity of this story. Now, because this is going to be one of the most complicated timelines I've ever covered, I've enlisted the help and vocal talent of fellow Metal Gear Superfan and video game store owner, Game Trade Greg, from YouTube channel Drop Rate and podcast Game Talk Radio. Check those out in the description below, and if you're ever in the area, check out Game Trade in De Pere, Wisconsin. Do note that the franchise has seen some spin-offs and non-canon titles released over the years, and as such, they will not be covered in the main section's chronology. As a bonus, however, we will cover nearly all of their stories individually at the end of this video, just for completion's sake. That being said, there are some non-canon things we won't be covering. And that's the NES port of the original Metal Gear title, since the story is very similar to the MSX original, save for a few minor changes, the bad ending of Metal Gear Solid, any mini-games from the re-releases of Metal Gear Solid 2 and 3, including Snake Tales and Snake vs. Monkey, as well as any VR or challenge missions in the games. Another note is that while they sit outside the core storyline written by Hideo Kojima, we will treat the PSP title Metal Gear Solid Portable Ops, as well as the spin-off Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, as canon entries in this video, since they still tie into the mainline Metal Gear story. Feel free to take these sections with a grain of salt, as their canonicity seems to be a point of personal preference. One final note. For the story of Metal Gear Solid, we will be using the original 1998 release of the game to illustrate it, not the 2004 GameCube exclusive remake, The Twin Snakes. While the remake follows the same storyline and has some nicer visuals to boot, we saw it fit to represent that chapter with Hideo Kojima's original, non-missile jumping vision just as Metal Gear Solid 4 intended. Now, without further ado, this is what you need to know about Metal Gear. Our story begins in the year 1914, where, in the wake of World War I, 12 of the most powerful and wealthy individuals from the United States, the Soviet Union, and China, known as the Wiseman's Committee, form a secret society which they name the Philosophers. In 1922, one of the Wiseman's Committee has a daughter, who is raised under the care of the Philosophers, and through her father, she learns of the group's true nature and deepest secrets. By the end of the 1930s, all of the original members of the Wiseman's Committee have died, and in 1939, World War II breaks out. To secure their country's victory in the war, the remaining appointees of the Philosophers pool together a massive sum of funds called the Philosopher's Legacy to be used to develop new technologies and weaponry. In 1941, the young woman raised by the Philosophers, now codenamed The Joy due to the pleasure she received in battle, is offered to come join the British Special Air Service as an advisor. There she meets a British major named David O, and the pair work together on several missions. In 1942, a Navajo man known as Code Talker regretfully works with the U.S. military to help turn his tribe's language into a cipher for secret communications, while simultaneously studying the biological traits of parasites. That same year, the United States begins the Manhattan Project to research and develop massively debilitating nuclear weapons. Among the researchers involved is a scientist named Dr. Emmerich. Meanwhile, during the Battle of Stalingrad, the Joy forms an elite unit of soldiers from the various countries in the Allied Powers, each with superhuman abilities thanks to the resources provided by the Philosophers, which she names the Cobra Unit. The soldiers in this unit include those codenamed the Pain, the Fear, the End, the Fury, and the Sorrow. The Joy, now taking leadership over the others, takes on a new codename, one she'll be much better known for. The Boss. During their work together, the Boss and the Sorrow begin a romantic affair. During a mission in 1943 to assassinate Manhattan Project scientist John von Neumann on suspicion that he's a secret Nazi spy, the Boss discovers that she's pregnant. 
This distraction causes her to fail the mission, getting hit by a bullet that grazes her skull and puts her into a coma for six months. The next year, 1944, during the D-Day landings on Normandy, the Cobra unit is sent in, and the boss gives birth to her child on the battlefield through a rushed caesarean section, and agents of the philosophers quickly take the newborn away from her. In the confusion after the end of World War II in 1945, the Russian officer in charge of the philosopher's money laundering operations, Boris Volgin, secretly steals the remains of the philosopher's legacy, leaving a microfilm of the ledgers to his son, Yevgeny Borisovich Volgin. The same year, Dr. Emmerich has a son named Huey. Two years later, in 1947, the philosophers, unaware of Boris Volgin's actions, begin to fight over control of the remains of the philosopher's legacy. This spurs the outbreak of the Cold War. These tensions cause the Cobra unit to disband. In the year 1950, the boss meets a young soldier named Jack, and she takes him under her wing, teaching him her vast knowledge in the acts of war. The pair later develop a method of close quarters combat, or CQC, together. Around 1945, Major O meets a deformed assassin codenamed Skullface, who, after killing Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, defects from the Soviet Union and begins to work for Major O in the shadows. In 1954, Jack assists with the airborne test detonation of the hydrogen bomb on Bikini Atoll. While he is able to avoid serious side effects from his exposure to its radiation, Jack is left sterile after the event. Five years later, the boss suddenly abandons Jack with no explanation. By the year 1960, the boss's son, Adamska, is recruited by the U.S. National Security Agency to work as a codebreaker under the codename Adam. However, he and his partner, Eva, defect to the Soviet Union. The next year, President John F. Kennedy earns the disapproval of the philosophers. Around this time, the United States, needing human data for the space race, secretly send the boss into space as part of the Mercury Project, worked on by a scientist known as Dr. Strangelove. In 1962, Major O, now working for the United States Central Intelligence Agency, helps Soviet scientist Nikolai Sokolov and his family defect to the United States. Shortly after, the Soviets send missiles towards Cuba, triggering the Cuban Missile Crisis. In order to persuade the Soviets to stand down and prevent nuclear warfare, President Kennedy returns Sokolov to the Soviet Union, where he is forced to return to his work developing a secret weapon. Around this time, the philosophers threaten to kill Adamska if both his parents, the boss, and the sorrow remain alive, prompting the sorrow to ask the boss to sacrifice him for their child's safety. This caused the woman to shoot him through his left eye, killing his body, but due to his skills as a medium, his spirit is left to walk the earth. In 1963, President Kennedy is assassinated in Dallas, Texas. In 1964, the CIA learn of the Soviet Union's secret weapons potential power, and they plan the Virtuous Mission for the newly formed Force Operation X, or FOX unit to send in their first agent, the boss's former pupil, Jack, to extract Sokolov from his KGB guards. David O, now going by Major Zero, or Major Tom for this particular mission, is tasked with leading the mission, and he simultaneously sends in his secret support unit, XOF, led by Skullface, to covertly provide support and cleanup. Fox fly over Sokolov's position, and Jack, now codenamed Naked Snake, performs the first halo jump to drop into the region. With radio support from Zero, Fox medic Dr. Clark, codenamed Paramedic, and the boss, reuniting with her former student, Snake is able to find Sokolov, who warns him about Colonel Yevgeny Borisovich Volgin of the GRU, who plans to capture the scientist to obtain the research for his weapon to use as leverage to overthrow Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev and install his own replacements. As Snake leaves with Sokolov, he is stopped by KGB guards, but they are soon killed by an arriving Gru Major, Ocelot, who secretly is the boss's son, Adamska. Ocelot calls his men for backup, and after a quick exchange, Snake subdues the Major using CQC, 
and Sokolov runs off in fear. After Snake takes out Ocelot's men, he gives the young Major a tip that a revolver would more suit his firing style, complimenting him and telling him, you're pretty good, before Ocelot passes out. Snake later finds Sokolov, and the pair spot his unfinished weapon, the Shagohod, a tank with the ability to launch nuclear missiles, which, if Sokolov is forced to finish, would spell the end of the Cold War and the beginning of a new World War. As Snake and Sokolov cross a rope bridge, the former is shocked to find the boss approaching, carrying two boxes from the US Army. The reunited Cobra unit then arrive and capture Sokolov, carrying him up to a Hind A gunship. Colonel Volgin soon arrives and reveals that the Cobra unit have defected to the Soviet Union, and the boss states that Sokolov is her gift to them, along with the two boxes, which contain Davy Crockett recoilless nuclear warheads. The boss then easily overpowers Snake in CQC, breaking his arm. As Volgan goes to finish Snake with his own superhuman electrical abilities, the boss stops him, offering to do it herself. She holds out her hand, and Snake grabs it, just before she swiftly throws him off the bridge. Snake grabs the boss's bandana off her head as he falls to the river below. The Cobra unit then leaves to take Sokolov to their research facility to finish the Shagohod. Two hours later, as the injured Snake washes ashore and nurses his wounds with paramedics' guidance, he watches a fleet of gunships carrying the Shagohod. Aboard one of them, Ocelot and Volgan transport a woman who is supposedly Sokolov's wife, who happens to be holding a KGB-concealed lipstick pistol. Volgan then decides to test out his new toy and fires one of the Davy Crockett missiles, aiming it at Sokolov's old research facility while planning on blaming it on the boss. Meanwhile, Snake watches the destruction from the shore while he awaits his extraction. In the days following the Virtuous mission, Volgan and the boss are blamed by United States President Lyndon B. Johnson for the nuclear attack on the research facility. To avoid nuclear escalation, Nikita Khrushchev demands the U.S. prove their innocence by assassinating the boss. Likewise, Major Zero approaches Snake about clearing Fox of any involvement with the boss's action, with the CIA deciding the only way to do so would be to have Snake execute the assassination mission himself. Failure to do so would result in a death sentence for both Snake and Zero, forcing them to comply. Snake, now donning the boss's bandana as a memento, is then sent by drone back into the region as part of Operation Snake Eater, again with Zero, now using this as his codename, and paramedics supporting via radio, along with Donald Anderson, known as Mr. Sigent, an expert on weapons technology. The mission requires Snake to work with two KGB spies, Adam and Eva, to rescue Nikolai Sokolov once again, destroy the Shagohod, then find and terminate the boss and Volgan. Unbeknownst to Snake and the rest of Fox, Major Zero again secretly sends Skullface and the XOF unit to work covertly to ensure the operation's success at any cost. On his way to rendezvous with Adam, Snake is surprised to come across the boss, who taunts him over their previous encounter and warns him to go home. Snake refuses and tries to subdue her, but she easily overpowers him in close quarters combat, disarming him before destroying his drone and riding off on her white horse, which stomps on Snake's hand. Later, Snake reaches the rendezvous point, but instead of finding Adam, he is met by a woman on a motorcycle. However, when Snake questions her with the first half of their passcode, who are the Patriots, she's unable to respond, Lolly Lule Lo. When a Gru unit ambushes them, the woman is able to single-handedly take them out. She introduces herself as Eva, and the pair discuss Adam and Eva's past, as well as the current mission, and Snake compliments her Chinese pistol. Eva then gives Snake a pistol and the scientist disguise to infiltrate the lab where Sokolov is being forced to work. After convincing Snake to rest for the night to help heal his wounds, Eva sneaks outside and uses a briefcase radio to contact an unknown party. At dawn, Snake awakens, and he and Eva spot Ocelot and his unit. Eva gives Snake a kiss goodbye before escaping on her motorcycle, and leaves Snake behind to keep Ocelot busy. After defeating the Ocelot unit, Snake spots their leader holding Eva hostage. Snake and Ocelot again banter over the young man's weapon choice, with his current gun of choice, an adorned single-action army revolver, being a bit too showy for Naked Snake. When Ocelot tries to shoot Snake, he finds his barrel empty, allowing Eva to escape to her motorcycle, which she uses to incapacitate Ocelot. 
After a bit more conversation, Ocelot gives Snake a farewell gesture before running off. Eva pulls her gun, but Snake, feeling a fondness for the young man, stops her from firing before she speeds off on her bike. Snake continues to the lab, but encounters Ocelot along the way. The pair battle one-on-one -on -one until they are broken up by one of the Cobra unit, the Pain, whose army of controlled bees force Snake to escape by jumping into a cave below. Inside the cave, Snake is met by the Pain, and he is forced to fight and defeat the violent beekeeper, who explodes after the battle. Snake emerges from the cave to find a warehouse where Sokolov and his lover, Tatiana, who is actually Eva in disguise, are being led by Volgan. Using his electrical powers to torture Tatiana, Volgan forces Sokolov to comply with his orders. Ocelot arrives and begins to play Russian roulette with Sokolov, frightening the man, before the boss takes his gun and scolds him. The fear and the end then emerge and are tasked with killing Snake. Volgan then takes Tatiana and enters the warehouse, leaving the boss behind where she feels a premonition of the sorrow. At this point, Snake has a quick opportunity to kill the end, preventing the elderly sniper from completing his mission. But if he doesn't, the man is simply wheeled into the warehouse. Snake follows and soon reaches the research lab, where he dons the disguise given to him by Eva to get inside and find the director's office, where he meets Dr. Alexander Leonovich Granin. The drunken director is surprisingly friendly to Snake, and tells the young man about his history as a weapons developer. Granin holds a grudge with Sokolov, whose Shegohad won research funding over his own bipedal mobile nuclear delivery system, which he calls Metal Gear. Frustrated that his creation will never see development, Granin tells Snake that he is going to send the plans to his colleague in the United States, Dr. Emmerich. After Snake compliments Granin's shoes, a gift from Tatiana, the director fills Snake in on the philosophers and their legacy, which is now funding the Shagohad through Volgan. He then reveals that Sokolov is now at Volgan's main base at Groznygrad, where the scientist is finishing preparations for the final tests that will commence the following day. Granin then spitefully agrees to help Snake get to the base to stop Sokolov and destroy the Shagohad, giving him a keycard to bypass security to make his way to the entrance of a secret tunnel. On his way to the tunnel entrance, Snake is sabotaged by the spider-like member of the Cobra unit, the Fear. Despite the Cobra's venomous weapons and prototype stealth camouflage suit, which renders him momentarily invisible, the Fear ultimately falls in battle to Snake, exploding afterwards, much like the pain. After the fight, Snake receives a call from Eva, who asks him to meet her in some ruins at the top of the nearby mountain so she can give him a key to enter the underground tunnel. Much to Snake's confusion, as he points out Granin already gave him a key, which she simply states won't work. She then warns him that the Cobra unit's elite sniper, The End, is waiting for him in the jungle at the foot of the mountains. Snake soon comes across the sniper, and the pair engage in a grueling, lengthy, long-range battle. While the man is apparently energized by the sun through photosynthesis, the battle can go on so long that the elderly man passes away due to old age. Whether natural causes or Snake's bullets bring the old man's life to an end, the battle concludes with him exploding as well. Afterwards, Snake reaches the bottom of the mountains and approaches a ladder, which he climbs, and climbs, and climbs to reach the top. He soon finds the ruins and meets with Eva inside, changing out of her Tatiana disguise. She gives Snake the key to the underground tunnel and warns him that his time is running short. She also informs Snake that he'll have to disguise himself again in order to get into Grozny Grad's weapons lab, this time as Gru Major Ivan Rydonovich Rykov. The pair then plan their escape afterwards, with Eva set to pilot a ground effect vehicle from a lake nearby. Eva tries to seduce Snake but the pair are interrupted by a gunshot from Grozny Grad. They rush out to the cliffside and Eva hops on her bike to return to her role as Tatiana at the base. Snake observes the base through binoculars and spots Volgan repeatedly beating on an oil drum. Volgan then blasts the drum into the air to reveal a dead Granin inside. Volgan then removes a transmitter from the dead man's shoe and determines the director was being used by somebody for information. An arriving Major Ocelot disagrees with the Colonel's methods. The boss and Tatiana arrive shortly after, and the former reveals the deaths of her Cobra unit members at Snake's hands. She then warns Volgan to tighten security, believing Snake to be on his way, as she leaves to retrieve the Davy Crockett weapons. After Volgan leaves, Ocelot is left alone with Eva, and after recognizing her perfume, he notices she's wearing different boots, but nonetheless leaves her be. 
Snake makes his way into the tunnel and is met by the final surviving member of the Cobra unit, the jetpack donning, flamethrower wielding former cosmonaut. After another battle, Snake again emerges victorious and the fury explodes like his fellow Cobras before him, collapsing the tunnel as Snake escapes. Snake reaches the weapons lab, where he knocks out Rykov and uses an advanced mask designed by Sigent to disguise himself as the Gru Major. Snake gets past security and silently observes Sokolov secretly handing over a microfilm containing the Shagohad's research data to Tatiana. After she leaves, Snake reveals himself to Sokolov, but the scientist explains that he is too late, and the Shagohad is about to enter Phase 2, which will allow the tank to travel at over 300 miles per hour, enabling it to propel an intercontinental ballistic missile at a higher velocity and travel a vastly longer distance. Based on the Phase 2 prototype, Volgan plans to mass-produce the weapon to end the Cold War and spiral the world into widespread nuclear warfare. To prevent this, Sokolov tasks Snake with planting explosives on the Shagohad's fuel tanks to destroy the weapon. The scientist then reveals that he knows Tatiana is a spy, posing as Volgan's lover, but does not recognize the name Eva. Sokolov tries to deny Snake's rescue knowing that even if he is extracted back to the United States, he'll be forced to create weapons of mass destruction. But Volgan soon arrives and interrupts their conversation. While Snake is able to get his disguise back on, Volgan quickly uses some... observational techniques to determine that he isn't the real Major Rykov. Volgan then shoots Sokolov in the knees, allowing Snake to wrestle his gun away and incapacitate him. This victory is short-lived, however, as the boss arrives and quickly bests Snake in CQC and removes his mask. Volgan proceeds to torture Snake to pay for what he did to Rykov, before questioning him in Sokolov, apparently killing the latter in the process. Snake refuses to talk, and the boss informs Volgan that she trained him not to fold under torture, so his efforts will be in vain. During the beating, however, a transmitter falls off of Snake's body, and the boss states that she planted it on him so that the Cobras could ambush him. Volgan, suspicious of this answer, given that all of the Cobras failed despite having a tactical advantage, asks the boss to prove that she isn't still loyal to her apprentice by cutting out his eyes. The boss then takes out her knife, but before she can use it, Tatiana stops her. Ocelot, questioning her loyalty, begins to test her with his Russian roulette, but Snake swings his body and knocks him out of the way, causing Ocelot to accidentally fire his weapon right next to Snake's eye, with the resulting muzzle burn blinding it. The boss slaps Ocelot for this behavior, and Volgan leaves. Ocelot then punches Snake in the back, secretly placing the transmitter in one of his wounds while musing about his new appreciation for the art of torture. After he leaves, the boss takes one of Ocelot's guns and shoots Snake in the leg before slipping him the weapon and telling him to run. After the boss leaves, Tatiana, now alone with Snake, whispers to him an escape plan, then leaves him alone to figure out how to escape his cell before the guards arrive. Snake passes out from his pain and exhaustion and wakes up in his cell in Grozny Grad's brig. After using a fork to take out the bullet the boss shot him with, he discovers it to be hiding a fake death pill. Snake befriends his guard Johnny and learns that the man has a family, including a son sharing his first name back in the United States. While Johnny doesn't let Snake out of his cell, he does give Snake back his cigarettes, which are secretly a knockout gas delivery system. Snake uses them, or another method, to escape his cell and find Eva's escape path. When he gets to the sewers, however, he gets a call from Eva informing him that Volgan discovered his escape, locked Groznygrad down, and sealed off the escape route. Ocelot and his unit arrive and give chase, and Snake is soon cornered at the end of the tunnel with a drainage waterfall overlooking the river below. When Ocelot pulls a gun, Snake is forced to dive off the ledge into the river, the impact of which nearly kills him. When Snake regains the strength to move, he comes across the shadowy apparition of the Sorrow. The spirit then forces him to trudge through the river, haunted by the souls of all of those he has killed on his mission so far. At the end, the sorrow disappears and Snake falls dead, but the hidden pill stored in his tooth prior to the mission to counteract the fake death pill's effect revives him. As Snake reawakens, the sorrow reveals his relationship to the boss, as well as the truth behind her killing him. Once out of the river, Snake calls Eva and the pair agree to meet in the caves behind a nearby waterfall. There, Eva arrives on her motorcycle and the pair share a night together, during which Eva finds the transmitter Ocelot planted in Snake's back. 
The next morning, she gives Snake some C3 she stole out of the fortress, instructing him to plant the explosive on the Shagohod's four fuel tanks before giving him a key to unlock the area. Eva snaps a photo of Snake with a camera hidden in her button for insurance, before riding through the waterfall on her motorcycle once again. Snake makes his way back to the weapons lab using the key to reach the Shagohod's hangar. There, he plants the C3 on the four fuel tanks, setting a timer for their detonation. But before he can leave, he is confronted by both Volgan and Ocelot, who have an unconscious Eva captive. The boss then surprise attacks Snake and disarms him. Ocelot then holds Snake at gunpoint, and Volgan reveals that they discovered Tatiana was a spy. He then goes on to inform Snake about the Philosopher's legacy, as well as how he came to obtain its wealth, as well as how it was used to recruit the boss to enact his plan to bring order to the world. Volgan then hands the boss the microfilm of the Legacy's ledgers, and she takes Eva away, leaving Volgan and Ocelot to deal with Snake. While Ocelot tries to challenge Snake, Volgan stops him, lowering a platform to fight Snake man to man. To make it a fair fight, Ocelot tosses Snake a pistol and a knife. While Volgan's power of electrical control proves to be a challenge, Snake ultimately emerges victorious. Afterwards, Volgan commands Ocelot to shoot Snake, but the young man refuses, stating that he made a promise to the boss. The explosives are discovered and the facility is evacuated, leaving Snake and Volgan alone for one more battle, which Snake again wins. With Volgan incapacitated, Snake escapes and exits the hangar, finding Eva on her bike outside. The pair ride off just before the C3 detonates and Eva reveals that the boss let her go, and is currently waiting for Snake at the nearby lake to give him a chance to complete his mission. Before the pair can make their way to the lake, however, the Shagohod emerges from the ruins of the facility, still intact, and piloted by Volgan. Eva then drives her motorcycle while Snake fires from the sidecar, taking out Volgan's men, despite Ocelot's interference. The pair then lead the Shagohod to a nearby bridge where Eva previously planted a C3 charge. Once the Shagohod passes, Snake shoots the charge and destroys the bridge, but the giant tank is able to use its acceleration to avoid falling into the waters below. Snake and Eva then mount her bike once again, and after sharing a good luck kiss, they battle the Shagohod again, this time disabling it. Volgan exits the tank and controls it manually using his electrical powers, but Snake fires on him and brings him down. The Colonel refuses to give up, but a storm rolls in, and when a bolt of lightning strikes the man, he bursts into flame, finally taking him down for good, as he is left in a comatose state atop the Shagohod. Eva and Snake bask in their victory, but their celebration is cut short when Volgan's men give chase. The pair escape on Eva's motorcycle, but she soon crashes. After a rough landing, Snake is able to nurse their wounds with paramedics' help. They then sneak past the remaining defenses and reach the lake, where Eva finds their escape craft. Snake leaves Eva to confront the boss, and soon finds her in a nearby field of white grass lilies. Snake asks the boss why she's doing what she is, and she tells him that she, like Volgan, planned to reunite the world in the wake of the two world wars. Seeing no meaning in the idea of enemies and allies, the boss envisioned a world with no borders while returning from her mission to space. The boss fills Snake in on her history, as well as the philosophers, and finally shows him the snake-shaped scar on her abdomen, from where her baby was cut out of her on the battlefield. After thanking him for listening to her story, the boss prompts a battle between the two, pulling her weapon, called the Patriot, and claiming that whoever wins will inherit her title. The former pupil and master then battle amongst the flowers, with Snake eventually besting his friend and mentor. As she lays dying, the boss gives Snake the Philosopher's Legacy microfilm, as well as her weapon, asking him to kill her. After taking a moment to gather himself, Snake aims the Patriot at the boss and pulls the trigger painting the field of white lilies red with her blood. As the boss's spirit reunites with the sorrow, Snake returns to Eva at the escape craft. As the pair lift off, they are surprised by Ocelot, who arrives on a flying platform and boards the craft. Snake bests the young man in CQC, but Ocelot challenges him to a standoff, finally introducing himself as Adamska, before asking Snake's name, which he reveals as John. The pair choose their guns and draw, but it's only a ruse set up by Ocelot, who bids farewell and exits the craft. Eva and Snake then successfully fly out of the area, but are followed by Russian air forces who are soon called off by Khrushchev himself, allowing the pair to escape to safety. 
Snake and Eva later reach a safe house in Alaska where they spend the night celebrating. The next morning, Snake finds Eva missing, with only a recorded message left behind in her wake. In the message, the woman reveals that she was not the real Eva, who was in actuality a man, nor did she ever work for the KGB or the NSA. Instead, she was a spy sent from the People's Republic of China to retrieve the philosopher's legacy for the country, which she was able to steal and escape with, along with the Shagohad's data, while Snake was asleep. She reveals that she is an agent of the Philosophers and apologizes for deceiving Snake, revealing that while she was ordered to kill Snake, she made a promise to the boss, so she refused. Finally, she reveals that the boss's defection, as well as all of her actions following, were nothing more than a ruse, political theater in order to recover the Philosopher's legacy for Washington, D.C. The boss's death at Snake's hand was her final duty to her country, one that they both were able to fulfill. Later, Snake and his Fox companions meet with several high-ranking government officials, including United States President Lyndon B. Johnson, who awards him with the Distinguished Service Cross before claiming that he has surpassed the boss, giving him the title, Big Boss. Snake salutes the president and shakes his hand, but as he exits, he refuses to shake the hand of the CIA director. An official from the Department of Defense then speaks with the CIA director about setting up a unit like Fox in the Army, and led by somebody like Big Boss to handle top-secret sneaking missions. Snake leaves the event alone and visits Arlington National Cemetery, where he finds the boss's grave marker. There, he leaves her gun, as well as a bouquet of white lilies. Tearfully, he salutes her grave, knowing that her true intentions, as well as her legacy, live on only in his heart and mind. Sometime later, Ocelot calls the chief director of the KGB to inform him of Groznygrad's destruction, as well as Khrushchev's downfall. However, right after, Ocelot calls a director of the CIA, revealing that he was a triple agent and that the boss's mission was a success. The philosopher's legacy now rests in America's hands. The film The Fake Eva Stole was a fabrication, and the remaining legacy, or at least half of it, was returned to the United States which they plan to use to revive the philosophers. He then theorizes that the KGB must still have part of the legacy. Ocelot then reveals that he obtained the plans for Granin's nuclear attack system and promises that he is always at the CIA's disposal before hanging up the call. Immediately after the events of Groznygrad, Volgan's comatose body is recovered by Soviet scientists and transported to a research facility on the outskirts of Moscow where it is kept alive and experimented on. Similarly, the Navajo parasite researcher Code Talker is assigned to the autopsy of the end, and discovers that his photosynthesis abilities, as well as some of the other cobra's powers, were the result of ancient parasites that infected their vocal cords. To further study these parasites, Code Talker retrieves living samples and injects them into his own body for observation. Following the success of the Snake Eater mission, Sigand joins the U.S. Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA. Shortly after, Eva disappears, with her last known location being in Hanoi. Around this time, Big Boss meets a young child soldier in Mozambique, known as Frank Jaeger. His surname evolved from the German word for hunter. Big Boss places the boy in a rehabilitation center, but he is soon abducted by the CIA and used in secret experiments to create the perfect soldier by suppressing his emotions. Sometime later, Ocelot secretly locates the other half of the philosopher's legacy and keeps it in his own possession. By 1970, Major Zero retires and Big Boss leaves the Fox unit, which goes rogue shortly after. In November of 1970, the rogue Fox unit sends one of their agents to attack and capture Big Boss, bringing him to a prison cell on the San Jeronimo Peninsula in Colombia. When Big Boss, still commonly known as Naked Snake, awakens, he is met by Fox member Lieutenant Cunningham, who interrogates him on why he left the Fox unit after Groznygrad, as well as the location of the missing half of the Philosopher's Legacy. Snake, unaware of the missing half's existence, gives no information, causing Cunningham to leave him for the time being. In his cell, Snake meets his fellow prisoner, an American Green Beret named Roy Campbell, 
who shares his plan to escape the cell by removing an air duct cover and traveling through them to reach the adjacent room. Snake does so, finding and donning Fox's new experimental sneaking suit in the room. Snake finds Campbell's cell, and the man tells him about the history of the base they're currently imprisoned in, an unfinished Soviet missile production facility that has been overrun by the Fox unit. Unable to open Campbell's cell, Snake instead heads to a nearby communications base to attempt to make a call for rescue. There, he broadcasts an encrypted signal, which is picked up by paramedic, who informs him that Zero has been arrested on suspicion of treason connected to Fox's revolt, in which Snake's former unit stole a top-secret weapon before fleeing the country. She also reveals that Snake has also been charged for the crime. After their discussion, Sigand calls to provide his own assistance to Snake, advising him to capture whoever started Fox's revolt so he can clear his own name. He also suggests that Snake try to convince some of the Russian soldiers recruited by Fox to join his cause instead. After finding the key to Campbell's cell, Snake returns and unlocks it. Snake then asks Campbell for his help in clearing his name, which the man accepts despite his injuries and illness hindering his movement. With Campbell now leading the mission through radio support, he sends Snake to the Green Beret's target, a nearby Soviet patrol base. When Snake arrives at the base, he eavesdrops on a conversation between two guards about the powerful stolen weapon, which can supposedly obliterate all major cities in the motherland. Snake also learns of some kind of secret document in the base, and he sneaks in to recover it to find that it outlines the details of a launch plan revealing that Fox plans to actually use the secret weapon. Campbell determines that the best way to get more information would be to recruit a soldier who is disgruntled with Fox's current commander, a man known only by the name Gene. Snake knocks out a Soviet soldier stationed nearby and brings him to a stolen truck with Campbell. The pair then interrogate the soldier, named Jonathan, and ask him to help free the soldiers from Gene's command. Jonathan refuses, telling them that the Russian soldiers willfully joined Jean, hoping to create their own nation after their government abandoned them on the peninsula after shutting the weapons facility down. Snake gives Jonathan a talk about loyalty, and upon learning of his true identity as Big Boss, the captured soldier agrees to join him. Soon after, Campbell's illness gets worse, and Jonathan fears that he has contracted malaria. Snake returns to the communications base and calls paramedic, who suspects Campbell to be infected with a particular strain of the malaria parasite, directing him to find a nearby medical facility to look for preventative medication. Jonathan gives Snake the location of a small hospital that recently got an unusually large shipment of supplies, and Snake heads there. Unfortunately, he finds no sign of the supplies, finding only a manifest of outgoing materials sent to a nearby lab. Meanwhile, a helicopter flies over, in which Cunningham orders a search team to find Snake and Campbell. Hoping to locate the malaria drugs, Snake heads to the research lab. There, he overhears Gene, Cunningham, and a scientist discussing an experimental super soldier codenamed Null. Snake then sees their psychic specialist, Ursula, who is tasked with keeping Null controlled. Further inside the lab, Snake finds Null asleep in a culture tank, and he immediately recognizes the young man. A woman resembling Ursula then enters, claiming to be in charge. As soldiers enter the room looking for Snake, the woman quickly hides him in a locker. She covers for Snake, and when the guards leave, she introduces herself as Ursula's twin sister, Elisa. Elisa proceeds to fill Snake in on her history with her sister, who was seemingly one of the most powerful psychics in all of the communist world, leading to the pair being taken by Jean years ago as part of a Fox mission. She then shows Snake Null, and explains that the young man has been erased of all of his memories and emotions to make him a better soldier. This treatment unfortunately requires a recalibration in the culture tank after every mission. Elisa then gives Snake a medicine for the malaria before showing him to an escape route telling him to head to the harbor. After treating the squad's malaria, Snake forms a spy unit to perform recon. Snake and the group are then able to locate a heavily guarded bridge to reach the harbor. After planting TNT at various facilities in the area to distract the guards, Snake is able to cross the bridge safely and reach the harbor. There, Snake witnesses Soviet Colonel Skaronsky 
arguing with a man Snake recognizes as his former Vietnam War partner, codenamed Python, about Fox's takeover of the base. Python throws Skaronsky in a cell, then freezes the lock with his specialized liquid nitrogen equipped suit. After Python leaves, Snake questions the eccentric colonel, and the latter expresses his shared disdain for Gene, who has taken over his base. Snake then shoots the frozen lock, freeing the man before walking off. Snake then searches the harbor and finds an out-of-place crate with Made in USA written on it. He investigates the crate to find it mostly empty, but with some spare equipment left behind, leading him to believe it once contained the secret weapon Fox has stolen. Snake soon receives a transmission from an unknown caller, who thanks him for taking care of Volgan before introducing himself as Privideni, the Russian word for ghost. Ghost then reveals that the weapon Gene stole was much like Sokolov's Shagohod, a nuclear tank, but this one can fire multiple warheads at once. Additionally, this weapon uses the bipedal walking concept that Granin envisioned for his Metal Gear. Ghost theorizes that Fox must have had a US government official involved in the theft, and they are probably hiding out at the nearby airport. Ghost then asks Snake to stop Metal Gear, and the pair wrap up their conversation. Snake and Campbell continue to recruit more allies, and eventually learn of the location of Fox's warhead storage facility. When Snake tries to infiltrate it, however, his progress is halted by Python. The man reveals that after being injured in Vietnam, his body became unable to regulate its own temperature, causing the CIA to develop his unique suit to keep him alive. The pair then battle, and despite the freezing abilities provided by Python's suit, Snake emerges successful. Afterwards, Python warns Snake that if he hopes to stop the uprising, he must be prepared to hold his men's lives in his own hands. Snake then helps Python to his feet, and the pair leave together to regroup with Campbell. Campbell realizes that the warheads have been shipped from the storage facility, and remembering his conversation with Ghost, Snake decides to go to the airport to find the US government official involved in the smuggling of the Intercontinental Ballistic Launch Metal Gear, or ICBMG. After sneaking inside, Snake finds the official and learns that the warheads were brought to a nearby missile silo. After locating the underground silo, Snake infiltrates it to look for the ICBMG. At its entrance, however, Snake is stopped by Null, and the pair fight one-on-one. -on -one. During the battle, Snake recognizes Null's moves from his time in Mozambique, but he isn't able to explore the thought, as Cunningham arrives with a group of soldiers, who proceed to capture Snake. After losing contact with Snake, Campbell and their men begin to search for him. After questioning a guard at the silo, they learn that Snake is currently being held in a nearby safe house. There, Gene and Cunningham interrogate Snake, but his CIA training makes getting any information out of him nearly impossible for the uprising leaders. Gene asks to speak with Snake alone, and after Cunningham leaves, he reveals the truth to Snake, that the theft of the ICBMG was secretly orchestrated by the CIA to prolong the Cold War in order to keep the age of soldiers and spies alive so they would maintain their power and importance. As it turns out, Fox was instructed to steal the Metal Gear, then pretend to defect to the Soviet Union. Gene, a product of the US government's successor project, was engineered to be the ultimate battlefield commander, modeled after the boss herself, and chosen to lead this uprising, but he decided to instead birth his own new world. Meanwhile, Campbell's men continue to interrogate guards and use their intel to locate the exact location of the safe house. Sometime later, Gene speaks on a phone call with Major Ocelot, and the pair discuss that the Soviet Union has agreed to stay out of Gene's plans. Gene then asks who is helping Ocelot behind the scenes, theorizing that it's the man with the same code name as Null, Zero. The pair then wrap up the call, agreeing to meet again in Gene's new world. Afterwards, two guards rush into the room, but Null arrives in tow and kills them. The perfect soldier, obsessed with completing his mission to kill Snake, asks where he's being held, but Gene stops him, and has him taken back to his preparation chambers. As Campbell's men continue to search for Snake, he is met by Elisa in his holding area. 
the woman is able to use her own limited telepathic abilities to secretly tell Snake that Jean has begun preparations for Metal Gear's ballistic launch of nuclear warheads. She predicts that the weapon has been taken to the assembly plant to be loaded with the nukes, and pleads that Snake take this opportunity to prevent the attack. After finding the location of the safe house, Campbell's men, led by Jonathan, infiltrate and find Snake, cutting their leader free of his bindings. On their way out, however, they are stopped by Cunningham, who again asks Snake where the remainder of the legacy is hidden, shooting his men to force him to talk. While Snake continues to deny any knowledge about the legacy, Cunningham reveals that the Pentagon told him Snake stole the KGB's half. Suddenly, a truck plows through Cunningham's men, driven by Elisa. Snake loads his wounded men into the truck, and they all escape back to Campbell. Snake introduces Campbell to Elisa before the two head off to search for the location of the assembly plant. On the way, Elisa confides in Snake and tells him more about her and her sister's history, revealing that she betrayed Jean after learning that he had nuclear warheads, which she believes should never be used in any circumstance due to her parents dying in the nuclear explosion that later led to the development of her and Ursula's ESP abilities. Snake shares with her his own experience with nuclear exposure at Bikini Atoll. Elisa tells Snake that despite her sister's vision of Snake plunging the world into fear, she still believes in him and thinks he'll make a great father someday, an idea he quickly shoots down due to his sterility. The pair find the assembly plant and Snake leads the way, infiltrating and finding Metal Gear. As Elisa and a group of Snake's men arrive to meet him, however, Gene arrives with his men, halting their progress. Suddenly, Metal Gear activates and begins to open fire, hitting Gene's men. The pilot then reveals himself as Colonel Skaronsky, taking revenge on his former men. Snake uses the distraction to rush over to Gene and hold him at gunpoint, demanding he call off the rest of his men. Gene then reveals his true trump card, gesturing to Elisa and saying, Wake up, Ursula. Elisa then pleads with Snake to shoot her before Ursula awakens, but the confused man simply watches on as Ursula's personality awakens within Elisa. Ursula then tells Snake that she will kill him before he can, quote, spawn his accursed snake children before knocking him down. Jean then reveals that through the experiments conducted to strengthen the girl's abilities, her personality split into two, the powerful but emotionless Ursula and the compassionate Elisa. Ursula then uses her abilities to take control of Metal Gear, jostling Skaronsky out of the cockpit before taking his place at the helm of the weapon. Snake is forced to then fight Metal Gear, using explosives to take out its legs to expose its weak points and eventually bring down the massive weapon. Snake tries to rescue Elisa, but before he can, Metal Gear explodes, leaving her in the blast. Seeing their means of threat now gone, Jean's men lose their will to build their new nation and throw down their arms. A frustrated Jean then chastises Snake for taking out his Metal Gear Raja, but sees how the soldier caught Ocelot's eye. Snake asks what Ocelot has to do with anything, but Jean shrugs the question off. Snake then hears a frantic cry from Ghost, appearing in the flesh to be Nikolai Sokolov, alive and well, who reveals that this Metal Gear Raja wasn't the real ballistic launch Metal Gear, but instead a test model produced for performance evaluation. Sokolov, who was rescued from Volgan's prison camp by Gene, admits that he is still grateful to the man, but cannot allow the launch of Metal Gear. Snake then spots the real intercontinental ballistic launch Metal Gear flying overhead, and Gene uses his unique power of speech from the successor project to warn the soldiers in the area about the end of the Cold War, riling up a sense of fear and paranoia over who their real enemies would be afterward, stating that one of his men is in the crowd, preparing to kill them all. This causes gunfire to break out amongst the paranoid men, and Jonathan takes a bullet for Snake, dying from his wounds. As Snake lays with his fallen comrade in his arms, Gene escapes amidst the chaos. Snake and Campbell then focus their efforts on the nuclear launch silo, learning that they must take out power to the area to get past the lock on the gate to its entrance. 
After planting a timed explosive on the nearby power substation switchboard, Snake rushes back to the silo. On his way, however, Snake spots a pile of dead soldiers and finds the culprit nearby, Null, indiscriminately killing anyone in his path to Snake. Null expresses his frustration that Snake still lives. It's at this point that Snake realizes that Null is none other than the boy he met four years prior in Mozambique, Frank Yeager, now in his teens. While Null recognizes this name, he refuses to cast aside his role as the perfect soldier, instead attacking Snake. The two fight, and Snake is able to beat this perfect soldier in combat. Afterwards, Jaeger remembers Snake, who apologizes for leaving him in the rehabilitation center to be abducted by who he believes were the philosophers. Jaeger forgives Snake, thanking him for saving him, and the pair leave together before the time bomb goes off. Snake is then able to reach the silo and enter the gate, reaching a freight elevator down to the underground facility. During his trip on the elevator, however, he is confronted by Cunningham atop a flying platform. Surprisingly, Cunningham states that he doesn't answer to Jean, but instead to the US Department of Defense, who, after growing threatened by the CIA's growing influence and power, orchestrated Jean's stealing of Metal Gear as well as Snake's involvement to purposely make Gene fire nuclear warheads at the Soviet Union, embarrassing the CIA on the world stage and putting the Pentagon back in charge. Cunningham then reveals his own mini nuclear warhead to blow up the base and cover up the operation. Cunningham orders Snake to head to the facility's roof to a helicopter that'll take him back to the United States while Gene fires the nukes at Russia, but he meets this demand with a drawn pistol. Refusing to live his life like his mentor, Snake decides to be loyal to himself, refusing to allow the nuclear warheads to launch. Cunningham refuses to let him pass, though, forcing Snake to fight. Snake is able to damage Cunningham's flying platform, but the lieutenant decides that if he's going to die, he's taking Snake with him. He then arms his miniature nuke, but before he can fire, the platform explodes, killing the man and luckily leaving his weapon unlaunched. At the bottom of the freight elevator, Snake finds the control room. There he sees Jean standing around the bodies of the dead Metal Gear engineers, who the man claimed killed themselves after feeling the guilt of their crimes. Snake then informs Jean of the Pentagon conspiracy, and the man reveals that he was aware of everything all along, including Cunningham betraying him. Jean states that he was simply using the CIA to execute his own plan, to launch Metal Gear's nukes at the CIA headquarters and the Pentagon in the United States, destroying the Philosopher's Twin Layers in one fell swoop. With the world fallen into chaos and without the Philosopher's control, Gene then plans to rebuild it in his own design. Gene plans to call his new organization of soldiers he'll lead, Army's Heaven, but Snake denounces his idea, stating that under Gene, there would be no heaven for soldiers, and they would instead look for somewhere outside his heaven. Gene compares these new soldiers to the boss, angering Snake, who claims Gene is not worthy to speak her name. Gene then tells Snake that he wasn't given the truth behind the boss's sacrifice. Gene claims that Vulgan launching the Davy Crockett, triggering Operation Snake Eater, was not a change of plans, but was instead a setup from the beginning. The entire situation, including Snake killing the boss, was planned by a single, deviously cunning strategist working for the United States. Snake demands Gene tell him this individual's identity, but he refuses, simply stating that the boss died for her calling, and now Snake will do the same. Gene then places his hand on the Metal Gear's launch button, but as he presses it, the council explodes, and Elisa appears, reunited with her other personality. Elisa states that nuclear weapons should never be used, and she can feel the pain and suffering they cause. Jean throws a knife at her, but she is able to foresee the attack and dodge it. Realizing this, Jean instead outmaneuvers her physically, grabbing her and stabbing her in the chest before simply walking off to find another way to launch Metal Gear. Snake rushes over to speak with Elisa, who tells him that Jean is headed to a backup control room, and he must stop him. Snake agrees, and Elisa looks into his future, realizing that her and Ursula were both right about him. He will destroy Metal Gear, but create another in its place, 
and one of his children, which she referred to as Les Enfants Terribles, will bring the world to ruin, but another will save it. Snake asks her what she means, but she dies from her wounds, and he leaves her to stop Jean. Snake soon reaches the backup control room, where he finds that Jean has already put Metal Gear in launch mode. Jean then challenges Snake to find out who the true successor to the boss is, and after a grueling battle, Snake emerges the victor, proving to Jean that the successor project didn't create the better soldier, but perhaps the key was in Snake's genes. Snake tries to stop the nuke's launch, but Jean tells him to give up and leave instead, handing him a microfilm containing the equipment, personnel, and funds he amassed to build Army's Heaven so he can carry on the legacy and become the true successor, before Jean dies. Snake then calls Sokolov and asks how he can stop the missile launch, and he states that while there's no way he can stop the launch sequence, if Snake can somehow dismantle the Metal Gear unit on the missile, which allow for the intercontinental ballistics, he may be able to stop it from firing the nuclear warheads. Using an RPG, Snake tries to damage the missile, but finds its armor too strong. Snake's men then arrive and offer their help as thanks for giving them a reason to fight. The nuclear missile launches into the air, but thanks to the combined effort of their gunfire and Snake's rockets, the Metal Gear unit fails to activate, and it instead explodes in the atmosphere. Sokolov calls Snake to congratulate him on his success, but gets no response. Meanwhile, the director of the CIA is being led to a secure bunker to avoid the nuclear attack, but he is met along the way by Ocelot, who introduces himself as Adam. The director states that he's holding a briefcase containing the information on the Philosophers, including its members and the location of the half of the Philosopher's legacy that was returned to the CIA. Ocelot then shoots and kills the director's guards. As the director asks Ocelot what he's doing, the young man states that he's ending the Philosophers, taking back the other half of the legacy to make the world the boss envisioned a reality. He then aims his revolver at the director, firing and killing him. Sometime later, Snake returns to the United States on a cargo plane, and he speaks on a call with Campbell, who has recovered from his injuries, asking him about what happened to Frank Yeager. Campbell states that the man survived, but with physical and mental wounds that will likely land him in the hospital for a long while. The pair then bid farewell, hoping to meet again one day. Snake emerges from the plane and is met by paramedic, Sigint, and Zero, who provides him with a packet of documents. Later, he reads these documents in his hotel room to learn that they detail the formation of a special forces unit of the U.S. Army called Foxhound, which he is tasked to command after proving his abilities as a leader. At some later point, Ocelot receives a call from the man who was secretly feeding him information, Zero. The two discuss the director of the CIA's death, which Ocelot staged as a suicide. Ocelot gloats that Zero's plan worked out perfectly, including obtaining the second half of the legacy and using Snake as an insurance policy. Zero then expresses his desire to study the battle data from the Perfect Soldier program to apply it to a project involving manipulating the human genome. Intrigued, Ocelot agrees to help with this project, but only on one condition, to recruit Big Boss into their new organization, which he refers to as the Patriots. Zero, Ocelot, and Big Boss form a successor group to the Philosophers, along with Sigint and Paramedic, with the goal to use their resources to work behind the scenes of world government to build the world the Boss envisioned. Shortly after their formation, Big Boss is able to rescue Eva in Hanoi, and she joins the group as well. However, Zero and Big Boss begin to disagree on what the Boss intended, causing a rift to grow between the two. Zero, now using Big Boss's reputation as a means to inspire the world to follow their lead, begins to fear that he'll lose his figurehead. As a contingency plan, Zero carries out his idea to replicate Big Boss's soldier genes, a plan officially titled Les Enfants Terribles. Using an egg donated by her Japanese assistant, Paramedic is able to fertilize it with Big Boss's DNA to create eight embryos which are transferred into Eva's womb to be carried. Two embryos are engineered to survive, one to express Big Boss's dominant genes and the other to express his recessive genes. 
Both clones are also genetically modified to rapidly age, to ensure a shorter lifespan as a failsafe. Nine months later, Eva gives birth to the twin snakes, named Eli, later known as Liquid Snake, and David, later known as Solid Snake. Using this research, another clone is created later, with the same dominant and recessive genes as Big Boss, in order to create a genetically closer clone, but also with a stronger aging acceleration. This clone is later called Solidus Snake. Upon learning of the project's existence, Big Boss becomes furious and splits from Zero. Feeling alone and betrayed, Big Boss leaves the United States, as well as his position in Foxhound. Around the same time, Eva and Ocelot also part ways with Zero. Without a country to call home, Big Boss begins to travel, working as a mercenary for various countries. On one of his assignments in Colombia, he meets a guerrilla leader and fellow mercenary named Kazuhira Miller, whom he spares in combat. Big Boss then forms his own mercenary outfit called Militaires Sans Frontières, Army Without Borders in English, and convinces Kazuhira, or Kaz for short, to join. The pair then work to recruit other like-minded mercenary soldiers into this new organization, now colloquially known as MSF, and stationed off the Barranquilla coast of Colombia. Meanwhile, Code Talker continues his studies on parasites and small organisms, discovering a strain of archaea that metabolizes uranium called the metallic archaea. On November 4, 1974, Big Boss, simply going by Snake, is met at the MSF base by Kaz Miller, who arrives with two guests, a man with a red mechanical prosthetic hand who introduces himself as Professor Ramon Galvez Mena from Costa Rica's University for Peace, along with his 16-year-old student, Paz Ortega Andrade. Galvez asks for the MSF's help with an advanced armed group that has been seen in Costa Rica, who he believes are connected to the CIA. Because of Costa Rica's peace constitution, which disallows them from having an army, Galvez asks MSF to drive the forces out of their country. In lieu of payment, Galvez offers a forward operating base, an offshore plant in the Caribbean. While Kaz is excited at the prospect of a new base of operations for MSF, Snake refuses to be treated like a pack of dogs of war, instead recommending that Costa Rica try to negotiate instead of using force. Galvez then reveals that he isn't there on behalf of the government, but instead on Paz's accord. Paz, who had been captured and tortured by the unknown forces while searching for her lost friend days prior, proclaims that she will do anything to protect her namesake, Peace. Galvez then reveals that they know Snake's true identity as Big Boss, which is why they came to him. Later, Kaz tries to convince Snake to take the deal, as they could use a base to put down their roots and expand MSF. Snake brushes it aside and instead believes that Galvez is likely KGB, looking to scare off the unknown aggressors, who Snake also theorizes are backed by the CIA. Snake then goes to speak with Galvez and gets his true mission out of him, to force the CIA out of Central America to let Russia control the land and win the Cold War. Galvez then reveals that the CIA has something planned for the area, and asks Snake to learn what it is. Galvez then plays a cassette Paz's friend recorded during their capture, and on it, Snake recognizes a voice, one that shouldn't exist. Galvez then confirms that the voice on the recording belongs to the legendary hero, The Boss. Intrigued to find out how The Boss could be alive in Costa Rica, Snake takes the cassette tape and agrees to the job, stating that he's doing it for Paz. Days later, Snake infiltrates one of the CIA facilities, where he overhears a guard mention the loading of spears on a cargo ship. He questions the guards to learn that the cargo is headed to Irazu, in the mountains, but a fight causes Snake to knock out the guard before he can learn more. Snake then witnesses an unknown aircraft fly above, seemingly singing some kind of melody. Snake calls Kaz and informs him of a map he found, as well as evidence that the CIA are bringing nukes into Costa Rica. Snake heads out to work with the Sandinista National Liberation Front, or FSLN in native Spanish, to retrieve intel of the area, while Kaz works to conduct repairs of their new offshore facility, which he names their Mother Base. Snake soon locates a Sandinista base, where he finds the commander of the group's daughter, who informs Snake that her father has been killed. The young woman, Amanda Valenciano Libre, 
reveals to Snake that she also believes the hostile group to be CIA and that she has seen them bringing in heavy equipment. During their conversation, the group is suddenly ambushed by the singing aircraft Snake saw earlier. The aircraft opens fire on them and Snake is just barely able to shield Amanda from its gunfire. As several smaller drones arrive, Snake is able to shoot them down, after which Amanda reveals that the craft is an unmanned weapon, a robot. One of the drones then captures Amanda's younger brother Chico and flies off with him, forcing the FSLN to give chase. Shortly after, however, Amanda herself is captured by one of the drones, but she is able to cut herself free, dropping her to the ground below. Amanda makes a hard landing, breaking her leg, which allows the kidnapper drone to capture her yet again. She yells to Snake to shoot the drone, and he reluctantly does so, destroying the drone and causing Amanda to fall into the jungle below. Snake rushes to Amanda and finds that she has narrowly survived the fall. Amanda tells Snake about a nearby banana factory which is secretly a front for a drug refining plant set up by the KGB for the FSLN to run. Amanda laments keeping the operation a secret from Chico and asks Snake to head to a prison in the mountains to look for him. She then passes out and Snake has her taken to Mother Base to recover while he looks for Chico. Snake soon finds the boy in his cell, who seems to know where the cargo coming into the region is going, to a tunnel into the mountains which is guarded by a giant monster known as El Basilisco. Chico then reveals that despite his young age, he was able to find out about the drug operations in the banana factory. Snake then offers to take Chico back to Mother Base, but knowing he gave up information while being tortured in captivity, he fears returning to his companions. Snake then gives the boy a chance at a new life and has him sent to Mother Base. Snake then heads to the train depot and finds the nukes being taken away in a fleet of trucks through the tunnel. A tank then rolls up and attacks Snake, destroying the tunnel's entrance and prompting a battle. Snake is able to single-handedly take out the tank and a troop of ground units, and he receives an alternate path into the mountain from Chico. Snake follows the route and finds the facility where the trucks were taken. Searching the trucks, Snake finds a strange man named Mr. Kojima, but not much else, leading him to conclude that the nukes had already been offloaded. Snake continues into the facility, soon overhearing an argument between two men regarding the actual launch of the nukes. One of the men, a wheelchair-bound engineer, Dr. Huey Emmerich, wishes for his creation to merely act as a deterrent, while the other, CIA station chief for Central America, named Hot Coldman, wishes to fire the nuclear warheads to prove their nuclear strength. Coldman then states that Huey's creation, a bipedal locomotion nuclear launch mechanism called Peace Walker, is built off of stolen ideas. He then pushes the man's wheelchair down a stairwell before walking off. Snake runs over to Emmerich and frantically asks where the nukes are being held. Before he can answer, the two men then hear propellers and Snake rushes to a hangar, where he spots the singing aircraft carrying away a large bipedal machine alongside a gunship. A tank then arrives, equipped with an artificial intelligence pod affixed to it, piloting the machine. The AI-driven weapon, codenamed the Pupa, attacks Snake. After disabling the tank, Snake climbs inside the AI pod to remove its components and destroy the craft. After the battle, Snake speaks with Huey, who takes credit for inventing the Pupa before even introducing himself. Huey tells Snake that the Pupa was only one type of his unmanned weapons, the others being a flying, singing type he saw before, the Chrysalis and a treaded type called the Cocoon. Huey then tells Snake about Peace Walker, his mobile nuclear launcher, Chico's Basilisco, based on the Metal Gear idea as well as Coldman's idea to launch it to prove its usefulness as the perfect deterrent. Huey, the son of one of the leaders of the Manhattan Project, believes the only way to achieve peace is by removing human intervention. To achieve this, he invented the individual AI pods to ensure that any country launching an attack would immediately be retaliated against by Peace Walker, leading the entire world unable to use nuclear warfare. Hoping to stop Coldman from launching his demonstration, Huey leads Snake to the Warhead's location, a base near the border. Huey then reveals that while he gave Peace Walker a basic brain, called the Reptile Pod, the project is still missing its critical piece, its Cerebrum AI for unmanned high-level decision-making which is currently being developed in a nearby research lab by Dr. Strangelove. Huey then gives Snake his ID badge for security clearance, as well as a letter from him to give to Strangelove, which he instructs Snake not to read. Snake then asks Huey to join MSF in their outer heaven, and he agrees, leaving Snake to find Strangelove's lab. 
On his way, Snake finds a French ornithologist named Cecile Cosima Caminade. Cecile had entered the area looking to record the native bird, the Quetzal, but instead captured two women discussing something, the very same recording that Paz gave to Snake. Cecile was captured by Strangelove, but eventually escaped and found a large canister-shaped object where she heard a voice say the name Jack over and over. Cecile tells Snake about an ID badge she stole during her escape that was subsequently recovered by her captors, and he has her extracted back to Mother Base before continuing on his way. Snake reaches the AI facility only to find that Huey's ID badge no longer works, so he begins to look for the one Cecile used instead. After consorting with Cecile over radio, Snake and Kaz discuss the origin of the tape with the voice of the boss that Paz claims was from her friend. However, Cecile told Kaz she had never met Paz before a matter Snake decides to revisit later. Snake is able to find the guard who took her ID and retrieve it from him, using it to enter Strangelove's facility, hidden inside some Mayan temple ruins. Inside, Snake spots a familiar white horse, the very same horse that once belonged to the boss. Snake then hears his former mentor's voice before Dr. Strangelove appears to greet him with a fair bit of malice, due to her anger towards him for killing the boss. Snake gives her his reasons for killing the legendary soldier, but Strangelove refuses the legitimacy of his mission, vowing not to rest until she finds the answers behind the death of the woman she came to fall in love with during their work together over a decade prior. Strangelove then reveals that she has given the boss a new life and offers Snake a chance to meet her. She then leads him into a large room housing an AI pod, which speaks to Snake in the boss's voice. Strangelove reveals that in return for her participation on the Peace Walker project, she demanded all of the information the CIA had on the boss, using it to recreate her mind as the AI Cerebrum called the Mammal Pod. Snake discovers that her true goal, however, is to use this recreation of the boss to learn the truth of why she had to die by Snake's hand. Despite claiming he has no desire to ask the boss for the answer himself, when Strangelove speaks the name Jack, the Mammal Pod stirs awake and frantically shouts his name, repeating her same words warning him during Operation Snake Eater to go home beckoning Snake inside the pod's chassis. Strangelove then challenges Snake to kill the boss again, before locking him inside the mammal pod. Inside the pod, Snake frantically tries to disable the AI while it repeats the boss's words of warning, but he is unable to, as Strangelove activates the security protocols and a gas causes Snake to pass out. In his dreams, Snake is haunted by his final memories of the boss. When he awakens, Snake sees the mammal pod being airlifted away by Chopper, and in its wake, the flying chrysalis AI arrives and attacks. After a battle with the weapon, Snake enters its AI pod and removes its memory boards to use for Mother Base's own AI weapon. Afterwards, Kaz calls Snake to give him the location of the final testing base for Peace Walker from Huey, an underground rock quarry to the north. Snake then rides the boss's horse to the facility, and Huey advises Snake to get up close to the Cerebrum AI to destroy it. When he enters, however, he is spotted and attacked by a squad of troops which Snake is able to defeat. This victory is short-lived, however, as the giant cocoon AI weapon arrives. After another grueling battle, Snake again is able to disable the machine, taking some of its components for Mother Base. After its destruction, a piece of the machine blasts into a nearby door, disabling its security mechanism and allowing Snake into the facility. Inside, Snake overhears Strangelove and Coldman having a private discussion while the doctor's scientists take a break. Snake uses this distraction to enter the Mammal Pod, where Snake speaks one-on-one -on -one with the AI boss, and he tries to ask her if she defected to the Soviet Union of her own free will. When the AI admits having no recollection of that mission, Snake comes to his senses that the machine isn't truly the boss, and he raises his weapon to destroy it. Before he can, however, the pod opens again, and Snake finds himself down the barrels of a squad of Coldman's troops. Coldman reveals to Snake that not only was he involved in Operation Snake Eater, he actually planned the whole thing for the CIA, being moved to Central America in its wake to ensure he didn't reveal any details. Coldman explains his plan of a New World Order policed by the fully automated mechanical deterrent Peace Walker, and Strangelove asks to take Snake for questioning in order to improve the Mammal Pod. Snake tries to escape using CQC, snatching Strangelove's ID badge off of her in the commotion, but he is ultimately outnumbered and taken captive. Snake is then questioned under torture by Strangelove, who asks him the truth behind the boss's defection. Snake simply claims that the boss not only betrayed her country, but betrayed him as well. Strangelove then wonders why Snake would continue to wear the bandana of a woman who betrayed him, and continues to press him for the truth. 
Snake holds true that the boss was a traitor and refuses to give her any information that may complete the AI. After continuous torture, Snake is overwhelmed and passes out. Later awakening in his cell, Snake uses the ID badge he stole from Strangelove to escape. After calling Kaz to inform him of his escape, Snake receives some bad news. Paz and Galvez have gone missing. Snake has Kaz contact the KGB for more information, and Snake returns to his mission to destroy the mammal pod. When he returns to it, however, he quickly finds Paz in Coldman and Strangelove's captivity. Coldman confronts Snake, informing him that the mammal pod is finished and Peace Walker's activation sequence is complete. Strangelove tells Snake that his silence was the answer she needed, that the boss's final mission was to be killed by Snake, fulfilling her duty to America to the very end. This final puzzle piece allowed Strangelove to fully restore the boss to life in the mammal pod. Coldman then reveals Peace Walker's initial target, an offshore area in the Caribbean. The ensuing trade winds will then scatter the nuclear fallout over the Central American region, killing crops and fish to give him free hands to mass-produce Peace Walker. This target area would also completely destroy the off-coast mother base. Coldman then prepares Peace Walker for launch, reiterating his belief that the only way to achieve world peace is through controlled nuclear weapons. Coldman and Strangelove then exit with pause as Snake returns to the surface to stop Peace Walker. Outside the facility, Snake watches as Peace Walker emerges from its underground hangar. Snake tries to stop the massive machine triggering its self-defense mechanisms. After an intense battle, Snake causes the machine to malfunction. Coldman then flies his helicopter overhead and fires at the machine, distracting it and causing it to escape over the mountains. The boss's horse then returns to Snake, and he mounts it to follow Peace Walker. Dodging the giant weapon's defenses, Snake gives chase on the horse, but at the Nicaraguan border, the terrain proves too steep as the animal falls, allowing Peace Walker, as well as Coldman, Strangelove, and their captive Paz to escape. Snake is then forced to put the animal out of its misery, severing one of his final ties with the boss. With Amanda's help, Snake travels to Nicaragua to reach the United States missile base Peace Walker is being transported to. Disguising himself as a box, Snake sneaks onto the back of a truck to get into the base, where he finds a security monitor room. There, Snake spots a feed of Paz on a security camera, and he speaks with her to learn that Coldman has gone to the communications tower to enter the final data for Peace Walker's launch. Suddenly, alarms blare, and Snake gets a call from Kaz, who tells him that all of MSF are headed towards Nicaragua to help him fight. Snake then fights his way through Coldman's forces to reach the communications tower, where he takes out a helicopter gunship before entering. Inside, Snake finds Coldman, holding Paz hostage. Coldman boasts that they have entered the false data into Peace Walker to make the AI believe a nuclear strike has been initiated by the Soviets and to retaliate. Coldman then prepares to enter the final launch codes, and as he does, Professor Galvez arrives, revealing that he had been working with Coldman all along. The Professor, whose real name is Vladimir Alexandrovich Zadornov, reveals to Coldman that he has double-crossed him, and all of the soldiers in the area turn their weapons on Coldman. Zadornov then states that he has plans to steal Peace Walker and instead launch a nuke on Cuba to frame the United States to spread anti-American sentiment and help win the Cold War. Zadornov then hands Paz a pistol and tells her to shoot Coldman in revenge for what they did to her under imprisonment, but she can't bring herself to do it. Zadornov then grabs her hand, lifts the gun, and forces her to fire at the man, deliberately aiming for a non-fatal shot as he still needs Coldman to enter in Peace Walker's final code. Zadornov then forces Strangelove to change Peace Walker's data to fire at Cuba, threatening to destroy the mammal pod if she refuses, to which she reluctantly agrees. Zadornov finally reveals to Snake his final intentions, to kill him, framing the CIA in order to give the FSLN a reason to rise up against the United States and free Nicaragua from America's control. Zadornov, receiving word that Peace Walker is ready, pulls his gun on Snake, but before he can execute him, gunfire erupts and they turn to see Snake's backup, the combined MSF and FSLN forces. After shooting down the Soviet guards, Amanda and Chico hold Zadornov captive and the group celebrate their victory. Snake gives his thanks and Amanda hugs him. Kaz takes Paz and Coldman back to Mother Base with the others, while Snake stays behind to destroy the mammal pod and disable Peace Walker. Strangelove soon arrives, apologizes to Snake for torturing him, and offers him a ride to the AI so they can speak with the boss. Aboard the helicopter back to Mother Base, a dying Coldman secretly enters the launch codes into his briefcase. 
In his last breath, he reveals that Peace Walker is also transmitting the false data to the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, who will interpret it as a real Soviet attack. Believing that the humans in the US government would never have the will to launch a nuclear retaliatory strike, they would realize a machine like Peace Walker would be necessary and his perfect deterrent will finally bring peace. Coleman then holds his two fingers in a peace symbol before finally dying from his wounds. Snake and Strangelove speed off to Peace Walker's location to stop it from transmitting the false data and more importantly prevent the nuclear launch on Cuba. There, Snake battles the giant machine once again and after an even more grueling battle, Snake is able to disable it. However, Huey soon informs him that the data uplink is still active and the false data is still being transmitted. Huey taps into NORAD's communications to learn that Coldman's prediction was wrong and the US government prepares to launch intercontinental ballistic missiles. Snake then calls NORAD, using his status as Big Boss to convince the chairman to stand down. After proving his identity, the chairman believes him and agrees to call off the ICBMs, but is stopped by another member, who frantically pulls a gun on him. Meanwhile, the mammal pod opens, allowing Snake to enter. Once inside, Snake removes the AI's components one by one until it is finally gone. However, the data uplink does not stop and the officers at NORAD continue to argue over launching the retaliation. Huey determines that the reptile AI is still carrying out Mammal's final orders, and Snake again fires at the machine to try and disable it. Despite unloading all of his artillery on Peace Walker, he finds that he cannot bring it down. Suddenly, the Mammal Pod seemingly awakens, and the ghost in the machine causes Peace Walker to walk into the nearby Lago Cosibolca, drowning itself to stop the transmission and save the entire planet. Snake then gives the boss one final salute before he removes the bandana he once took from her, letting the wind take it away from him. Later, Snake and Kaz have a private conversation, where Snake admits that he's done searching for the truth. Realizing that by putting down her gun and allowing him to kill her, the boss betrayed him by abandoning everything she was as a soldier. Snake then states that he won't make the same mistakes as her, and going forward, he wants to be called Big Boss. After the events in Nicaragua, Paz and Strangelove elect to stay on Mother Base, with the latter working alongside Huey on MSF's own AI weapon named Metal Gear Zeke. Using the components Snake recovered from the AI pods, as well as Peace Walker's nuclear warhead recovered from the depths of the water, Zeke is soon completed, giving him their own nuclear deterrent. Somehow, Zadornov escapes from his cell on Mother Base, forcing MSF to find and capture him. More surprisingly, he's able to repeat this act multiple times. After his final escape, Snake finds Zadornov in Mother Base's firing range, and the man fires a gun at him. Snake is forced to fire back, and hits Zadornov. In his final breath, Zadornov states that his work is done, before launching his prosthetic hand, which doubles as a rocket projectile, at Snake, narrowly missing him before he dies from Snake's gunshot. Snake calls Kaz, and baffled at how Zadornov could have escaped so many times, determines that he must have had help from inside MSF. Suddenly, Kaz shouts that Zeke has started moving, and somebody is piloting it. Snake rushes to the top of Mother Base to find Metal Gear Zeke being raised from its hangar, surprisingly with Paz in the cockpit. Paz reveals that she made some modifications to Zeke while MSF was distracted by Zadornov's multiple escapes. Paz then states that she's taking it back to her leader, Cypher. Paz then tells Snake her real name, Pacifica Ocean, and explains that the name, age, and mission she gave to MSF were all fabricated by Cypher, whose real Peace Walker project is about to reach its goal. Paz explains that in the wake of the Cold War, the age of electronic intelligence will begin, with Cypher controlling the flow of information without anyone else knowing, effectively creating the illusion of peace through control and fulfilling the boss's vision of a world without borders. She then proposes that Snake works with Cypher to be their protective force, offering him control of MSF and Zeke. Snake predictably refuses this offer, and Paz instead elects to use Zeke to fire its warhead at the United States framing MSF as a dangerous group and giving rise to a new age of deterrence around the fear of extremist cults. Paz then prepares Zeke for launch, forcing Snake to battle his own giant weapon. Snake is able to emerge victorious, destroying Zeke and sending Paz flying to the surrounding waters. Afterwards, Strangelove and Huey work together to repair Zeke and grow a bit of fondness towards each other in the process. Elsewhere, Snake and Kaz speak again, and they determine that the word Cypher also means zero, revealing that his group, called Cypher, 
was behind Paz's mission and the upcoming New World Order of Electronic Intelligence. Kaz then admits to Snake that he secretly knew Paz and the Professor's true identities from the very beginning, but chose to use them to grow MSF. While Snake is initially angered with Kaz, Miller convinces him that he had to do it, as in a post-Cold War world, their new business will be a sought-after commodity. Snake then knows that by interfering in international affairs, MSF will be hunted, but admits that their strongest enemy will be the changing times. He then addresses the MSF troops and states that they will fight for no particular nation or ideology, but for their only home, their outer heaven. Months later, MSF receives notice that the United Nations will be inspecting Mother Base for nuclear capabilities, which they believe to be payback from Cypher for ruining Paz's mission. While they initially refuse the inspection, Huey acts alone and sends them a letter accepting, believing that if they can hide their true capabilities, the inspection will come up clean and they can continue to act in secret with the rest of the world's blessing. To prepare, Big Boss and Kaz send all of the civilians living on Mother Base back to their homelands, except for Huey, who prepares Zeke for underwater submergence so they can hide it from the inspectors. Meanwhile, the remaining FSLN are sent with Amanda to Cuba. Dr. Strangelove, luckily, had departed Mother Base a week prior after finishing Zeke's AI. Around the same time, Miller receives reports that Paz survived the battle and was rescued by Belizean fishermen who found her drifting in the Caribbean before being held in an interrogation camp in Cuba. Kaz and Big Boss then determined that they should try to extract her, hoping to prevent her from giving up information about Zeke, as well as recovering their only link to Cypher. Word begins to spread around Mother Base about Paz's survival, and Chico is sent to Cuba to be with his sister, Amanda. However, during his travels, he runs off, hoping to find Paz himself, still feeling guilt over a failed attempt to stop her from hijacking Zeke. Unfortunately, Chico has captured himself and taken to the same interrogation camp as Paz, Camp Omega. This camp, a United States black site, has been taken control of by XOF, now working as Cypher's strike force, as their leader Skullface, who arrives to interrogate Paz and Chico. After days of relentless torture, including forcing Chico to torture Paz himself, Skullface learns of Mother Base and MSF's details. Skullface then forces Chico to send a distress call to Big Boss, asking him for his help. Skullface then asks Paz for Zero's location, knowing she was the only one to have direct contact with him since the Les Enfants Terribles project. Asking him to kill Zero once he finds him, Paz tells him the location. Afterwards, Skullface has Paz strung up and places two bombs within her body cavity, recording her screams on cassette. While Big Boss makes his way to Camp Omega to retrieve both Chico and Paz, Skullface delivers this cassette to Chico, implying that it contains the sounds of Paz's death. He then tells the boy to give his regards to Big Boss before heading to a chopper with his XOF troops. Removing the group's logo from the chopper, he then states that the Trojan horse is in and the pirate crackdown is a go. After he and his men board their choppers, they remove the XOF patches from their uniforms and head towards their destination. Big Boss arrives at Camp Omega shortly after and infiltrates the prison area. There, he finds Chico in one of the cages, and the delirious boy fearfully lashes out, creating a commotion and forcing Big Boss to choke him to unconsciousness. Big Boss then carries Chico to a rendezvous point for extraction by helicopter. As they wait for the chopper, Chico awakens and shows Big Boss the cassette he was given of Paz's torture, claiming that she's dead. After the chopper arrives, Big Boss loads Chico aboard and goes back to look for Paz. Using clues from the audio cassette Chico provided, Big Boss determines Paz was taken to the camp's administration building, and he successfully sneaks inside. When he reaches the building's basement, Big Boss finds Paz, still strung up and sedated. Big Boss carries her out of the facility to the rendezvous point, despite her pleas on his way to put her out of her misery. Big Boss meets the chopper as it arrives and loads Paz on board before climbing in himself. Once out of Camp Omega's airspace, Chico notices the stitched wound on Paz's abdomen, and Big Boss calls over the medic on board. Big Boss and Chico hold Paz down as the medic frantically cuts open the stitches, pulling out a ticking package with a peace symbol on it before throwing it into the waters below. Big Boss then receives a call from Huey, who informs him that the UN inspectors have arrived at Mother Base and the preparations, including submerging Zeke, are complete. Later, as the helicopter nears Mother Base, they find the communications with MSF have fallen silent. As they near, they see a horrific sight. Mother base aflame, with explosions and gunfire erupting on the offshore base. 
The UN inspection, as it turns out, was all a ruse set up by Skullface in order to attack and destroy Mother Base, and his Trojan Horse plan had worked. At this point, unbeknownst to the others, Huey is safely extracted from the destruction by an XOF helicopter. The helicopter lands on one of Mother Base's struts, and Big Boss rushes out to rescue Miller. While he's able to get Kaz on board the chopper, XOF detonates structurally planted explosives and the helicopter narrowly escapes as Mother Base is completely destroyed, killing all of Big Boss's men on the stronghold and bringing the MSF to its end, or at least in this universe, but much more on that later. Above the open waters, Kaz laments being played like a fiddle and losing everything they worked so hard for, taking out his frustration on Paz, who awakens. Startled, she tells Big Boss that there's a bomb inside her, but he assured her that they removed it. She soberly opens the chopper door and tells him there's another before jumping out. As she falls, the second bomb explodes, blasting Paz apart. The medic rushes in front of Big Boss, shielding him from the blast and taking the brunt of the explosion. The force from the blast sends the helicopter spinning and it crashes into a trailing XOF helicopter, sending the fiery wreck into the waters below. Afterwards, the smoke from Mother Base's attack was seen from the shores, and the media blamed it on money-hungry private militias. The United States Secretary of Defense was then forced to denounce the MSF, and despite reports of the inspection being held, the UN denies any involvement as well. In the wake of the helicopter crash, Big Boss, Miller, and the medic were recovered and taken to a hospital in Barranquilla, Colombia. Miller survived with minimal injuries, but Big Boss flatlines. The doctors are able to resuscitate him, but he subsequently falls into a coma. The medic took shrapnel to the head and was also placed into an artificially induced coma. Zero hears about the attack on MSF, as well as Big Boss's survival, and contacts Eva to have her secretly transport Big Boss and the medic to a hospital in Cyprus where they would be safe a task she only accepts to help Big Boss. Zero then has Skullface relocated to Africa as punishment for attacking Mother Base. There, Skullface learns of Code Talker's research on the vocal cord parasites in Metallic Archaea. Code Talker had learned about the parasites long ago and how they had given humanity the ability to speak, and Skullface forces him to weaponize them by creating strains that would reproduce when exposed to a particular language. Those infected with a particular language strain would then fall under the control of the parasite if they spoke enough of the language to allow the parasite to reproduce. Through the process, Skullface is infected with every strain of the parasite except English, forcing him to speak only that language, losing his native tongue, Hungarian, in the process. Zero then devises a plan to have the medic transformed via plastic surgery and hypnotherapy into a physically identical phantom of Big Boss carrying his memories and personality to live in the public eye as the legendary hero until the true Big Boss was ready to retake the mantle. Zero finds Ocelot and convinces him to watch over Big Boss and the medic during the process. He also contacts Miller, instructing him to work with Ocelot once Big Boss awakens, keeping the body double plan a secret from him, telling him the code phrase once he does will be, V has come too. Meanwhile, the Les Enfants Terrible project is officially abandoned, and the products of the experiment are separated around the globe. David is sent to the United States, and Eli is taken by Zero to England, where he subsequently escapes Zero's care and disappears in Africa. The third boy, Solidus, is at some point given the name George Sears, and is kept under close control. In the late 1970s, Skullface recovers a winged dagger lapel pin that was on the boss's person when she died, and he creates a convincing replica, coding it with the English strain of the vocal parasite before sending it to the address Paz provided for Zero's location. Upon its receipt, Zero calls Skullface, who has Zero inspect the back of the pin, causing him to prick his finger and infect himself. As Skullface carries on a conversation, Zero notices the effect of the parasite taking hold. Zero soon realizes what Skullface has done, and the man gloats in his successful attack, stating that now the world can never become one. Zero spends years working with doctors to try to cure the parasite, but is only able to somewhat slow its effects. In order to continue Cypher's work controlling information to lead world politics, Zero works with fellow Cypher member Donald Anderson, formerly known as Mr. Sigent, and ARPA, now renamed the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, to develop a sophisticated system of AIs to carry out its will. Dr. Strangelove also briefly works on this project before she is forced out due to an unknown incident. Cos Miller subsequently goes on to form a new private military company called Diamond Dogs, 
which later obtains another offshore plant off the coast of South Africa. They then work to build this plant into their new mother base. In one of his final moments outside of hiding, Zero visits the comatose Big Boss, reminiscing with the man and speaking about the events at hand, as well as his future legacy in artificial intelligence. Zero then disappears completely, falling unconscious from his infection, but leaving instructions behind for Anderson and DARPA to build his Cypher AI system, which he calls the Patriots. In 1979, Frank Yeager fights as a mercenary in the Rhodesian Civil War, where he kills a married couple. Shortly after, he discovers their young daughter near the Zambezi River, nearly dead from starvation. Feeling immense guilt for his actions, Frank adopts the girl, raising her as his sister, and giving her the name Naomi Hunter, adopting the surname himself, now going by Frank Hunter. Meanwhile, Huey is brought into Cypher to work on a new Metal Gear in Afghanistan. He is reunited with Strangelove when she is recruited by Skullface to once again develop the AI for the machine using the recovered mammal pod. During their work together on this new Metal Gear, called Sehelanthropus, the pair have a romantic affair, with Strangelove conceiving a child, a boy the pair named Hal. While Hal is a toddler, Huey puts him in Sehelanthropus' cockpit, which is too small for a grown person to enter due to it being designed for an AI pod, to test it. When Strangelove learns of this, she grows angry and secretly sends Hal off to America. Huey, furious at his son being taken from him, retaliates by locking Strangelove inside the mammal pod, where she suffocates and dies alongside her only love, the boss, or at least her AI representation. In February of 1984, a young boy with psychic abilities is transported via airplane to a research lab in Moscow. The boy is fitted with a gas mask to block the thoughts and emotions from those around him. This proves ineffective, however, as the plane's flight path crosses over the hospital in Cyprus housing Big Boss and the medic. The hate within their subconscious feeds the boy's power and he causes the plane to crash. The boy survives the crash and is taken to the lab, the same facility where the barely living body of Yevgenia Borisovich Volgin has been experimented on for the last two decades. The boy, now given the codename Trechi Ribinok, Russian for third child, is again attracted to the subconscious negative emotion within Volgin, and his abilities reanimate the former colonel as a fiery demon known as the Man on Fire. The pair then burn down the lab and begin to travel to find Big Boss to fulfill Volgin's revenge. Meanwhile, Kaz Miller is in Afghanistan, training soldiers and secretly looking for Huey Emmerich, hoping to learn more about his role in the original Mother Base attack. One day, however, his unit is attacked and slaughtered by the Parasite Unit, also known as the Skulls, an elite group of Skullface's army infected with parasites that give them superhuman abilities. Miller escapes the Skulls but loses his arm and a leg. He calls Ocelot to ask for rescue, but is soon captured and held prisoner by the invading Soviets. At the same time, Big Boss finally awakens from his coma, nine years after the helicopter crash that put him into it. Ocelot is there to greet him and informs him of everything that has occurred in the past nine years, including Zero's condition, the Patriots AI project, the abandonment of the Leon Fonterrible project, and finally, the medic's new role as Big Boss's phantom. While Big Boss originally doesn't agree with turning the man into his double without his knowledge, he eventually concludes that since the medic sacrificed his life to protect him in the helicopter, he'd also give it up to protect him now. Ocelot then informs Big Boss that the Man on Fire and XOF have both learned of his awakening and will be on their way to attack the hospital, so final preparations must be made, including waking up the body double. After the body double is awoken, the nurse attending to him delivers the code message, V has come to, to a number provided by Cypher, setting the plan's wheels in motion. As the medic regains consciousness, he is met by his doctor, Evangelos Constantinou, who informs him of how long he was in the coma, as well as the damage he sustained in the helicopter crash, including 108 pieces of foreign material embedded in his body. Some of it shrapnel, some of it the bone and teeth of those who didn't survive the crash. Most of the pieces were removed, however, some pieces near his heart and brain were too dangerous to be removed, so they were left in place, the skull piece leaving a horn-like protrusion from his forehead. The medic then looks down and sees that one of his arms is also missing, sending him into shock and forcing the nurse to sedate him. 
Later, Constantinou wakes the medic up once again and removes his bandages, as his nurse is quietly killed by an XOF assassin who arrives behind him. The doctor then shows him a picture of the helicopter pilot, Miller, Big Boss, and the medic, which he turns over to see a message of good luck written to him by Big Boss, which his hypnotherapy prevents him from understanding. The doctor then gives him a new name, Ahab, and holds up a mirror to the medic, and in the reflection, he sees his face, that of Big Boss. Suddenly, the doctor is attacked by the assassin as well, and in the struggle, the medic is kicked off of his bed. After killing the doctor, the assassin turns her gun on the medic, thinking she's killing Big Boss, but suddenly, the real man, disguised by bandages covering his entire face, jumps from his neighboring bed and tackles her. After a short struggle, Big Boss is able to douse her in a flammable liquid before she subdues him with a knife to his shoulder. She then begins to strangle the medic, but Big Boss lights her aflame, throwing another bottle of liquid at her, causing her to fall out of a nearby window. The medic then looks towards his missing arm to see a prosthetic hook affixed to it. Big Boss rushes over and introduces himself as Ishmael, grabbing the fallen pistol before injecting Ahab with a medication to get him moving so they can escape the hospital, now under complete attack by XOF. While Ahab is unable to move swiftly due to his atrophied muscles, he uses all of his strength to follow Ishmael through the hospital, regaining the use of his body as they go. Soon, a fiery explosion knocks the pair back, and the man on fire appears and advances towards Ahab, believing him to be the true big boss. Suddenly, the hospital's sprinkler system activates, dousing him with water before he vanishes. Ishmael and Ahab continue their escape out of the hospital, hiding from XOF enemies and choppers on the way. While hiding from a group of XOF soldiers amongst a pile of dead bodies, Ishmael and Ahab spot the man on fire once again, who kills the XOF soldiers with a massive blast, dislocating Ahab's leg before the monster is distracted by a helicopter outside, which he promptly swipes down using his fiery powers. Ishmael then shoots a sprinkler, dousing the man on fire with water once again and causing him to vanish. After Ahab relocates his leg, the pair continue on, finding a pistol for Ahab. They continue down the hospital's lobby area, finding it heavily guarded by XOF. Ishmael breaks away from Ahab, creating a diversion by shooting at the guards while running off. Ahab follows, spotting him outside, trying to commandeer one of the emergency transport vehicles. Before Ahab can leave the hospital lobby, however, Trechi Rebinok appears and telekinetically moves the wreckage of the downed helicopter, blocking the exit. The man on fire then arrives and takes out all of the XOF in the lobby while Ahab tries to avoid him, unsuccessfully, and the man on fire fires a blast that knocks him down. As the man on fire walks over to Ahab, preparing to deliver the final blow, he is suddenly struck by an ambulance, which drives him directly into the side of the hospital. The ambulance then returns to Ahab, and the driver, Ishmael, has him get into the passenger seat. The pair then drive off, leaving the man on fire behind, while he throws various pieces of the hospital at them to try to stop them. An XOF helicopter then appears in front of them, opening fire and shattering the windshield. Ishmael then smashes his head on the steering wheel, rendering him unconscious. Ahab tries to take the wheel, but soon crashes into a roadblock, sending the car flipping off the road and knocking Ahab out as well. Shortly thereafter, Ocelot arrives and pulls Ishmael out of the ambulance wreckage, and the pair leave Ahab behind. After removing his bandaging and shedding his Ishmael persona, Big Boss dons his iconic eye patch and a change of clothes, and Ocelot leads him to a nearby motorcycle. Ocelot then gives Big Boss a fabricated passport with the medic's old name and face on it, with Ocelot stating that the man is the new Snake, who Big Boss remarks is his phantom. Ocelot then lights a cigar for Big Boss, who can finally smoke outside of the hospital before riding off on his horse to return to the new snake and carry out his side of the plan, including using hypnotherapy on himself to forget that the man is a body double. Big Boss then smokes his cigar and rides off on the motorcycle towards his new life in hiding to rebuild what he's lost and finally create his own independent military nation in South Africa called Outer Heaven. Meanwhile, the new snake awakens to see Ocelot's white horse, before Trechi Rebinok appears once again, with the man on fire on his own flaming unicorn in tow. 
Ocelot tells Snake that Miller sent him, but now they have to rescue Kaz from Afghanistan, where he was captured by the Soviets. Ocelot and Snake ride off towards a whaling ship, and they use it to leave the area. Over the next few days of travel, Ocelot helps Snake recover, and gives him a new nickname, Venom Snake, as well as a bionic prosthetic arm, similar to the ones Adornov wore. Snake and Ocelot reach Afghanistan and scout the area, and Snake heads in alone, on the white horse, named Diamond Horse, or D-Horse for short, to search for Miller's location. Snake soon finds Miller and cuts the man free, giving him back his trademark sunglasses before carrying him to a Diamond Dog's helicopter, called Pequod, for extraction. When he reaches the landing zone, however, Snake finds that Pequod cannot land, due to some kind of mist covering the area. Snake then spots the parasite unit, who give chase. Snake then takes Kaz on horseback, escaping the skulls while heading towards another landing zone. Once they arrive, Snake loads Kaz onto the helicopter, and they depart towards the new mother base, and their new home as Diamond Dogs. On their way, Miller laments on how big Cypher has grown, and vows that they'll grow as well. They land on Mother Base, and Kaz is loaded onto a stretcher. When Kaz asks Snake to lead Diamond Dogs to get revenge on Cypher, he accepts, but only to fight for the future, not the past. After familiarizing himself with running this new Mother Base, Snake heads back to Afghanistan to run some missions to make matters easier for them in the area. During one of them, Snake discovers a puppy missing its right eye, and he takes it back to Mother Base, where it's given an eye patch and the name Diamond Dog, or DD, before being trained to help Snake in the field. Snake later accepts a mission from the CIA to retrieve a rocket launcher called the Honey Bee, before the Soviets can find and use it. He successfully locates the weapon, but as he goes to leave the area, he finds himself engulfed in the Skull's mist. Suddenly, he sees Trichy Ribinok before he is grabbed by a giant, mechanical hand. While Snake is subdued by the hand, Skullface arrives and taunts him, believing him to be the real big boss, telling him to stay dead this time before the Skulls arrive. The giant hand then lets Snake go and picks up Skullface instead before the giant, bipedal robot it's attached to, Sailanthropus, walks off. Snake then sees the skulls infecting the nearby Soviet soldiers, turning them into zombie-like puppets to fight. After a battle with the skulls and these Soviet puppets, Snake emerges victorious, and is successfully able to take the honeybee back to Mother Base. Later, Miller receives a call from Huey Emmerich, looking to defect from Cypher. Hoping to retrieve Huey for interrogation, Miller sends Snake to retrieve him. On his way, Snake is ambushed by a female sniper, known by locals as Quiet. She fires at Snake, prompting a long-range shootout between the two, during which Snake learns that she has superhuman agility as well as the ability to go invisible. Snake wins their battle, knocking the sniper unconscious before rushing over to her. When he gets closer, he recognizes her, as Cypher's assassin sent to the hospital in Cyprus that tried to kill him inexplicably free of any burns. While Miller tells Snake to kill the agent of Cypher, Ocelot believes she'll be of more use to them at Mother Base. While Ocelot and Miller argue, Boss eventually decides to take her back, loading her onto Pequod. Inside the helicopter, however, Quiet awakens and throws her handcuffs at Snake, using the distraction to seemingly jump from the chopper and escape. On the way back to Mother Base, Pequod is attacked by a fighter jet. The jet fires a missile at them, and Snake tries to shoot it down with the side-mounted Gatling gun, but the movement of the helicopter causes him to lose his balance. Suddenly, Quiet reappears, having only turned invisible prior, and mans the gun instead, successfully shooting down the missile before it hits the chopper. Snake then takes control and tries to shoot down the jet, but is unable to, causing Quiet to aim her sniper and shoot the pilot, killing him and leaving the jet to crash into the water below. When the Pequod arrives at Mother Base, Miller refuses to let it land, stating that he won't allow Quiet, an agent of Cypher, to set foot on their base. Quiet simply jumps down to the base, turning invisible and landing behind Kaz, Ocelot, and their men before reappearing. Kaz and Ocelot again argue over whether or not to kill her before Snake breaks up this argument and tells them to put her into a cell. 
As she's taken away, Miller again warns Snake that he'll regret this decision, and he simply responds that if and when the time comes to kill her, he'll personally be the one to pull the trigger. Returning to Afghanistan to search for Huey, Snake finds the disgraced scientist, equipped with a pair of bionic exolegs allowing him to walk, in a power plant, arguing with Skullface over changes made to Salalanthropus, with Huey claiming that they'll need more time to prepare the AI to pilot it. Skullface declines using an AI, believing that to have been Hot Coldman's mistake ten years prior. A soldier then whispers to Skullface and tells him about Huey's call to Miller, and Skullface throws Huey down a nearby set of stairs before having him sent to their base camp by a soldier piloting a small bipedal walker gear machine. Skullface then leaves the area as well, and Snake spots Sailanthropus being taken back to storage. Snake makes his way to the base camp and finds Emmerich's lab. Inside, he spots the mammal pod, and the boss AI at first thinks it recognizes Snake, but second guesses the assessment. Snake then spots Huey and places a bag over his head before carrying him out of the lab, using Huey's walker gear to potentially make things faster. Once they reach the extraction point, a helicopter flies in to pick them up, but is forced to retreat once Sailanthropus arrives, with Trichy Rabinok beside it, controlling it with his telekinetic abilities. Skullface, being carried by the machine, states that today is the day weapons learned to walk upright, before it advances on Snake and Huey. The pair are able to slip away from Sailanthropus and get to the chopper, where Snake uses the mounted gun to defend the aircraft and damage the metal gear enough to get back to base. There, Huey is taken captive and interrogated by Ocelot and Miller, who each use their own tactics to try to learn how Huey was involved in the attack nine years prior, but Emmerich maintains his innocence, claiming he was merely used by XOF, not cooperating with them. Knowing that they need proof before they can decide his fate, Miller elects to keep Huey's presence on Mother Base a secret from their men. Ocelot does reveal that Huey provided some new information, that Cypher was no longer interested in the research from Afghanistan and Sailanthropus, as they've moved all of their funding to Central Africa on a weapon to surpass Metal Gear. Later, Ocelot surmises that Zero likely didn't make the call to destroy Mother Base, and it must have been a move orchestrated by Skullface to break away from Cypher and take control. As such, they realize that Diamond Dog's true target isn't Cypher currently, but instead XOF, and their leader, Skullface. Snake then travels to Africa and works several jobs while trying to learn more about Cypher and Skullface's operations. After finding the parasite unit in the area, Snake confirms that Skullface is there. At one point, Snake and Ocelot visit Quiet in her cell. There, Ocelot tells Snake that Quiet seems to breathe and drink water through her skin, through some kind of photosynthesis, much like the Cobra unit member, The End. These biological needs force her skin to be exposed to sunlight, making her unable to wear much clothing and also making everyone who tries to make her cover herself feel ashamed of their words and deeds. Ocelot then suggests Snake take Quiet out on some missions as support, and Snake agrees, knowing her skills will make her an invaluable asset on the field. After more jobs in Africa, Snake discovers the use of child soldiers, and takes them back to Mother Base where they can be taken care of. Additionally, Huey comes up with an idea to make himself useful building a battle gear much like Metal Gear Zeke that can combat the swarms of walker gears spreading across Africa. While Snake feels some deja vu, he allows Huey to work on battle gear in the meantime. Snake heads back to Africa to look for the leader of the child soldiers, named Shibani, being held in an area called the Devil's House. Snake arrives and finds a ghastly sight, a factory filled with human experiments, with earbuds implanted into their throats playing voice recordings from a cassette tape of every language except for English, and strange growths on their chests. Snake travels through the factory and finds Shibani, with a necklace in his hand. Snake tries to free Shibani, but spots Skullface in the next room, who executes one of the test subjects. The gunshot startles Shibani, who begins to stir, drawing Skullface's attention, who spots Snake. Skullface then six Trachy Rebinok on Snake, who calls forth the man on fire to attack. Suddenly he stops, however, as Trachy Rebinok becomes distracted by Shibani, who he mercy kills before he can burn to death from the man on fire's flames. 
Snake makes a mad dash out of the facility and away from the man on fire, but is forced to fight the monster and hold him off long enough until a helicopter can arrive to extract. Snake ultimately succeeds and is able to escape back to Mother Base, where he gives Shibani's necklace back to one of the child soldiers. Diamond Dogs then get another mission in Africa to stop a group of child soldiers. They determine the best way to do so would be to take this group's leader, known as the White Mamba, back to Mother Base, leaving the group without structure to eventually fall apart. Snake finds the group taking shelter in a dilapidated boat, and inside he meets the White Mamba, whose real name is Eli, and he subdues the boy with CQC before taking him back to Mother Base. There, Snake pats the boy on the back, welcoming him to Outer Heaven. This angers Eli, who rushes Snake, taking his knife and trying to stab him. Snake quickly overpowers him, however, dislocating his arm and taking his knife back. Snake then puts his arm back in place and tells the boy as soon as he learns to use his head, he'll be allowed to leave. Later, Miller suspects Eli is likely the same missing boy created from the Les Enfanteries project. Hoping to confirm or deny this, Miller orders a genetic test. Unbeknownst to Miller, Eli is in fact the genetic clone of Big Boss, but since he's using a sample of Venom Snake, a body double, the test's results will be useless. At some point, Quiet attacks a soldier on Mother Base, attempting to shove a knife down his throat. Snake and Ocelot are forced to subdue and sedate her. Snake figures it's payback for the treatment the guards have been giving her, telling Ocelot to strengthen security on her cell. Ocelot later calls Snake and informs him of several soldiers on Mother Base falling ill, with the same growths on their chest that Snake saw in Skullface's Devil's House. Among those infected is the soldier Quiet attacked. Snake is then tasked with quarantining those infected and finding out what's making them susceptible to the infection. Inspecting the sick personnel, Snake discovers the one common attribute amongst them, their language, Kikongo to be exact. He then quarantines everyone on Mother Base who speaks this language, while he continues to try to figure out what's going on. Miller then sends Snake to find a man linked to the epidemic at Mother Base. Snake recovers this man, who reveals that the one who can tell them about how to treat the pathogen is an old man named Code Talker, whose location he reveals. Snake then heads to the location given to him, but is met by a sniper unit of the Skulls on the way. After fighting his way through them, Snake reaches Code Talker's location, a mansion. Snake infiltrates it and finds the old man in the basement. Snake shows Code Talker photos of the men's chest growths, and he explains the vocal cord parasites as well as their spread through language. He gives Snake a pipe containing herbs the parasites dislike, before revealing that Skullface stole his research into the organisms and planned to use them to wipe every language except for English off of the earth. Snake then carries Code Talker out of the mansion and safely reaches a helicopter, where they escape back to Mother Base. On the way, Code Talker explains that the only way to stop the parasites is with a particular bacteria, Wolbachia, that he discovered would turn all of the male parasites into females, halting all reproduction. Code Talker warns, however, that this would also render the host infertile. The helicopter then flies through the parasite unit's mist, shattering the windows and killing the chopper's pilot causing it to crash land to the ground below. Snake and Code Talker survive the blast, but the skulls soon attack. Due to their miss preventing another extraction, Snake is forced to fight, and after a close battle with the superhuman unit, he is able to clear the air long enough for another helicopter to arrive. On the way to Mother Base, Code Talker reveals that five years prior, Skullface conducted a test to see if he could use the metallic Archaea to disable nuclear weapons, giving him the ability to arm the world with nukes using Huey's walker gears, but still hold the kill switch with the Archaea. Ocelot asks Code Talker what he thinks of the sickness spreading across Mother Base, and he confirms that it's the Kakango strain of the vocal cord parasites. Code Talker provides the Wolbachia bacteria to fight the infection, and after 48 hours, the spread has stopped. But those who are already symptomatic are unable to be cured. Miller then vows that Skullface will pay for this. Later, Ocelot and Miller interrogate Huey once again, threatening to use the metallic Archaea on his exoskeleton legs. They try to learn what Skullface's next move is, and Huey eventually gives up the location, OKB0, where Sailanthropus was being housed. 
Miller then leaves while Ocelot delicately balances the syringe of metallic archaea under Huey's leg, forcing him to remain completely still as he leaves. Snake then boards a helicopter to head for OKB-0 to stop Skullface from activating Sailanthropus. Snake heads to Afghanistan to locate OKB-0 and find Skullface, and on the way, Eli sneaks onto the chopper. Huey also tags along, offering his help to take down Skullface to prove his allegiance to Diamond Dogs. Snake infiltrates OKB-0 and finds Skullface at a helipad, confronting the man who simply tells him that they both know pain, and are both now demons, before commanding him to follow him. At Miller's suggestion, Snake follows Skullface, who takes him on a jeep ride, explaining his past, including working on Operation Snake Eater, as well as his motives along the way, revealing that his ultimate goal is to eliminate the language raiders forced him to speak as a child, English. In doing so, Zero's control would be eliminated, and nuclear weapons would be the new universal language, which he would control. After Snake and Skullface simply stare at each other for a very awkward trip, the jeep stops at the power plant Snake found Huey. There, Skullface reveals the man on fire, enabled through Trichy Rebinok by his revenge for Snake. However, as the Diamond Dog's helicopter flies overhead, Eli's own powerful resentment towards Snake attracts the third boy's power. Sailanthropus then activates, and Trichy Rebinok forces the man on fire to walk under its moving platform crushing the phantom of Volgan and leaving Skullface to wonder whose lust for revenge could be so powerful. As Skullface is dragged to safety by his XOF soldiers, Snake is left face to face with Sailanthropus, now controlled by Trichy Rebinok through Eli's hatred. Sailanthropus chases Snake out of the power plant while XOF artillery shows up to destroy the giant machine. Sailanthropus lays waste to all of them, leaving only Skullface surrounded by flames. Knowing he's about to die and that Cypher will erase his name from history, Skullface basks in knowing that the thirst for revenge he has planted will infest the system, before the very machine he created to unleash that thirst, Sailanthropus, crushes him. Snake then tries to escape Sailanthropus in one of the jeeps, but is run off the road and forced to fight the machine on foot. Using any and all resources available to him, Snake fights the giant mech, eventually damaging it enough to prevent Trechy Rebinok's abilities from controlling it. With the threat eliminated, Miller arrives via Chopper and picks up Snake before they return to Skullface. Snake, Miller, and Emmerich then find Skullface's crushed body, holding a capsule of parasites. Snake opens the capsule and finds three vials inside, with one empty. Snake asks where the other one is, with the barely surviving Skullface simply responding that it's very close to him. Snake then tosses the other two aside. Unbeknownst to him, Trechy Rebinok recovers one of them before disappearing. Skullface pleads with Snake to put him out of his misery, and the man picks up the XOF commander's rifle and, with Miller's help, blows off his limbs, finally taking revenge for what he did to cause as well as MSF. The pair then leave him to die in agony before Huey arrives and kills Skullface himself, basking in his revenge. Afterwards, they all return to Mother Base, and the damaged chassis of Sailanthropus arrives in tow. Although the battle with XOF is now over, Snake soon spots a premonition of Skullface, a phantom pain, he'll be forced to suffer forevermore. Miller then speaks before the Diamond Dogs, removing his sunglasses to show his clouded eyes, stating that his men will now be his eyes, and that they'll have to keep an eye out for possible defectors. At some point after, Eli stares towards Sailanthropus, and Trichy Rebinok appears before him, handing him the vial of parasites before floating away. With Skullface dead, Snake moves on to other missions and tasks for Mother Base, bonding with his teammates, especially Quiet, and running operations. At one point, Snake is shocked to discover Paz, seemingly completely healthy and with no visible scars in Mother Base's medical platform. After finding out about several surviving former MSF members wandering mindlessly in the field, Snake rescues them and brings them back to Mother Base. 
In doing so, he comes to the realization over time that Paz is merely a hallucination caused by his guilt over not being able to save the girl. Ocelot then learns that the Soviets discovered the man on fire's body, and Snake infiltrates their outpost to secure it. Once Snake finds the man on fire's corpse, however, it bursts into flames, springing to life alongside its fiery unicorn. The Phantom then pins Snake down, and Vulgan's original appearance shines through. As the man stares Snake down, however, he realizes that he isn't the real big boss, and steps back. Unable to fulfill his revenge, Vulgan falls to the ground and finally dies, allowing Snake to extract his body in an arriving chopper. Back at Mother Base, Ocelot has Vulgan's body put in quarantine, where it's examined and Ocelot learns about how Trechi Rebinok was able to use the man and his desire for revenge. At some point, Eli begins to lash out, angered at Mother Base staff using his real name instead of his White Mamba moniker, attacking one of them and forcing Ocelot to humble the boy through CQC. Later, the children gather around a chlorine tank, attempting to retrieve Shibani's necklace, which fell down inside, likely caused by Eli, who watches from afar. Quiet discovers the commotion and jumps inside the tank to retrieve it. While Miller still distrusts her, Quiet soon emerges from the tank, badly burned from the chemicals, but holding the necklace. Snake carries her away so she can recover, and Ocelot retrieves the necklace. Despite this event, however, some of the kids break away from Mother Base and escape. Snake finds them and extracts them back to Mother Base, learning that the mastermind behind this was Eli, planning some kind of uprising. Ocelot questions Eli, who asks where his father is, referring to Snake. Eli claims that the boys just wanted to go home, but then breaks out into laughter as Sahelanthropus breaks through the wall, controlled by Trichy Rebinok. Eli then jumps into the mech's cockpit before bidding farewell to his father. Snake tries to stop him, but his efforts are in vain, as he's forced to simply watch as Trechi Rebinok carries Sahelanthropus away with his abilities while a helicopter stolen by the other child soldiers follows. Snake later receives the results of Eli's genetic test, determining that he is not a DNA match with Venom Snake. While Emmerich finishes Battle Gear, Ocelot and Miller still have their suspicions about him especially after Sahelanthropus was somehow repaired enough to be functional once again. Hoping to learn more about what he was up to over the past nine years, Snake returns to his lab to retrieve the Mammal Pod. After finding the Mammal Pod and bringing it to Mother Base, the Diamond Dogs open it and find Strange Love's corpse inside. They then question Huey again and learn that he did, in fact, repair Sahelanthropus using the children on Mother Base to climb inside the cockpit much like he tried with his son before. Soon, another vocal cord parasite outbreak overtakes Mother Base's quarantine zone, with the Wolbachia having no effect. Snake investigates the quarantine zone, hearing a transmission on the way coming from inside, with somebody stating, It all makes sense now. I win. Inside the quarantine zone, Snake smells a sweet scent, like ripe fruit, before seeing several dead or infected diamond dogs. He soon finds a scientist who states that he wins and is no snail before giving Snake a pair of goggles. Code Talker hears the snail reference and realizes the parasites are trying to control the hosts to get outside the zones so they can be carried away by birds and spread. With no other option, Snake is then forced to kill his infected men using the goggles to determine who has the parasites. Snake then leaves the quarantine zone walking through a sea of corpses of his own men, slaughtered by his hand, the grief of which causes him to fall to his knees. Later, Mother Base cremates the bodies, and they prepare to scatter their ashes into the sea surrounding the plant. Huey blames Snake, and he agrees, taking the ashes and wiping them on his face, stating that he'll instead turn their ashes into diamonds, in order to take them into battle forever. Miller and Ocelot then learn that the mutation of the parasites that caused the latest outbreak was the result of a massive spike in radiation caused by new equipment installed by none other than Huey Emmerich. Miller learns of Huey's contact with a client of DARPA, and in turn, Cypher, to whom he offered to sell the parasites in exchange for his safety. 
Huey is then held on trial, where all of the evidence against him is presented before the rest of Diamond Dogs. At the trial, the AI pod is brought forth, and it's revealed that it recorded Strangelove's last moments inside the pod, proving that her death was at Huey's hand. Miller then finds Huey guilty, and while the Diamond Dogs want him executed, Snake instead sentences him to exile, much to Miller's disappointment. Huey is then loaded onto a life raft with food and water and lowered into the sea. As he's lowered, Huey argues that Snake is the true villain. As he hits the water, Huey is forced to throw his exoskeleton legs overboard in order to stay afloat, losing his ability to walk once again. The others then watch him drift away, and Ocelot predicts that one day, his lies will catch up to him. Meanwhile, while Quiet is treated for her injuries from the chlorine tank, an MRI not only confirms to Diamond Dogs that she is the assassin from the hospital on Cyprus, but it also reveals that she's infected with the vocal cord parasites, leading Miller to believe that she's a sleeper agent for a last-ditch effort from Skullface to kill them. Ocelot then tortures Quiet to try to get her to speak, but she doesn't make a sound, living up to her namesake. Snake, realizing that she could have killed any of them by this point, has her freed before they all exit, leaving Quiet alone with Code Talker. The pair then speak in Navajo, and Quiet reveals that she was infected with the English strain of the parasites by Skullface, but refuses to speak the language ever again to prevent its spread. Realizing that she can't stay at Mother Base lest the parasites begin to mutate and spread without her speaking, Quiet uses her invisibility to stow away on a helicopter to return to Afghanistan. Miller, believing Quiet knows too much about Diamond Dogs to let her simply walk away, takes up Snake's offer that he be the one to kill her when the time comes. When Snake goes to search for her, he learns that she's been captured by the Soviets and taken prisoner. On his way to rescue her, Snake is told the truth about Quiet by Code Talker, including why she never spoke and why she left. Meanwhile, Quiet is tortured by her Soviet captors, who forcibly cover her skin and nearly drown her. She soon breaks free, however, and fights them off with her hands tied behind her back. Snake then arrives and tries to cut her free, but more guards attack, causing her to fight them off, taking out her frustrations on her captors and retrieving her gear. Reinforcements arrive, however, bringing waves of heavy artillery that the pair fend off. As the onslaught draws to an end, the pair begin to celebrate, but are struck by a tank round, which knocks them both out. Snake awakens and carries the unconscious Quiet through a sandstorm to safety, hiding from the Soviets searching for them. While hiding, however, Snake is bitten by a cobra, and the venom causes him to pass out as well. Later, Quiet awakens and hears Pequod calling Snake via radio, requiring his confirmation to stay at the landing zone for extraction. Quiet tries to respond in Navajo, but Pequod is unable to understand, forcing her to finally speak English in order to direct him to their location. Snake is later given an anti-venom and awakens, but finds Quiet missing. Snake, refusing to leave in the helicopter, then spots a set of her footprints. He follows the trail to where it ends, a cliffside, where a nearby tree holds Quiet's final message to Snake, recorded on cassette. Snake listens to the recording, where he finally hears Quiet tell her story in her own words, in which she admits that while she was initially driven by vengeance, Snake showed her something else, even without using any words, giving her a change of heart. In her final words, she expresses her gratitude before never being seen or heard again. By this point, Venom Snake's hypnotherapy begins to wear off, and he remembers the true version of the events that transpired during the attack on Mother Base, as well as his hospital stay and escape in Cyprus. He then receives a cassette tape labeled From the Man Who Sold the World, containing a message from the real Big Boss, calling him his friend and entrusting him with carrying the public image of Big Boss moving forward. At some point, Snake then turns the tape over, with this side being labeled Operation Intrude N313, containing stored data, which he pulls up on a nearby computer. Snake then looks in a mirror and sees his reflection as blood-covered, with his horn-shaped shrapnel protruding greatly. He then punches the mirror, shattering his demonic reflection and accepting the fate created for him. Sometime later, Ocelot and Miller discuss the real big boss. 
Miller, feeling slighted by being lied to, asks what the purpose of the plan was. Ocelot then reveals that Big Boss had been working separately to create their true outer heaven in the form of a military nation, and that until it's complete, it's their job to help Venom Snake in order to carry on Big Boss's meme or legend. Ocelot then states that one day, the age of Big Boss's sons will arrive, and they'll want to settle the score with their father, giving Ocelot and Miller their own roles to play. Miller states that he'll do everything in his power to make the Phantom, as well as the Sons, as strong as possible to send Big Boss to hell. Ocelot then realizes that one day, the Twin Snakes will battle each other, and they'd likely be assisting separate Sons, meaning that one of them would have to end up killing the other, a prospect Miller is completely fine with. Later on, it's discovered that Eli and the children took Sailanthropus and the last sample of the English vocal cord parasites to Central Africa. Cypher begins to search for them, leading Snake and Miller to escalate their efforts to find them first. As it turns out, Eli had infected himself with the parasite, and is now leading the other child soldiers in his own Kingdom of the Flies, demanding the body of Big Boss in exchange for Sailanthropus's nuclear warhead. Snake infiltrates Eli's kingdom, but as he does, XOF arrives as well, prompting a massive battle, during which Sailanthropus is destroyed. Eli emerges from the cockpit, and Snake protects him from advancing XOF soldiers. As a grenade goes off, however, Snake is left disoriented, and he mistakes Eli for an XOF soldier, shooting him accidentally. Snake then rushes over and mourns the boy, feeling massive guilt for his accident. Ocelot then leads a cleanup crew, and a medic discovers that Eli survived the shot. As they prepare to take him back to Mother Base, however, he begins to show symptoms of the vocal cord parasite, forcing them to leave him behind. In their last moments together, Eli blames Snake, his father, for cursing him with this life, stating that one day he'll destroy all of Cypher and surpass his father. Snake then leaves Eli with a pistol with one bullet as the Diamond Dogs leave, preparing to wipe Eli's kingdom clean with napalm. Eli watches them fly off with the remains of Sailanthropus and holds the gun up to his head before he hears the sound of breathing through a gas mask. He then turns to see Trechi Rebinok before him, and he lowers the weapon as the third boy telekinetically removes the parasites from Eli's vocal cords. The pair then levitate away as the napalm strike decimates the area. Venom Snake watches the strike out of the window of the chopper, spotting his demonic self once again in the reflection. Eli and Trechi Rebinok then arrive in New York, and the pair set off to work together to continue the boy's revenge on his father, Big Boss. During the late 1980s, the third Big Boss clone, Solidus Snake, or George Sears, is dispatched to fight in the Liberian Civil War. There he kills a couple before finding their young son. Solidus adopts the boy and names him Jack, bringing him into the small boy unit of the Army of the Devil, a group of child soldiers led by Solidus. Jack proves to be a ruthless killer, earning the nicknames White Devil and Jack the Ripper. After the war, however, Jack goes missing. In 1987, Roy Campbell, now serving in the United States Army Delta Force, has an affair with his brother's wife which leads to a pregnancy and the birth of a girl named Meryl Silverberg, who is kept unaware of her true paternal father. During the 1988 Olympic Winter Games in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, Czech figure skater Gustava Hefner meets and falls in love with Frank Hunter. The couple try to marry, but Gustava is denied citizenship. This failed defection causes Gustava to lose her rights to compete, and she subsequently joins the Czech state security. Frank Hunter then goes to the United States to join their military. In the early 1990s, one of Big Boss's clones, David, codenamed Solid Snake, is recruited into the United States Army Special Forces and dispatched to fight in the Gulf War. He later is recruited into the Foxhound Unit, where he is trained by Drill Sergeant Kazuhira Miller, now going by the name McDonnell Benedict Miller, known by his subordinates as Master Miller. Around the same time, Eli, codenamed Liquid Snake, is captured by the Iraqi army while working for the British Secret Intelligence Service. In 1991, the Cold War ends and the Soviet Union is dissolved. 
1994, Liquid Snake is rescued by the US government. In 1995, Big Boss completes his work building Outer Heaven and returns to the United States to his former role as commander of the Foxhound unit, now leading his son, Solid Snake, who still has no knowledge of his lineage, as well as Frank Hunter, now codenamed Grey Fox, who had also joined the group. Unbeknownst to those in Outer Heaven, which has now absorbed all of the remainder of the Diamond Dogs, Venom Snake then takes his place as Big Boss, the leader of the military nation. In 1995, the Western powers catch wind that Outer Heaven may be holding nuclear weapons. Foxhound is then tasked with infiltrating the nation to investigate, and Big Boss sends in Grey Fox. The mission goes south, however, as Grey Fox is captured and taken prisoner, but not before he is able to transmit two words of a distress call saying only, Metal Gear. Now with all the pieces set in motion, Big Boss initiates Operation Intrude N313, sending his rookie son, Solid Snake, into Outer Heaven. Ultimately, Big Boss hopes he can trick the inexperienced soldier into retrieving false intel, as well as eliminating one of the products of Cypher's Les Enfants Terribles project by setting Solid Snake up to die. Solid Snake infiltrates Outer Heaven through an underwater insertion, while Big Boss takes the role of commanding officer via radio communications. Snake soon finds and rescues several captives in Outer Heaven, learning of a group of resistance fighters in the area who end up assisting him on his mission, including ex-punk singer Diane, her brother Steve, another woman named Jennifer, and lastly their leader, Kyle Schneider. Snake soon gets himself caught by the Outer Heaven forces in order to be taken to the same holding cells as Grey Fox. In his cell, Snake is able to punch through a weak spot in the wall to create a passageway into the adjacent cell, where he finds Grey Fox. Fox informs Snake about Outer Heaven's secret weapon, the TX-55 Metal Gear Walking Nuclear Tank, able to launch from any terrain. Fox then sends Snake to search the compound for Dr. Drago Petrovich Madnar, the scientist who built the machine, knowing that if there's a way to destroy the Metal Gear, the doctor would know it. On his way out of the prison, Snake is stopped by the guard, known as the Shot Maker, who opens fire. Snake is able to avoid his shots and reach the room his gear was taken to after being confiscated. After discarding a tracking device hidden in his equipment, Snake is able to return to the Shot Maker and defeat him in battle. Continuing his search for Dr. Madnar, Snake is stopped by another one of Outer Heaven's elite mercenaries, the Machine Gun Kid, who Snake is also able to dispose of. Snake determines that he must parachute off the roof of one building to reach another, but when he reaches the roof, he finds a Hind D gunship waiting for him. After taking the aircraft out, Snake jumps off the building and safely parachutes down, making his way to Madnar's cell. When he reaches it, however, Snake finds the cell empty, later learning that the doctor had been moved to the basement of a nearby building. After using mines to destroy a tank in his way, Snake reaches the second building, but finds it heavily guarded. Big Boss then calls and suggests that Snake disguise himself to get past the security, before changing his radio frequency for further communication. Snake then finds an enemy uniform and dons it to get into the second building. Inside, Snake fights off an armored bulldozer and finds the cell of Dr. Madnar, but soon discovers that the man inside is simply a decoy, and suddenly the floor opens to a pit, killing the decoy while Snake narrowly escapes. Snake then continues his search for the real doctor, fighting and killing another mercenary, the Fire Trooper. Snake then gets a hold of Jennifer, who prepares a rocket launcher for him, which he uses to defeat a pair of humanoid cyborgs called Bloody Brad. Afterwards, Snake finally reaches the real Dr. Madnar, who refuses to help Snake unless he rescues his daughter, Ellen. Snake then finds Ellen, who reveals that Madnar is only assisting Outer Heaven under duress, and he was forced to create Metal Gear against his will. With Ellen safe, Snake returns to Madnar, who gives him Metal Gear's location the 100th floor basement of a building to the north, as well as a secret order to place explosives at Metal Gear's feet in order to destroy it. As Snake makes his way to Metal Gear, Schneider calls Snake, revealing that he's learned the identity of Outer Heaven's leader. Before he can reveal it, however, he is stopped by someone, and Snake never hears from him again during the mission. Snake then finds and kills the final mercenary, Dirty Duck, to rescue another group of POWs, one of which is Jennifer's brother. In the basement, Snake finds one last POW, who reveals to Snake the identity of the man behind the Outer Heaven Uprising, his commanding officer, the legendary Big Boss. 
Snake finally reaches the TX-55 Metal Gear, and using Dr. Madnar's advice, he is able to destroy the giant machine and prevent its launch. After Metal Gear's destruction, Outer Heaven's self-destruct sequence activates, forcing Snake to make a quick escape. On his way out, however, Snake is met face to face by a man he believes to be Big Boss. In actuality, this man is his commander's phantom, the body double, Venom Snake. The two snakes then battle, with the rookie Foxhound soldier emerging victorious, killing Big Boss's body double and fulfilling his final mission. Solid Snake then climbs back to the surface and escapes Outer Heaven before its destruction, completing his mission and returning home. Afterwards, the remains of Outer Heaven are destroyed through a series of NATO bombings, destroying the nuclear weapons left behind. At some point later, the real Big Boss speaks out to Solid Snake, stating that they'll meet again someday. After the NATO bombing of Outer Heaven, Several members of the resistance group survive and are rescued by Big Boss, who forgave them for opposing him. The resistance leader, Kyle Schneider, is captured by NATO, however, and is forced to join NASA's secret Black Ninja Project, where he is equipped with an experimental set of armor and given drugs to enhance his natural abilities. Meanwhile, Solid Snake departs Foxhound after his betrayal by its commander. After a short stint in the CIA, Snake works as a mercenary before taking an early retirement, relocating to the Canadian wilderness. Roy Campbell, former vice command of Foxhound, then takes the place of commander of the unit left in Big Boss's wake. In 1997, Big Boss and his followers fight for the independence of a country that has then come to be known as Zanzibar Land, trying to once again develop his outer heaven for soldiers. He is then able to gain Grey Fox's trust and recruit him, as well as Dr. Madnar, who begins to design the new Metal Gear D. Zanzibar Land then begins to attack nuclear weapons disposal sites all over the world, seizing any weapons still intact and becoming the world's only nuclear power. Around this time, Huey Emmerich, who has made it back to the Americas and since married a woman named Julie Danzinger, discovers that his wife is having an affair with his now teenage son Hal. Huey, finally overcome by his grief and betrayal, drives his wheelchair into the family pool to drown himself, taking his stepdaughter, Emma, with him. Emma screams for Hal's help, but he doesn't hear her, as he is with Julie at the time. While Emma survives the ordeal, she develops both a phobia of water as well as a resentment for her stepbrother. Hal also lives with the guilt leaving home and attending the Massachusetts Institute of Technology before graduating early with a PhD and working for the Arms Tech Security Corporation. Huey's death is forever believed to be an accident by everyone except his son. By 1999, the world is on the brink of an energy crisis as oil supplies begin to run dry. That is, until a Czech scientist named Dr. Keo Marv engineers a new type of algae he calls oilix that can produce large quantities of high-grade petroleum from commonly available materials. On his way to reveal oilix at an international summit, however, Dr. Marv is kidnapped by agents of Zanzibar land, who then take him hostage. With the threat of both nuclear attack and the energy crisis in Zanzibar land's hands, Roy Campbell brings Solid Snake out of retirement to work with Foxhound once again to infiltrate Zanzibar Land as part of Operation Intrude F-014, with his main objective being to rescue Dr. Marv. Snake successfully infiltrates the stronghold and begins his search for Dr. Marv, following the signal from a transmitter hidden in his tooth. Shortly into his mission, Snake receives a call from a CIA agent named Holly White, who had infiltrated Zanzibar Land a month prior under the guise of a journalist and she offers her help and expertise. Also available to Snake for support via radio is Master McDonnell Miller, who assists Snake, fulfilling the promise he made to Ocelot over a decade earlier. Snake follows the source of the signal and finds Dr. Marv, or at least he believes he does. Again, the Dr. Snake finds is nothing but a decoy, and a black ninja reveals himself before prompting a battle. After Snake emerges successful, the dying ninja reveals himself to be none other than Kyle Schneider, the leader of the Outer Heaven Resistance, who alludes to Big Boss saving him and the others from the NATO bombing of the military nation. Schneider believes that Snake will soon see a good side of Big Boss, before giving him the location of Dr. Marv's guard, telling him to follow him to get to the doctor. 
Schneider then dies from his wounds and Snake heads off to find the guard. Snake finds and follows the guard, entering a building but finding it empty. However, he soon hears tapping on a wall, determining it to be a code, deciphering the message to get a radio frequency. Snake dials into the frequency and is shocked to find the man on the transmitting end to be Dr. Drago Petrovich Madnar, Outer Heaven's Metal Gear designer. Madnar lies to Snake, telling him that he was captured alongside Dr. Marv and forced to develop another Metal Gear for Big Boss, revealing to Snake that his former commander indeed survived the Outer Heaven incident. Madnar gives Snake Dr. Marv's location, a nearby tower, telling Snake to leave him behind, as the wall separating them is too strong to destroy. He then provides the frequency of a local zoologist friend named Johann Jacobson before sending Snake on his way. Snake heads towards the tower, receiving a radio call from an unknown person, only identifying themselves as Snake's number one fan, warning him that he's entering a minefield. While Snake avoids the mines and guards in the area, his progress is stopped by a hind D, forcing him to retreat. Under advice from Holly, Snake locates some Stinger missiles, but is stopped by the Running Man one of Zanzibar Land's powerful mercenaries. While the man's speed surpasses Snake's, his wit falls far behind and Snake kills him. Snake eventually recovers the Stinger missiles and returns to the Hind D, using his newly found arsenal to take it down. He proceeds to the tower, receiving a distress call from Holly, who reveals that her cover was blown and she was captured by the enemy. She describes her location inside the tower and Snake follows the clues to rescue her. Holly reveals that she made contact with Dr. Marv via a carrier pigeon, so Snake heads to the roof to try to find it. On the way, Snake comes across and kills another mercenary, Red Blaster. On the roof, Snake uses advice from Jacobson to lure the pigeon, finding a message attached to it that contains a code. Master Miller helps Snake crack the code to uncover a radio frequency that Snake uses to finally speak with Dr. Marv. Unfortunately, however, the doctor doesn't speak English, leaving Snake unable to communicate with him. Snake calls Dr. Madnar, who has him look for a Czech state security officer named Gustava, who was captured along with them but was able to steal an enemy uniform to disguise herself. Knowing Gustava would be the only woman soldier in Zanzibar land, he hides outside of the woman's restroom to wait for her to enter. After following the woman inside, Snake introduces himself and soon recognizes the woman as Gustava Hefner, the figure skater who won the gold at the 1988 Calgary Olympics. The woman denies this and changes the subject to rescuing Dr. Marv. Snake gives her his radio frequency and she calls the doctor, learning that the prison he's being held in is on the other side of a large crevice to the north of the tower. Dr. Marv also expresses concerns about Dr. Madnar, but Snake assures him that he's safe. Snake and Gustavo reach Madnar's cell and the three head towards the prison. On the way, however, Madnar asks to take a break before heading off to take care of some business. Left alone with some time to kill, Snake and Gustava chat for a bit, with the woman admitting that she is the ex-Olympic skater Snake suspected she was, filling him in on her past with Frank Hunter, including their failed attempt at marriage that led her to joining the Czech state security. Dr. Madnar then returns and they continue on their way. When they reach the bridge over the crevice, Madnar volunteers to cross first to ensure that it's safe. When he reaches the other side safely, Gustava follows, but suddenly a missile strikes the bridge, destroying it and blasting her back to the other side with Snake. Gustava gives Snake her brooch, alluding to it having a secret use, before she quickly dies from her injuries. Dr. Madnar is then taken away by Zanzibar land soldiers, and the source of the missile attack is revealed, Metal Gear D. The giant mech's pilot also reveals himself to Snake to be none other than his former Foxhound squad mate, Grey Fox, who taunts him before piloting Metal Gear away. Snake calls Holly, who suggests he find a hang glider to jump off of the tower to reach the other side of the crevice. On his way, Snake is ambushed in an elevator by a group of assassins called the Four Horsemen, sent by Grey Fox. Snake defeats them and is successfully able to use the hang glider to cross the crevice to reach the prison area. There, he is ambushed by another mercenary named Jungle Evil, defeating him before another battle with the last mercenary, Night Fright, who he kills as well. With more help from Master Miller, Snake finally reaches Dr. Marv's cell, but when he enters, he finds a ghastly sight. Dr. Madnar standing next to the dead body of Dr. Marv. Madnar tells Snake that he took too long, and Dr. Marv's heart gave out from the torture he was subjected to. Snake, however, notices bruising around Marv's neck. 
Madnar then reveals that Marv, a video game enthusiast, had hidden the plans for Oilix in a microfilm inside of an MSX game cartridge that's currently in a nearby locker, although Madnar couldn't find the key to it. Suddenly, Snake receives a call from Holly, who frantically tells him that he's in danger. After speaking with her contacts at intelligence agencies, she learned that after Outer Heaven, Madnar was rejected by the West, which led him to joining Zanzibar Land as a double agent. Madnar then reveals his true intentions to Snake, explaining that all he wanted was to finish his grand creation, Metal Gear. He then reveals that his bathroom break before the bridge was him contacting Grey Fox to coordinate the attack, and explains that he killed Dr. Marv after he wouldn't turn over the Oilix plans. Madnar then attacks Snake, strangling him from behind. Snake then fires multiple Stinger missiles at this surprisingly resistant old man, and he is soon defeated. Snake soon learns that Gustava's brooch changes shape when it's in different temperatures, so he puts it in the freezer, which turns it into a key. Snake then returns to Dr. Marv's cell and uses this key in the doctor's locker, opening it and obtaining the MSX cartridge with the hidden plans. When Snake goes to leave, however, Dr. Madnar, still somehow alive, thinks of his daughter Ellen and has a change of heart, telling Snake the secret to destroying Metal Gear D by using grenades to destroy its legs. Suddenly, a trapdoor opens below Snake and he falls several floors down, where he is again confronted by Grey Fox piloting Metal Gear D. Using Madnar's advice, Snake targets Metal Gear's legs and after a long battle, he destroys the machine. In the resulting explosion, Snake catches fire and Grey Fox is able to steal the MSX cartridge away from him before running off. Snake is then forced to abandon all of his gear and put out the flames before following Grey Fox to a minefield where he challenges Snake to a one-on-one -on -one fist fight. Before the fight, Snake gets a call from military expert George Kassler, who tells Snake that Grey Fox's real name is Frank Jaeger. Snake realizes Jaeger is the German word for hunter, and he determines that Grey Fox was the man Gustavo once loved, who unknowingly killed his former bride-to-be. Snake then defeats Grey Fox in battle, and the pair have one final discussion, with Grey Fox revealing his admiration for Big Boss as well as his shared vision of a home for vagrant soldiers like himself. Grey Fox then calls out Gustava's name one last time before Snake leaves him behind to die from one of the mines detonating, continuing on to search for Big Boss. Snake doesn't have to search for long, as his former commander soon beckons him. Snake then enters a nearby room to find Big Boss alive and well, much to his surprise. Snake, hoping to rid himself of the nightmares he's been having since Outer Heaven, challenges Big Boss who simply responds that they'll never go away, and even if Snake survives this battle, he'll just be fated to fight the rest of his life. Big Boss then imparts the same message the boss gave him before their final fight, and the two begin their final battle. Snake uses his ingenuity and takes Big Boss by surprise, creating a makeshift flamethrower out of a lighter and lacquer spray, and using it to burn him alive. In his last moments, Big Boss tells Snake that he is his son, before he presumably dies from his wounds. Snake is soon met by Holly, and the pair make their way towards a rendezvous point. Fighting through the remainder of Zanzibar Land's security forces, Snake and Holly reach the location, but find the helicopter hasn't arrived yet. Snake continues to hold them off, but runs out of ammo, leaving him surrounded by hostiles. The helicopter pilot Charlie arrives in the nick of time and takes them out with mounted guns, allowing Snake and Holly to board before they fly off into the sunset. Sometime later, Snake Campbell and Holly uncover the hidden Oilix plans from the cartridge, and Snake is offered to rejoin Foxhound. He denies this offer, however, and slips away to return to his life of solitude in the wilderness of Alaska. Following the events of Zanzibar Land, Dr. Madnar, Grey Fox, and Big Boss ultimately survive, with the latter two just barely. Big Boss's body is recovered by Cypher's successor, the Patriots, and kept alive, but comatose in cold storage, where Dr. Clark, Operation Snake Eater's paramedic, again extracts his perfect soldier genes and uses them in gene therapy to create a new top secret unit of the United States Army called the Next Generation Special Forces, whose genomes are rearranged to resemble his DNA. Gray Fox is also experimented on by Dr. Clark, who uses cybernetic enhancements, nanotechnology, and gene therapy to turn him into an emotionless cyborg ninja. Around this time, Eva, now going by the moniker Big Mama, 
in reference to her giving birth to the sons of Big Boss, regains contact with Ocelot, now going by the name Revolver Ocelot, after his weapon of choice, and the pair begin to work together to overthrow the Patriots. In the year 2000, Ocelot and Big Mama recruit Grey Fox's adopted sister, Naomi Hunter, to join Foxhound as Dr. Clark's assistant, and they begin to plot a way to have Clark killed. Around the same time, Roy Campbell retires from Foxhound, and Liquid Snake takes over the unit, converting it into an elite counterterrorism unit. He recruits his old friend, Trechi Ribinok, now going by the codename Psycho Mantis, as well as Revolver Ocelot, fulfilling his own promise to Kaz Miller to help the opposing son of Big Boss, while also plotting to destroy the Patriots from within. Liquid Snake then recruits other members, codenamed Vulcan Raven, Sniper Wolf, and Decoy Octopus. In 2003, Naomi secretly helps her brother escape his confinement, and after breaking free, he kills Dr. Clark before escaping. Naomi then helps her brother enter hiding, although the experiments on him leave his psyche broken, and his identity mostly erased. Over the course of the next few years, Naomi works with a Defense Intelligence Agency operative and Patriot spy named Richard Ames on the Fox Dive Project to develop a retrovirus that targets and kills only specific people based on their genetic signature, harkening back to an idea originally conceived by Zero. In early 2005, a nuclear test exercise is conducted on Shadow Moses Island, off of the coast of Alaska, which houses a nuclear weapons disposal facility. The test is conducted by Arms Tech and DARPA under Foxhound and the Next Generation Special Forces supervision. In the early 2000s, the Patriots arranged for George Sears, Solidus Snake, to be elected President of the United States. Under his leadership, a covert organization called Dead Cell is formed, with the purpose of launching surprise attacks on Allied bases for training purposes. However, growing angry at the Patriots for creating him with a limited lifespan, Solidus secretly works with Ocelot to convince Liquid Snake to lead Foxhound to revolt. After learning of the impending Foxhound revolt, Ames arranges to have rookie Meryl Silverberg brought into the unit and sent to Shadow Moses. Meanwhile, Master Kazuhira Miller is assassinated in his home by an unknown assailant. In February of 2005, Foxhound and the Next Generation Special Forces revolt and overtake the nuclear weapons disposal facility on Shadow Moses Island, taking all the personnel on site hostage, including DARPA Chief Donald Anderson, Operation Snake Eater's Mr. Sigant, and prominent figure of the Patriots, as well as the president of Arms Tech, Kenneth Baker. Foxhound threatens to launch an experimental nuclear weapon being developed on Shadow Moses, a new Metal Gear codenamed Rex, making one single demand, the remains of Big Boss. Richard Ames and the United States Defense Secretary Jim Hausman contact Roy Campbell and use his niece, Merrill's, safety as a bargaining chip to force him to come out of retirement. Campbell is then tasked with convincing Solid Snake to return to the battlefield on yet another single-man infiltration mission under his command. Five hours later, Snake is retrieved from his home in Alaska by armed soldiers and brought to a nuclear submarine called the USS Discovery. There he is met by Campbell, who fills him in on the situation while Naomi Hunter, operating as Foxhound's medical chief, injects him with several types of nanomachines and drugs to enhance his abilities as well as a cochlear implant to allow him to communicate with command via codec calls. Also in this injection is the Fox Dive virus, engineered by the Patriots to kill several targets on Shadow Moses, save for Donald Anderson. The Fox Dye plan is kept secret from nearly everyone in the mission, however, including Campbell and Snake. When Snake learns about the terrorists' demands, as well as the fact that their leader, Liquid Snake, looks identical to him, Snake agrees to the mission of rescuing Anderson and Baker while learning about the terrorists' nuclear capabilities before preparing for infiltration. Snake's mission is a failure before it can begin, however, as on Shadow Moses Island, Donald Anderson is currently being questioned. Liquid Snake, requiring two launch codes for Rex, one held by Baker and one by Anderson, has Ocelot torture the DARPA chief for his code, but he instead kills the man, taking down another core member of the Patriots, as well as the only person on the island who knew his true identity and motives. 
Ocelot apologizes, lying that it was an accident, before Psycho Mantis suggests that Foxhound member Decoy Octopus, a master of disguise, pose as Anderson to trick Solid Snake into activating Metal Gear Rex's alternate launch sequence once he arrives. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, California, Richard Ames arrives with a group of his men at the home of his former wife and Defense Intelligence Agency colleague, Nastasha Romanenko. The group forces her to provide support to Solid Snake via codec by providing him with information about the various weapons, nuclear and otherwise, on Shadow Moses. Unbeknownst to Campbell and his team, Ames observes all of Snake's progress and movements through this open line of communication giving the Patriots an eye on the operation. Snake infiltrates the facility unseen via an underwater insertion and spots Liquid Snake ascending a nearby cargo elevator. Snake sneaks by the guards and follows up the elevator, ditching his underwater gear on the way up. On the surface, Snake again spots Liquid, this time boarding a Russian Hind D to take out a pair of planes sent as a diversion, much to his and Campbell's confusion. On his way inside the facility, Snake is introduced to another remote member of support, data analyst Mei Ling, who designed the codec and Snake's new radar system. After successfully entering Shadow Moses' tank hangar, Snake is contacted via codec by his former drill instructor and one-time radio support resource, Master McDonnell Miller, or at least a man claiming to be. Snake and the others are unaware of Miller's true fate and the real identity of the man claiming to be him. Foxhound's leader, Liquid Snake. Miller gives Snake information on the environment, but truly uses their communication to keep his own tabs on Snake's mission progress. Snake soon finds the prison area and sneaks into the DARPA chief's cell, passing by another containing a young woman, Meryl Silverberg. Snake finds the man he believes to be Donald Anderson inside, and the pair discuss the terrorist's nuclear abilities. Decoy Octopus, under the guise of the DARPA chief, then lies to Solid Snake, telling him that Psycho Mantis was able to probe his mind for his launch code before misguiding him to believe that the only way to stop the terrorists from launching the nukes is to use a Permissive Action Link, or PAL, system to deactivate Metal Gear Rex using three card keys that the arms tech president is currently holding. During their conversation, the DARPA chief suddenly screams out and clutches his chest before dying, with Snake believing his death to be from a heart attack. In reality, Decoy Octopus had been infected by the Fox Dye virus carried by Snake and succumbed to its effects. Meryl hears the man's death in the neighboring cell and tricks her guard, a man named Johnny Sasaki, knocking him out and quickly stealing his uniform. Snake exits the DARPA chief's cell and spots the naked guard outside before he is suddenly held at gunpoint by a disguised Merrill, who assumes he killed the prisoner. Snake pulls out his own weapon, realizing from her lack of experience that she isn't one of the so-called genome soldiers. Their conversation is cut short when a squad enters the area and attacks, forcing the two to work together to fight them off. After the battle, Merrill runs off with Snake making a mental note of the way her hips move as she traverses. As Meryl reaches the nearby elevator, she is overtaken by Psycho Mantis's powerful abilities, and he forces her to fire at him, preventing him from following her. Snake continues on, finding arms tech president Kenneth Baker strapped to an elaborate trap with several C4 explosives set to trigger by tripwires. Revolver Ocelot then arrives, bragging again about his single-action army revolver, which he uses to prompt a shootout with Snake. Suddenly, their battle is interrupted when Ocelot's hand is severed cleanly off by an invisible assailant, who also cuts down Baker from his trap. With Baker safely out of harm's way, the C4 explodes, knocking Ocelot back and disabling the assailant's optical camouflage, revealing a cyborg ninja. Ocelot runs off carrying his severed hand, leaving the ninja behind, who begins to move erratically while screaming in agony before rushing off. Snake rushes over to Baker and asks if he gave up his launch code, and he reveals that while his mental implant prevented Psycho Mantis from probing his mind, Ocelot's torture proved too powerful, and he did end up talking. Snake asks if the DARPA chief also had a brain implant, which Baker confirms, much to Snake's confusion. Snake asks Baker for the PAL keys, but he reveals that he gave them to Merrill, 
before telling Snake that he can find her codec frequency on the back of the CD case. Snake asks Baker if there's any other way to stop Metal Gear, and the man tells him to look for ArmsTech's top engineer, Hal Emmerich, who is currently in the facility where he was working to lead the Metal Gear Rex project. Baker then gives Snake an optical disc containing the only remaining copy of the Metal Gear Rex test data. After hinting that Naomi knows something about the cyborg ninja they saw, Baker begins to clutch his own chest, and dies in the same way the man Snake thought to be the DARPA chief did. Afterwards, Campbell tells Snake to contact his niece, Meryl, to work with her, and after he finds her codec frequency, he makes contact. After gaining her trust, the pair discuss strategy. Meryl gives Snake the location of Emmerich's lab before unlocking the path for him. Snake then heads out to look for him, agreeing to meet up with Meryl after retrieving the scientist. Snake heads towards Emmerich, but is stopped by a call from an unknown party who calls himself Deep Throat, also referring to himself as one of Snake's fans, who warns him about mines in this area. Snake brushes off the deja vu and gets past the mines before he is stopped again, this time by Foxhound member Vulcan Raven, commanding a tank. Snake is able to use various grenades to disable the tank before continuing on, leaving Raven behind to report back to Ocelot. After more help from Deep Throat and a remote-controlled missile, Snake is able to reach the hallway to Emmerich's lab, finding it littered with corpses, cut by some kind of high-frequency blade. At the end of the hallway, Snake finds the culprit, the cyborg ninja he saw earlier. Snake follows the ninja into the lab, finding him advancing on the terrified Dr. Hal Emmerich. Snake distracts the ninja, who then challenges him to a battle to the death. Emmerich then hides inside a locker while Snake battles the ninja, during which his adversary reveals to Snake that the pair have a history together. Snake then realizes that this ninja is none other than Gray Fox, a man he thought was dead for years. Gray Fox begins to convulse yet again before running off. Afterwards, Snake calls Campbell to share this revelation, and Naomi confirms, filling them in on Dr. Clark's experiments but keeping her relation to Gray Fox a secret. After the battle, Snake retrieves Emmerich from the locker, and the pair discuss Metal Gear Rex, with the scientist revealing that he had no knowledge of his creation being used for nuclear launch, lamenting that the curse of nuclear weapons must be in his genes. Emmerich claims to only know about the experimental railgun on Rex's side. He then gives Snake Rex's location, but, due to a twisted ankle, he is forced to stay behind and hide with his own stealth camouflage tech to provide Snake support via codec. Snake tries to call Meryl to have her watch over Emmerich, but overhears her having a scuffle with some guards. Forced to go after her, Emmerich hands Snake a security card and hints for Snake to look for Meryl in a woman's restroom. The doctor then asks Snake to refer to him by the nickname Otakon, short for Otaku Convention, and the pair separate. Snake looks for a guard with Meryl's distinct walking style and soon finds her, following her into the women's bathroom where she's changing out of her disguise. Finally, face to face with no disguises, the pair have a discussion about the meaning of war. Afterward, Snake asks Meryl for the PAL card keys, but she reveals that Baker had only given her one. The pair agree to destroy Rex instead, and head out together to reach its hangar. On the way, however, Psychomantis again takes control of Meryl's mind, forcing her to turn her gun on him. Snake knocks her out, and the powerful Psychic reveals himself, proving his abilities by reading Snake's mind. Snake is able to outsmart the man, getting past his abilities to overpower him in battle. In his final moments, Psychomantis reveals a hidden path to the Metal Gear hangar, and Snake removes the man's gas mask, allowing him a final moment to tell his story before he asks Snake to put it back on. The man formerly known as Trechi Rebinok then uses his telekinetic abilities to help instead of harm for the first time in his life by moving a bookshelf to reveal the hidden path before he dies, finally at peace. Snake and Meryl then continue on, avoiding a cave full of wolves, which take a liking to Meryl, before they reach the final path to the hangar. Unfortunately, once there, Foxhound long-range expert Sniper Wolf fires upon them, 
shooting Meryl in the legs and arm to wound her just enough to lure Snake out into the open. Snake is then forced to return to the facility's armory to search for a sniper of his own, and soon finds one before returning to find Meryl, now gone, but Sniper Wolf still waiting for him. Snake and Wolf have a long-range shootout, with Snake eventually driving her off. This turns out to be another ruse, however, as Snake is ambushed by a group of soldiers as he tries to enter the hangar building. They hold him up, allowing Sniper Wolf to taunt him before he is knocked unconscious and taken captive. When Snake awakens, he finds himself stripped of his gear and restrained. Liquid Snake then speaks before Snake, referring to him and his brother as the last surviving Sons of Big Boss, and clarifying that he's hoping to receive Big Boss's DNA as a means to repair mutations in the Genome Soldier's DNA. He then leaves to prepare Rex for launch, leaving Ocelot to torture Snake. Ocelot reveals that Meryl is still alive, and begins to interrogate Snake about the trick Baker referred to that allowed the single PAL key to be used as multiple. Snake denies any knowledge about this, and Ocelot tortures him with electric shock. Snake withstands the torture, and is taken to a holding cell. There, Snake finds that he's being kept with the DARPA chief's dead body, but notices that it's decomposed far more than it should have for the short period of time since he saw the man die. While in captivity, Snake presses Campbell via his codec about how much he knew about Metal Gear, and his commanding officer reveals that he knew more than he initially let on, knowing that the news of a new nuclear weapon being developed by the United States couldn't leak amid their current proliferation talks. While Snake is upset about being left in the dark, he nonetheless promises to destroy Metal Gear and rescue Meryl. Snake then calls Otacon and asks for his help before he's taken back to the interrogation room. After Ocelot tells Snake his story, including how he got the nickname Shalashaska, he administers another round of torture. Snake withstands it once more and is taken back to his cell. There, Snake asks Naomi to talk to him to take his mind off the pain, and after Snake reveals that he killed the only family he knew, Big Boss, the woman tells her about her own brother who died, while still keeping his identity secret. Meanwhile, Richard Ames, still observing the situation through Nastasha Romanenko's open communication channel, has a message wired to the skipper of the USS Discovery, instructing it to be hidden from Campbell. Otacon soon arrives and reveals that while he can't get Snake out of the cell, he can still provide him with something. Some food. Otacon gives Snake some ketchup and rations. He then reveals that he's beginning to have feelings for Sniper Wolf, asking Snake not to hurt her before he runs off. Snake then uses the ketchup to trick his guard, the ill-fated Johnny Sasaki, into thinking he is bleeding. When Sasaki enters Snake's cell, Snake uses the opportunity to escape potentially due to Sasaki's bowel issues. He then returns to the torture room and retrieves his gear, finding the optical disc containing the launch data Kenneth Baker gave him is not among them. On his way back to the Metal Gear hangar, Snake gets another call from his fan warning him about a bomb placed in his gear, which he promptly disposes of. Snake makes his way back towards the hangar, fighting an onslaught of enemies on his way up the nearby communications tower. When he reaches the roof to cross over to the neighboring building, his progress is halted by Liquid Snake, who attacks in his hind D. Snake uses a rope to rappel down the side of the building to a lower bridge, where he escapes the gunship into the second building. There, he finds Otacon, who offers to fix the nearby elevator, while Snake returns to the roof to confront Liquid, after which he successfully takes out the hind D. Otacon then reveals that the elevator seemingly fixed itself, and Snake enters it, taking it down to the underground maintenance tunnel to reach the Metal Gear hangar. While in the elevator, Snake receives a call from Otacon, who decides at this moment to tell Snake that four stealth camouflage suits went missing. On cue, Snake is ambushed by four invisible soldiers and is forced into a confined battle, which he soon wins. Just before reaching the hangar, Snake is met with another obstacle, Sniper Wolf. While Otacon pleads with Snake not to kill her, the pair engage in another sniper battle. After Snake emerges successful, he rushes over to Sniper Wolf, 
who reveals in her dying breath that Big Boss rescued her as a child before asking Snake to put her out of her suffering. Before he can, Otacon arrives and tells Wolf that he loves her. She asks for her gun, and once it's returned to her, Snake sets her free by killing her. A grieving Otacon then offers Snake his continued help as he watches the man walk off. As Snake nearly reaches Metal Gear, he is stopped once again by Foxhound's remaining heavy, Vulcan Raven, carrying a massive Gatling gun. Despite the man's heavy artillery, Snake is able to defeat him, allowing him a chance to tell his story as well. As a reward for his victory, Raven gives Snake a hint, finally revealing to him that the DARPA chief he spoke with was Decoy Octopus in disguise. Snake then walks away from Raven's body, which is consumed by his birds, as the man tells him that his spirit will forever be watching. Afterwards, Snake gets a call from Master Miller, who asks Campbell if Naomi is listening. Campbell, believing Naomi to be off napping, responds that she's not, and Miller goes on to reveal that Naomi has been lying about her background and is likely betraying them as a spy of the Patriots. Campbell then promises to get to the bottom of it. This communication with Miller startles Richard Ames and Nastasha Romanenko, who wonder how a man retired in his cabin in Alaska could obtain such information. Snake finally reaches the hangar and stands before the 50-foot-tall Metal Gear Rex. He then reaches the control room, where he overhears Ocelot and Liquid Snake, who secretly are aware of Snake's eavesdropping, discussing how they've entered the launch codes and can strike whenever they want. Liquid then has their target moved from Russia to a test site in China, which he notes will make Colonel Sergei Gerlukovich happy, revealing that Russia, in exchange for the powerful nuclear weapon, was the source of Liquid's Russian weaponry. Knowing that once other countries learn of the powerful nuclear weapon, they'll come to Foxhound to obtain its blueprint, giving them all the bargaining power they need to obtain their demands, which now include $1 billion, as well as a vaccine for Foxdot. With these resources, along with Gerlukovich's army, Liquid hopes to turn Shadow Moses Island into Big Boss's vision, Outer Heaven. Snake soon receives a call from Otacon, who had hacked into Baker's files on Metal Gear and learned that the PAL override key does in fact have a trick. It changes based on temperature. If Snake inserts the key at three different temperatures after the launch codes have been inputted, it will cancel the launch. Conversely, if the key is put in before the launch codes have been inputted, it will initiate the launch. Either way, the keys can only be used once. Ocelot then shoots the key out of Snake's hand, giving him and Liquid a chance to escape as he goes to retrieve it. Snake returns to the control room and inserts the key at room temperature, then takes the key to a freezer before returning to insert it at freezing temperature, leaving only the final sequence remaining which requires heat. During this time, Richard Ames privately calls Campbell to speak with him about Naomi. Ames reveals that Naomi hadn't been taking a nap, but was instead being interrogated by agents of the Patriots, hoping to patch the holes in her story. With her reluctance to cooperate, Ames instructs Campbell to interrogate her himself, hoping a familiar face will get her to open up. While he initially questions this order, Ames again uses Meryl's safety as leverage, and Campbell reluctantly agrees to question her. Now on his way to a furnace, Snake receives another call from Miller, who asks for a private connection. Snake obliges, cutting Campbell out of their call, but not Ames, who overhears everything. Miller reveals that a source in the Pentagon informed him about a new type of assassination weapon, codenamed Fox Die, and he fills Snake in on the specifics of the project leading them to determine that the only person who could have injected Snake with the virus was Naomi. Campbell then calls Snake and confirms his suspicion, telling him that Naomi was caught sending a coded transmission and was apprehended. In truth, this is a lie fabricated by Ames to keep Snake in the dark about Naomi's true interrogation. After reaching a furnace to transform the PAL key, Snake returns back to Metal Gear, receiving another call on his way this time from Naomi, who momentarily escaped her captors and retrieved a transmitter. 
The woman reveals that while she had been lying to Snake, some of what she said about her past was true, namely about her brother, who she finally reveals to be Frank Yeager, the man Snake knew as Gray Fox. Believing Snake killed Gray Fox in Zanzibar land, Naomi vowed to get her revenge, waiting two years for this moment. She then explains how fox dye works, but reveals that it wasn't her idea to use it. She then tries to tell Snake one last thing, but is cut short, and Campbell butts in to tell him that she has been removed from the operation and can no longer make any transmissions to him. While Snake feels double-crossed, Campbell reminds him that his current priority is stopping Metal Gear and preventing the nuclear strike. As Snake prepares to input the final PAL key, Richard Ames receives a harrowing message. Nastasha was right. The Master Miller Snake has been speaking to is not the real Master Miller, as his body was just discovered by Ames's men at his home in Alaska. Snake then inserts the PAL key one last time, and is shocked when alarms begin to blare stating that the launch code has been entered and missile launch has been activated. A surprise snake is then called by Miller once more, who finally reveals his true identity as Liquid Snake, explaining the grand ruse to trick Snake into helping them during his entire mission. Liquid then locks Snake inside the control room and fills it with poisonous gas, but Otacon is able to hack the security to allow him to exit. Outside, Snake finds Liquid beside Metal Gear Rex, and his brother then reveals the true nature behind Snake's mission, to simply act as a carrier to spread Fox Die to the necessary parties to kill them so Metal Gear could be retrieved secretly. However, Naomi made unknown changes to the virus before she injected it, changes her superiors are currently trying to uncover. Liquid then proceeds to finally tell Snake about their origins, the Les Enfants Terribles project. Liquid, resentful that his brother not only got all of their father's dominant genes, but also robbed him of his chance at vengeance by killing Big Boss before he could. Instead of killing Big Boss, Liquid settles on surpassing him instead, before he jumps into the Metal Gear Rex's cockpit and activates it, forcing Snake into his third Metal Gear battle. Snake then gets a call from Otacon, who informs him that Rex's armor is impenetrable, and the only way to stop Liquid would be by destroying the machine's radome to disable its sensors to force Liquid to open the cockpit so Snake can hit him. Using missiles, Snake strikes at the radome, but is unable to completely destroy it. As Rex is just about to crush Snake, Gray Fox arrives and uses his enhanced strength to stop it, allowing Snake to get to safety. In a moment of vulnerability, Fox admits to Snake that he doesn't deserve his sister's love, since it was he who killed her parents. Fox then gives Snake a final gift from Deep Throat, rushing out to distract Liquid, who cuts off Fox's arm before pinning him against the wall. Liquid taunts Gray Fox by saying that in the Middle East, they hunt jackals instead of foxes, with Fox responding that a cornered fox is more dangerous than a jackal, using his last moments to deliver the final blow to Rex's sensors. As Fox lays dying, he tells Snake to fire his Stinger missiles at Rex, but he can't bring himself to do it, knowing the explosion would also kill Fox. Liquid then crushes Fox under Metal Gear's foot, finally killing Snake's former friend and squadmate. With Rex's cockpit open and Liquid exposed, Snake fires his Stinger missiles at him, eventually damaging the internals enough to disable Metal Gear. The ensuing explosion blasts Snake into the wall, knocking him unconscious. Liquid then retrieves his brother, ties him up, and carries him atop the disabled Metal Gear Rex. He also retrieves the sedated Meryl, placing her beside him. While Snake is passed out, Liquid speaks directly into his ear, knowing the Patriots can still hear him through the cochlear implant. Liquid warns them that as soon as he's done with Snake, he'll be coming to finally destroy them as well, a challenge that Richard Ames welcomes. Snake then awakens, and Liquid reiterates his plan to build a new world for him and his brethren, the Genome Soldiers, insisting that Snake must share his desire since it's written into both of their genes. 
Liquid then goes into more detail about the Les Enfants Terribles project, as well as the creation of the Genome Soldiers and their fate to die out due to the lack of gene diversity, that is, unless they can crack the code using Big Boss's DNA. Liquid then shows Snake the nearby Meryl, telling him that he'll let her go after one final showdown between the brothers, to prove whose genes are truly superior. He also mentions that there's now a ticking clock, as the United States, having learned of Metal Gear's destruction, now plan to simply destroy the island with an airstrike to wipe out all evidence of their classified project. Snake then calls Campbell, who confirms the cover-up, but promises that he'll issue the command to halt the airstrike, which should at least buy them some time. Richard Ames overhears this and makes the order for his men to arrest Campbell. Before Campbell can issue the order, he is taken away, and the Secretary of Defense, Jim Hausman, takes command of the mission, telling Snake that Campbell will be charged for treason before confirming that the airstrike is on schedule before hanging up. Liquid then reveals his own nuclear device, also set to a timer, and he and Snake fight man-to-man, hand-to-hand, atop Metal Gear Rex. While Snake is unable to simply overpower his brother, he's able to force him off the side of the machine, sending him plunging below, seemingly to his death. At this same time, Richard Ames aborts the airstrike, and the Patriots, angered with Hausman's renegade actions, have the Secretary of Defense detained. Snake then rushes over to Merrill as she awakens, and the pair share a short reunion before Snake calls Otacon to warn him about the impending airstrike. Otacon refuses to leave, however, instead promising to stay at his station to use his hacking skills to get Snake and Merrill past any remaining security to escape the facility and get to safety. Otacon then leads them to a parking garage where they can find a vehicle to drive through a nearby escape tunnel. Snake helps Merrill get down from Rex, and after he dons his sneaking suit once again, the pair are able to commandeer a jeep to escape. After using the mounted gun to fight through the remaining opposition, Snake is shocked when another jeep approaches just behind them, with a surviving liquid snake at the wheel. As they both reach the exit of the facility, the twin snakes' vehicles collide, and they both overturn in the crash. Snake and Merrill are pinned under their jeep, allowing Liquid to walk over with his gun trained on his brother. Before he can fire, however, he finally succumbs to the fox dye virus, and the man once known as Eli falls dead, leaving a warning omen to Snake that this means he's susceptible to the virus he's carrying as well. Snake and Merrill look up and notice the airstrike isn't arriving, and Campbell calls Snake to give him the news that it was called off. Snake informs Campbell of Merrill's safety, and the retired colonel apologizes for keeping so many secrets from Snake, restoring the pair's friendship. Campbell has Snake and Merrill officially pronounced dead in the crash, giving them a clean slate to do whatever they'd like with the rest of their lives. Snake then has somebody sent to retrieve Otacon, and Campbell tells them about a nearby snowmobile Snake and Merrill can use to take to a helicopter for evacuation. The codec call then switches to Naomi, who wishes to speak with Snake about Fox Die. Snake gives Naomi the one last message that her brother left with him before his death, instructing her to move on with her own life instead of avenging his. Snake tells Naomi that Fox Die killed Liquid and asks when he'll die, to which she simply responds that it's up to him, before passing on her brother's advice back to Snake, telling him to live his life. Snake and Merrill then find the snowmobile as Snake recalls Naomi's words about genes, as well as her message to live life without being chained to the fate within them. Snake and Merrill then share one more conversation where he finally tells her his real name, David, and they ride away from Shadow Moses. Sometime later, Ocelot speaks on the phone with the President of the United States, George Sears, the third perfect clone of Big Boss, Solidus Snake. Ocelot informs him that he was able to retrieve all of the Metal Gear Rex project data and keep his cover intact. Ocelot then muses with Solidus that while Liquid spent his entire life believing he expressed Big Boss's recessive genes, he had actually always been the dominant clone, while the inferior Solid Snake was ultimately the victor between the two. 
Ocelot then mentions that it would take a well-balanced individual like Solidus to rule the world, before ending the call. Right after the events at Shadow Moses, Richard Ames secretly gives Nastasha Romanenko two optical discs, one containing the recordings of all of the communications they observed during the mission, as well as one with all of the information on the Fox Die project, including Naomi's modifications, which changed the amount of time it would take to kill Solid Snake to a random value that even she didn't know. Ames then helps Nastasha flee from her home, where she goes into hiding and writes a tell-all book about the events entitled In the Darkness of Shadow Moses, The Unofficial Truth, which goes on to become a bestseller. The US government subsequently denies any involvement in the events, instead blaming it on a terroristic group. Jim Hausman is then set up to take the fall for the failed military response, with the Patriots staging his suicide. George Sears slash Solidus Snake is also forced to resign from the US presidency as punishment for acting against the Patriots' interests. They also attempt to kill him, but he goes underground with the help of Ocelot, evading their plot. In the wake of the Foxhound unit's defection, it is officially disbanded around this time. Ocelot later sells the data from the Metal Gear Rex project on the black market, before disappearing causing countries all over the world to build their own versions of Metal Gear. He uses the massive amount of sums gained to buy his own country and break Naomi out of prison. He is also able to retrieve Liquid Snake's body, transplanting the dead man's arm onto his own to replace his missing hand as well as to enact a very complicated plan. Using his self-hypnotherapy skills, along with nanomachines, Ocelot begins to adopt pieces of Liquid Snake's personality, under the guise of spiritual possession through the arm. Solid Snake and Otacon then form Philanthropy, a non-governmental organization designed to target and destroy the new Metal Gear Rex derivatives. Nastasha learns of this and donates all of the proceedings from her book to the organization. Snake's focus on this plight drives a wedge between him and Meryl, and they subsequently lose contact with each other. Meanwhile, the boy Solid as Snake once adopted, Jack, is recruited by the Patriots, who implant him with a series of nanomachines to help suppress his memories and enhance his abilities. He's then brought into the United States Army's Task Force 21, where he is trained through hundreds of virtual reality missions, including one designed to replicate Solid Snake's missions, including the Shadow Moses incident. This training serves as the basis for the Selection of Societal Sanity, or S3 plan, a program in which the Patriots attempt to manipulate real-world events. In 2007, Otacon gets an anonymous tip from someone codenamed E.E., whom he believes to be his estranged stepsister, Emma, about a new amphibious model of Metal Gear that's scheduled for transport on a U.S. Marines vessel disguised as an oil tanker, coincidentally named the USS Discovery, traveling on the Hudson River in New York. Snake dons a stealth camouflage suit and jumps off the George Washington Bridge as the tanker passes under it, successfully infiltrating the ship. When Snake lands, he damages his stealth technology, forcing him to find Metal Gear the old-fashioned way to obtain photographic evidence to expose this new model to the public. From a helicopter out of Snake's sight, Ocelot watches, remarking that Snake is right on schedule. As he and Otacon discuss his route to the ship's cargo hold, Snake watches as the Marines on board are slaughtered by a squad of unknown assailants. Snake then spots the perpetrator, Ocelot's partner in Russia, Sergei Gerlukovich. Snake then explores the tanker, getting past Gerlukovich's men to find himself on the bridge. There, he spots more heavy reinforcements arriving via chopper and learns that the ship is headed to a location off the coast of Bermuda, leading Otacon to believe the Metal Gear is ready for solo testing. Snake then spots a woman outside and heads out to investigate. He eavesdrops on her radio conversation with Gerlukovich, revealing that she is his daughter, Olga, and she is currently with child. While Gerlukovich demands that she leave the mission now that her job is complete, Olga instead elects to stay and fight with her men. 
Snake holds Olga at gunpoint, but she quickly outmaneuvers him and the pair proceed to have a shootout. Snake takes Olga down non-lethally with tranquilizers, but as he investigates her, a US Army Cypher T UAV spots him and snaps a photo before flying off. Snake continues on his way to the cargo hold, fighting through Gerlukovich's heavy reinforcements to finally reach it. As he enters, Ocelot, with two hands once again, follows closely behind, killing one of Gerlukovich's men that evaded Snake's assault. Inside the hold, Snake finally sees the new weapon, codenamed Metal Gear Ray, being presented by Marine Commandant Scott Dolph. Snake takes pictures of Ray from multiple angles before sending them to Otacon using a nearby workstation. After Dolph wraps up his speech, Ocelot arrives and sarcastically congratulates him on his presentation, before telling the Commandant that he plans on taking Metal Gear back. Suddenly, Gerlukovich takes Dolph hostage as Ocelot reveals that the ship has been fitted with several explosives to, quote, blow it out of the water. As Gerlukovich's men prepare to steal Metal Gear Ray, he revels in the fact that Russia will rise again. Ocelot then reveals to his partner that he has no intention to give it to Russia, but instead to take it back to the Patriots. Dolph then recognizes this name, repeating it back as Lalelule Lo, due to the Patriot's censorship nanomachines not allowing him to speak the actual words. A betrayed Gerlukovich asks Ocelot if he's still working with Solidus, to which Ocelot simply responds that he and his daughter will die on the tanker. Gerlukovich then pushes Dolph towards Ocelot, who throws his coat as a distraction before firing his signature revolver and killing both the Marine Commandant and Sergei Gerlukovich. Ocelot then detonates the explosives, and the ship begins to sink. Snake rushes over to Ocelot to try to stop him from approaching Ray, and suddenly Ocelot's arm begins to twitch, and the man convulses before Liquid's personality awakens within him. While Ocelot tries to fight this off, Liquid taunts his brother, seeing his advanced aging starting to take place. He then jumps into Ray's cockpit, and the giant, powerful machine breaks free of the tanker, knocking Snake unconscious in the process. Ocelot leaves Snake floating in the water and swims off in Ray, speaking with someone in the Patriots about taking it to an undisclosed location. He then reveals that the cipher that took the photo of Snake was his doing, and they now have evidence that he was on the scene. After the tanker's sinking, Snake survives, and he and Otacon steal Liquid Snake's body. They then leave it in the harbor, where it's found and DNA tested, leading the public to believe that Solid Snake died in the tanker's destruction. The Patriots then launch a massive smear campaign through the media, blaming the terrorist attack on Solid Snake and philanthropy ruining their standing on the global stage. The Patriots, now possessing Metal Gear Ray, which was developed against their will, then send a tanker containing actual oil to the same spot the USS Discovery sank, and they sink that one as well, building the Big Shell decontamination facility to clean up the oil spill, using it to cover up the construction of Arsenal Gear, a submersible fortress for the Patriots to house their AI system GW that will act as the means of national data and military control. Emma Emmerich is then recruited to create GW. Around this time, the Patriots recruit a data analyst from the Pentagon named Rosemary to keep tabs on their S3 plan candidate, Jack. After she deliberately adjusts her appearance and personality to appeal to him, the pair meet at Federal Hall in New York City and establish a romantic relationship shortly after. While this relationship is initially just a means for Rosemary to provide information to the Patriots, she begins to develop true feelings for him as time goes on. The Patriots also capture Olga Gerlukovich's baby daughter once she is born, holding the child hostage to force Olga to assist Jack as part of the S3 plan. Meanwhile, the leader of the Dead Cell group, Commander Jackson, is killed. Leadership is then taken over by his wife, codenamed Fortune, who is also the daughter of the Marine Commandant who died on the tanker, Scott Dolph. Shortly after, they are targeted by the Patriots and framed for the mass murder of civilians, leading the group to go rogue. In 2009, two years after the tanker incident, the 44th President of the United States, James Johnson, 
visits the Big Shell facility. Dead Cell, working with the remains of Gerlukovich's private army under the collective name the Sons of Liberty, then seized control of the Big Shell, taking everyone on the facility, including the President and Patriots agent Richard Ames, hostage. They then demand $30 billion, threatening to blow up the facility, which would not only kill the hostages, but also ignite the oil in the waters, creating an environmental disaster. In actuality, these events are secretly orchestrated by the Patriots as part of their S3 plan to replicate the events of the Shadow Moses incident, and Jack, its prime candidate, is sent in to carry out a rescue mission, believing himself to be part of the Foxhound unit. Commanded by a man known only as the Colonel, who is actually an AI recreation of Colonel Roy Campbell projected by the Patriots' GW system, Jack reaches Big Shell via an underwater infiltration. While his initial codename for the mission was to be Snake, to further ingratiate him into the Shadow Moses replication, he is redesignated to the codename Raiden, so he isn't mistaken for the Sons of Liberty's leader, a man claiming to be Solid Snake. Meanwhile, two other groups from SEAL Team 10 are sent into Big Shell via helicopter, Alpha Team, who are tasked with rescuing the President, and Bravo Team, who are led by bomb disposal expert Peter Stillman and tasked with defusing any explosives planted by Dead Cell. On his way to the facility, Raiden spots several guards knocked unconscious, and he sees another intruder heading up a nearby elevator. This man is none other than the real Solid Snake, but Raiden is unable to identify him from his current angle. As Raiden follows, the Colonel calls him to introduce him to the mission analyst, his girlfriend Rosemary, much to his protest. Despite his disagreement, Raiden continues the mission, where he reaches an elevator which he takes to the surface of the facility, ditching his underwater gear on the way up. As Raiden explores, the Colonel intercepts a transmission from Alpha Team, who had secured the President but were attacked while trying to evacuate, cutting all communications. Raiden tries to head to their last known location, and on the way he finds the bodies of several of the team lining a hallway. Inside the neighboring room, the vampire-like Dead Cell member Vamp ritualistically finishes off the rest of the team. Raiden enters to investigate, and Vamp nearly kills him before another member of SEAL Team 10 suddenly enters and interrupts. Vamp almost kills this man in turn, but he receives a call from Dead Cell's leader and quickly vanishes. The SEAL Team member, who is actually Solid Snake, then introduces himself by the name Iroquois Pliskin, keeping his true identity hidden from Raiden. During their conversation, Pliskin notices Raiden's sneaking suit is of Foxhound's design, remarking that the unit had disbanded four years prior. Bravo Team then sends a distress call that Pliskin picks up on his radio, but as he is unable to move due to blood loss from his tussle with Vamp, Raiden is forced to head to their location alone. There, Raiden finds Bravo Team firing at Dead Cell's leader, Fortune, who has the President resting at her feet. While the squad fires all their weapons directly at the woman, none of their bullets can reach their mark, changing course just before they can hit her, leaving her completely untouched. Vamp then arrives and collects the President, walking off with him before she fires her railgun at the bridge in front of her, destroying it and killing Bravo Team, as well as blocking Raiden's path. With the entire mission now resting in his hands, Raiden is set to find Peter Stillman to defuse the explosives around the big shell. Raiden soon reaches Stillman's location, finding Pliskin there with the NYPD bomb squad expert. Stillman regretfully explains that he was brought in due to his relationship with Dead Cell member and explosives master Fat Man, who was also Stillman's former pupil. Stillman also tells them that he was brought in with an unknown security systems engineer, whose true identity is Hal Otacon Emmerich. Stillman decides that the best way to neutralize the bomb threat is not to defuse them, but instead to temporarily freeze the C4 charges using a sprayable coolant. Using a sensor to follow the scent of Fat Man's cologne, Raiden and Pliskin split up to freeze the bombs. While Raiden is searching for the explosives, he overhears Olga Gerlukovich, who is now leading the Russian soldiers, speaking about a cyborg ninja she's seen around Big Shell. As Raiden confronts her, however, she swiftly jumps away, evading him. Continuing on, Raiden soon gets a codec call from an unknown caller with a Russian accent, who warns him about undetectable claymore mines in his path. This caller, one of Raiden's fans, initially introduces themselves as Deep Throat, a name Raiden instantly recognizes from Shadow Moses, causing the caller to rename themselves to Mr. X. While Raiden defuses more bombs, Stillman has Pliskin search for something larger, sensing something off about Fat Man's M.O. 
His suspicions are correct, as Pliskin finds a larger set of C4 below one of the facility's struts. Raiden and Pliskin then finish freezing the other bombs while Stillman tries to defuse the larger bomb. After Raiden and Pliskin finish defusing the small bombs, Stillman discovers that the larger bomb has begun to count down. Fighting against the clock, Raiden rushes to find the other large bomb Stillman suspects to be on one of the facility's opposing struts. When Raiden finds the second large bomb, he gets a call from Stillman, warning him that these bombs have a proximity sensor and he's tripped the one by him. The bomb by Stillman then explodes, killing the man and damaging the structural integrity of the big shell, flooding various parts of the facility. Raiden then rushes to freeze the second bomb in order to keep the facility afloat, spraying it from a distance in order to successfully neutralize it. With the bomb threat neutralized for now, Raiden returns to the task of looking for the president. On his way back, he is met by Fortune, who relentlessly fires at him with her railgun while he is unable to hit her with any of his weapons in return. After a short time, Raiden gets a call from the colonel telling him that Fat Man contacted them, claiming to have planted a bomb on the helipad. Raiden withstands Fortune's onslaught, and Vamp arrives to inform her about Fat Man's rogue explosives work. As Fortune turns to leave, Raiden fires a shot at her, but it changes course before it hits her, landing directly in Vamp's forehead. Fortune rushes to Vamp and holds him, lamenting his death while chastising Raiden for being unable to give her the death she's felt robbed of for so long. Raiden uses this distraction to escape, leaving Fortune behind with her dead comrade. However, suddenly his eyes open and Vamp speaks to her again, stating that he's died once already, therefore he cannot die again. Raiden then reaches the helipad and finds Fat Man's bomb, freezing it before it explodes. Afterwards, Fat Man himself then skates up on rollerblades and reveals his motives, to become the most famous bomber of all time, denying any knowledge of Dead Cell's supposed ransom. Fat Man then plants more bombs, forcing Raiden to freeze them while simultaneously trying to take him down. After Raiden defeats him in battle, Fat Man reveals he's planted one last bomb, the biggest of all, before dying from his wounds. Raiden then discovers the bomb, hidden underneath Fat Man's body, and disarms it, finally bringing Big Shell's bomb threat to an end. As Raiden heads to search for the President once again, he is stopped by the cyborg ninja Olga spoke about seeing earlier. The cyborg ninja reveals themselves to be Mr. X, that called Raiden earlier and claiming to be a messenger from the Lali Lule Lo, gives Raiden the location of the captive Richard Ames, who should be able to lead him to the president. Mr. X gives Raiden a security card to get into the core section of the facility with the hostages, as well as a disguise to blend in. Mr. X then reveals that Dead Cell has access to a nuclear weapon, the new Metal Gear being developed under Big Shell, something Mr. X tells Raiden to ask Ames about. Mr. X then gives Raiden a cell phone before vanishing. With no other direction, Raiden follows Mr. X's lead, disguising himself as an enemy soldier and reaching the hostage holding area. There, Raiden uses a directional microphone to locate Ames by listening for his pacemaker. A nearby ocelot observes as Ames tells Raiden that he was sent in by the Lali Lule Lo, just like him, much to Raiden's confusion. Ames then switches to communication through their nanomachines, so as to talk silently, before telling Raiden the president's location explaining that the terrorists can't kill him, as his biometric data is the key to activating the new Metal Gear. Ames begins to reveal to Raiden that the oil spill and Big Shell cover-up were all planned, but is interrupted when the pair spot Ocelot speaking with the Sons of Liberty's leader, Snake. Raiden uses his directional microphone to eavesdrop, hearing that the President has agreed to cooperate with the terrorists, and Metal Gear is close to activating, leaving Outer Heaven only a few steps away. Olga arrives and argues with Ocelot about her father's death, which she correctly suspects to be at his hand, before leaving shortly before Snake does, stating that he's off to take care of the intruder. Ames and Raiden continue their conversation, and the Patriots agent also denies knowing anything about the ransom, revealing that the terrorist's true goal is to detonate the nuke in the atmosphere above Manhattan, creating an electromagnetic pulse to take out all the electronics to liberate it and turn it into a new republic, hence the name Sons of Liberty. Ocelot then arrives and confronts Ames, revealing his knowledge of the man's status with the Patriots, as well as his true reason for being sent to Big Shell, to keep tabs on the President, who they knew would betray them. Ocelot then pulls his weapon on Ames, but the man begins to convulse before falling dead before them, seemingly of a heart attack. 
However, this was no accident. In fact, it was caused by the Patriots remotely shutting off his pacemaker through nanomachines in his body. Ocelot then confronts Raiden, having his mask removed. Suddenly, Mr. X jumps in between them and shields Raiden from the soldier's gunfire, giving him a chance to escape. Hoping to get more information, Raiden heads to the location of the president given to him by Ames. On his way, Raiden gets a call from Pliskin, who is able to commandeer an enemy helicopter with the help of his partner, who he introduces to Raiden as Otacon, a name he immediately recognizes from Shadow Moses. Snake and Otacon soon arrive at Raiden's location in their chopper, and suddenly Raiden is confronted by the man claiming to be Solid Snake, who recognizes him, but can't pinpoint from where. Pliskin then shouts that the man is not the real Solid Snake, causing him to reveal to Raiden that Pliskin is truly his brother, Solid Snake. Snake opens fire, causing the man, who is now revealed as Solidus Snake, to jump off of the big shell where he lands on a Harrier jump jet piloted by Vamp. Solidus shouts that the world needs only one big boss before the Harrier opens fire. Snake then throws Raiden a Stinger missile launcher, instructing him to take down the Harrier to protect their chopper. Raiden does so, damaging Solidus' aircraft enough to bring it down, injuring his eye in the process. Before the Harrier can hit the water, however, Metal Gear Ray emerges from the depths and catches it in its mouth, firing explosives into the air which further damage the Big Shell and Snake's chopper, forcing it to land at the nearby helipad. Solidus then exclaims that they got his eye, before Vamp jumps from the Harrier and runs along the water just before Ray submerges with Solidus and his aircraft. After the excitement dies down, Snake finally admits his true identity to Raiden and fills him in on his history, the events of the tanker incident, as well as his faked death. After this call, Campbell instructs Raiden not to trust Snake, as he wasn't part of the simulation. Raiden continues to the President's location, coming across Olga and eavesdropping on her once again, learning that the woman blames Solid Snake for her father's death and is hoping to get her revenge now that he is on site. She then has the floor outside the room the President is in electrified, forcing Raiden to use a remote-controlled missile to disable the electric trap. Once the path is safe, Raiden enters the room to find President James Johnson. Initially, Johnson believes Raiden to be a female assassin sent by the Patriots as punishment for his betrayal. But after discovering that not to be the case, the President speaks with him over nanomachines. Johnson reveals that he agreed to work with the terrorists to achieve true power instead of being simply a figurehead for the Patriots. Raiden is unfamiliar with the Patriots, and Johnson fills him in on the group, including their absolute control over the country. Johnson intended to use the new Metal Gear as his bargaining chip to force the Patriots to allow him to join their ranks, but he underestimated Solidus, who actually wants to challenge them head-on, by hijacking their new Metal Gear, Arsenal Gear, which is currently beneath the Big Shell. Johnson then reveals that since he input the launch codes, the Patriots AI system GW will begin to establish connections with other systems too, which will bring about the activation of Arsenal Gear. He tasks Raiden with finding Emma Emmerich, who is the only one who will know how to stop it. Johnson gives Raiden her location, a security card to reach it, and a disk containing a virus, created by Emma as a failsafe modeled after Fox Die, that she must upload into the system to disrupt its control functions. With all of his information passed on, Johnson then grabs Raiden's pistol and holds it to his own head, telling him to kill him so Solidus can't use his vital signs to activate Arsenal Gear's nuclear strike. Raiden refuses, but while they wrestle over the gun, a shot rings out. Raiden turns to spot Revolver Ocelot, who had fired on the President before nonchalantly walking off. Johnson then sends his last order as Commander-in-Chief for Raiden to find Emma before he dies. After a quick discussion with Snake and Otacon regarding their confusion as to why Ocelot is helping Solidus, while seemingly working for the Patriots due to the tanker incident two years prior, Raiden makes his way through the flooded area to find Emma. On his way, however, he is once again met by the seemingly immortal Vamp, dancing atop pools of water, who reveals that while the President's death prevents his group from launching their nuke, Arsenal Gear still houses a fully functional purified hydrogen bomb, which Solidus is currently unaware of. Arsenal Gear passes its final preparations check, and Vamp tries to stop Raiden from reaching Emma, the two battle, with Vamp eventually sinking below the oxygenated pool of water, leaving nothing but a bloody cloud in his wake. Raiden reaches Emma and rescues her, but the woman refuses to swim to safety with him, still having a fear of water from nearly drowning in the swimming pool as a child. 
Raiden is able to convince her to hold on to him while he swims, and they make their way. After swimming for a while, the pair manage to avoid drowning. Good job. And Raiden reaches a dry area to take a breather. There, the pair talk about Emma's childhood, as well as her involvement in GW. She states that GW is only part of the data censorship system, with the other part being spread massively by the Patriots alongside a bug fix for the Y2K problem, which prevented computers from failing at the turn of the new millennium due to date errors. She then reveals that GW program wasn't actually completed and still lacks necessary factors for judging situations, which the Patriots were planning to remedy with a major experiment in the next few days that would provide the AI with a complex data set to study. The pair continue towards the computer room so Emma can upload the virus. In order to reach it, they're forced to cross a narrow oil fence. Emma makes her way across while Raiden and Snake provide cover fire with sniper rifles. Just as Emma is about to reach the other side, however, Vamp emerges from the waters once again and grabs her, holding her at knife point. Raiden fires directly at Vamp's forehead, seemingly killing him once more. As he falls, however, his knife slashes at Emma, wounding her greatly. Snake rushes over and carries Emma to the computer room, while Raiden rushes to meet them with the disc. When he arrives, he finds Otacon grieving over his unconscious injured sister, who had prepared the system for the virus's upload. Raiden inserts the disc, but the upload process disconnects after it reaches 90%. Emma awakens, and she finally makes amends with her brother before dying from her blood loss. Otacon then takes Emma's pet parrot as they overhear an announcement about Arsenal Gear's launch. Otacon is tasked with getting as many hostages as he can to their helicopter, while Snake and Raiden decide to infiltrate Arsenal Gear before it launches, so they can make sure it's stopped by the virus, or themselves if need be. The trio leave Emma's body behind, and Snake and Otacon share a handshake and a hug before parting ways. At the door to Arsenal Gear, Snake calls upon Mr. X, and the Cyborg Ninja reveals themselves before holding their high-frequency blade up to Raiden's throat. Raiden then asks Snake if he's changing sides, to which he responds that he doesn't recall saying he was on his. Mr. X then reveals themselves to have been Olga Gerlukovich in disguise all along, before she hits Raiden with the blade's electronics, knocking him unconscious. Outside, Otacon flies away in the helicopter while watching the big shell facility sink into the depths. Raiden later awakens and finds himself naked, trapped to a torture device by Solidus and Ocelot. Solidus, now donning a very familiar eye patch, as well as an exoskeletal suit with two tentacle-like mechanical snake arms, reveals that he recognizes Jack the Ripper from their past together. Raiden's years with the Patriots erased his memories, leaving Solidus to remind him in between torturing him with his snake arms. Solidus then leaves to prepare arsenal gear, leaving Ocelot behind with Raiden, who taunts the man, holding up the virus disc before leaving himself just as Olga arrives. Olga secretly communicates with Raiden, informing him that she was sent by the Patriots to help him, with her position as leader of the Russian mercenaries simply a smokescreen. Olga tells Raiden about the Patriots holding her daughter hostage, as well as her own learning that Snake wasn't responsible for her father's death after meeting him on Big Shell. Olga tells Raiden that she'll free him so he can meet with Snake and retrieve his gear, then leaves the room. Now alone, Rosemary calls him, and Raiden admits that what Solidus said was true, sorrowfully revealing the evils of his past, stating that while he knows she wants to get married and have a family, he just can't do that. Olga then releases Raiden's restraints, allowing him to exit. As he sneaks his way through Arsenal Gear's security, Raiden receives calls from the Colonel, who begins to speak a bit erratically. Raiden then realizes that he's never actually met the Colonel face to face, which he responds to by warning Raiden that they have Rosemary, before hanging up. As Raiden continues, the Colonel begins to become more unhinged, speaking nonsense due to Emma's virus finally taking hold. I need scissors. 61. Rosemary also calls Jack, making her own admission about the Patriots hiring her to watch him, but promising that her current feelings for him are true. She then tells Raiden that she's carrying his child, before the transmission cuts off. Raiden finally regroups with Snake, now out of his Pliskin disguise and in his classic sneaking suit, who returns Raiden's gear. After Raiden gets dressed, he and Snake discuss strategy, with Snake apologizing for using him as bait to gain access to Arsenal gear. Snake reveals that according to Olga, 
there is a troop of 25 mass-produced, unmanned Metal Gear rays on board for protection, which he knows they'll have to soon battle using Stinger missiles. He then gives Raiden a gift from Olga, her high-frequency blade. The pair continue on, and Otacon determines that the Colonel Raiden has been speaking with was actually GW, stimulating Raiden's nanomachines to create what he expected Colonel Campbell to be like. While Raiden begins to question his own reality, Snake pushes him on, and the pair are soon ambushed by a large group of heavily armored Arsenal Tengu, soldiers which they fight off as more effects of the virus are seen. After the battle, Fortune arrives and confronts Snake, blaming him for killing her father during the tanker incident. While Snake states that he didn't kill her father, he still stays behind to distract her, allowing Raiden to continue on. Raiden climbs a nearby ladder and reaches a large platform, where he hears the voice of an unseen Solidus. Solidus tells Raiden that Ocelot discovered something within GW's data, the details of the S3 plan, revealing to him that he's merely been a puppet for the Patriots' Solid Snake simulation this entire time. Solidus finally reveals himself, stating that there's no longer any reason to keep Raiden alive. The fleet of Metal Gear Rays then arrive and attack, forcing Raiden to battle them on his own using Snake's stockpile of Stinger missiles. After taking down a number of them, Raiden falls to his knees exhausted. Just as one of the rays prepares to stomp on him with its leg, Olga dives in, like another cyborg ninja did before her, and the Metal Gear backs off. Raiden warns Olga about blowing her cover, but she knows that she must do whatever she can to keep him alive, as if the Patriots detect his death, it'll mean the death of her child as well. Solidus then appears on the platform again and grabs Olga's throat with one of his snake arms pulling out his P90 machine gun. Olga then turns to Raiden and pleads with him to live, before Solidus fires a round into her skull, instantly killing her before tossing her body aside. Solidus then activates the remaining Metal Gear rays, but they begin to malfunction. Ocelot then reports that the GW AI is going out of control due to the effects of Emma's virus, and Arsenal Gear is on an emergency ascent course. Solidus is then forced to take down the remaining Metal Gears himself. Afterwards, he takes Raiden captive as Fortune arrives with a handcuffed snake. Solidus then chokes Raiden until he falls unconscious. Later, Solidus wakes Raiden up to inform him that GW is now corrupted beyond repair. Atop the giant arsenal gear, Solidus then begins to torture him again, hoping to get answers, but not from Raiden. Fortune then walks away, and Solidus confronts her about her plan to hijack arsenal gear, which she's shocked to learn he's aware of. Solidus then reveals that he suggested that Ocelot convince her to do so, as he doesn't even care about controlling the weapon. Solidus then reveals his true objectives all along, to retrieve the most important information the Patriots wanted to use GW to censor. More specifically, Solidus wanted to retrieve the list of who he believed to be the highest 12 members of the Patriots from GW, the Wise Men's Committee. With GW destroyed, Solidus simply states that he has another idea on how to retrieve this information. Fortune walks off, planning to seize control of Arsenal Gear to launch its hydrogen bomb to enact the EMP to evoke chaos among the masses, but Ocelot interrupts her and begins to laugh at the charade. Solidus asks what he means, and the man reveals that Raiden's VR missions weren't the meat of the S3 plan as Solidus thought. Ocelot finally reveals that the entire Big Shell incident has been organized by the Patriots to replicate the events of Shadow Moses in order to turn Raiden into a soldier on par with Solid Snake. Emma's virus, as it turns out, was designed to erase all information about the Patriots from GW. Ocelot then states that with all of the data from the events, the Patriots will now be able to create the perfect simulation to turn any soldier into Solid Snake. Ocelot finally turns to Fortune and tells her that her husband and father's deaths were both just part of the Patriots' plan. In anger, she lifts her railgun and prepares to fire, but Ocelot draws his revolver and shoots her first, surprisingly hitting the woman in the chest. Ocelot tells Fortune that her luck never existed, and was instead being protected by electromagnetic weapons technology developed by the Patriots. Fortune lifts her railgun again and tries to fire, but each blast misses, as Ocelot is protected by the same technology that once protected her. Solidus tries to fire himself, but reaches a similar outcome, leaving Ocelot able to jump into the prototype Metal Gear Ray firing its machine guns at Solidus, who deflects the bullets with his own pair of high-frequency blades. 
As Ocelot switches the ray to use its missiles, Fortune stands up and outstretches her arms. Inexplicably, all of the missiles change course as they reach Fortune, protecting everyone atop Arsenal gear. With her last bit of luck used, Fortune dies from her gunshot wound. Ocelot then opens Ray's mouth for a final blast from its cannon, but suddenly his arm begins to convulse again. To Ocelot's dismay, the spirit of Liquid Snake then awakens again. Liquid then informs his brothers that it was he who leaked the information about Arsenal gear that got Snake involved in the mission, so that his proximity would fully awake him like it did during the tanker incident. Now awakened and with all of the information Ocelot acquired as a Patriot spy, Liquid claims that he can now destroy the Patriots for good. He then hops back into the cockpit of the Metal Gear and dives into the surrounding waters, leaving Arsenal Gear on a crash course for Manhattan. Solid Snake is able to break free of his handcuffs and dive in after Liquid, leaving Solidus and Raiden alone. Arsenal Gear crashes through Manhattan, finally stopping before Federal Hall, where Solidus and Raiden land on the roof. Solidus gives his former son one final lamentation, this time about the fact that since he is unable to reproduce, he has always strived to leave his own legacy. The Patriots threatened this with their plan to censor information, leading to his true desire to liberate the world from the group. Raiden then gets another call from the Colonel AI, much to the surprise of Raiden who believed that GW's destruction would have destroyed it. The Colonel, as well as another AI of Rosemary, explained that while the GW AI was destroyed, the rest of the Patriots AI system is still operational, and will continue their plan of not censoring information, but rather choosing what information gets passed on to future generations to ensure society evolves and survives. The AI then reveals that the true purpose of the Shadow Moses replication was to test S3's crisis management capacity to ensure it was ready to make the decisions necessary for any future contingencies. As his final mission, Raiden is forced to fight Solidus to the death, as if he loses, both Rosemary and Olga's child will die. Before their final battle, Solidus reveals to Raiden that it was he who killed his parents all those years ago. Solidus then tosses Raiden Olga's blade, telling him that he hopes to cut out his nanomachines in order to extract any leftover information about the Patriots. The pair then battle in a close quarters sword duel, with Raiden eventually defeating his former father. Solidus then falls from the roof of Federal Hall, grasping the statue of George Washington with his final breaths before falling comatose. Raiden climbs down himself and looks towards Federal Hall, reflecting on who he really is. Snake then arrives and answers him, telling him that objective reality doesn't matter, but rather whatever it is he decides to believe in and finds important enough to pass on to future generations. Snake then promises to find Olga's child so long as he stays alive and keeps them safe. Snake then reveals that he gave Raiden a fake disc after Emma uploaded the virus, and the real copy has been in his possession since. He and Otacon intend to reverse engineer it to determine the list of names on the Wise Men's Committee that Solidus intended to find. Raiden tries to follow Snake, but he tells Raiden to stay behind, as he has things to do and people to talk to. During this conversation, a figure resembling Vamp watches on from a distance. Raiden then spots Rosemary and rushes over to her, turning around to see Snake now gone, before catching a glimpse of Emma's parrot released into freedom by Otacon. Raiden then speaks with Rosemary, and the pair promise to find out who they really are together, and pass that along to their future child. Sometime later, Otacon is able to extract the data from Emma's virus, learning the identities of the 12 most powerful members of the Patriots. Otacon and Snake are shocked to learn, however, that all 12 of them died about 100 years ago, leaving their trail cold once more. In the wake of Arsenal Gear's crash into Manhattan, the Patriots AI system begins to revolutionize the way war is not only fought, but the reason for it altogether. After developing a system with arms tech called Sons of the Patriots, or SOP, the Patriots AI, namely the Central Corps named JD, are able to control all aspects of the battlefield, including the weapons market, by directly manipulating soldiers through their implanted nanomachines, which has become standard practice. As a failsafe, they make the keys to the system Big Boss's genetic code and biometric data. This new system brings about the war economy, which forces the countries of the world to essentially treat warfare as a commodity, required for their economic stability. 
This also produces the need for more and more private military companies, or PMCs, to fill the battlefield with soldiers. Ocelot then removes Liquid's arm, having it replaced with a cybernetic one in an attempt to undo some of the damage he did to his mind. This effort proves futile as Liquid's personality completely takes over, leading him to take the name Liquid Ocelot moving forward. Liquid Ocelot then spends the next few years planning his takedown of the Patriots, first by buying up the five largest PMCs and controlling them under a parent company he appropriately calls Outer Heaven. When the Patriots finish their second iteration of the submersible battle station they first attempted with Arsenal gear, Liquid Ocelot somehow steals it and renames it Outer Haven. Using its experimental Octo Camo surface replication technology, Liquid Ocelot is able to hide Outer Haven at the abandoned Shadow Moses Island, and he retrieves what was left of the Patriots GW artificial intelligence, repairing it and installing it in a server room inside the ship. At some point, Raiden, unable to live with both the memories of his cursed childhood, leaves Rose. He is then contacted by Big Mama, who had learned that he was able to learn the location of Big Boss's body from the GW AI. In exchange for the location, Big Mama, along with her anti-Patriots group, the Paradise Lost Army, help Raiden rescue Olga's daughter from the Patriots, who are holding her at Area 51. Raiden then leaves the girl Sunny with Snake, and returns to his life of solitude. Raiden also learns that Rose not only had a miscarriage, but married the real Colonel Roy Campbell, sending him into a downward spiral. He returns to the Paradise Lost Army and decides to help them recover Big Boss's remains from the Patriots, but is captured during his attempt. While in their captivity, the Patriots use him as an experiment for their cybernetic exoskeleton technology, grafting his head and spine onto a synthetic body, leaving him more machine than man. The Paradise Lost Army are able to rescue Raiden from captivity, but he's left under control of the Patriots due to the nanomachines in his body. They find Dr. Drago Petrovich Madnar, the man who designed the TX-55 Metal Gear as well as the Metal Gear D for Big Boss at Outer Heaven and Zanzibar Land, and he is able to save Raiden's life by removing the nanomachines. After recovering, Raiden succeeds in retrieving Big Boss's remains for Big Mama before beginning a life of self-imposed exile in the shadows due to his new appearance. Big Mama and the Paradise Lost Army also recover Solidus Snake's still surviving but brain-dead body, as well as what remains of Liquid Snake's corpse. Using most of Solidus's body along with pieces of Liquid, Big Boss is completely repaired of the injuries he sustained at the hands of Solid Snake in Zanzibar Land. However, due to the Patriot's control through nanomachines, he is still left comatose. Big Mama then keeps Solidus's head and chest alive as a decoy in case the Patriots attempt to recover Big Boss's stolen remains. During this time, Solid Snake's advanced aging engineered into his DNA during the Les Enfants Terribles project ramps up, and his body rapidly shifts into that of an old man. He and Otacon then obtain a large transport aircraft called the Nomad, which they use as their home and mobile command center, raising Sonny on board, who Hal takes under his wing as a programmer. One day, in 2014, Solid Snake visits the grave of his father, Big Boss, where he is interrupted by an arriving helicopter, which Otacon emerges from. Otacon brings Snake back to the helicopter, informing him of the results of tests they took to try to figure out the biological cause of his aging, giving him an estimate of a year left of life at its current rate, or less, considering the fox die still in his system. In the helicopter, Snake is met by his old friend Roy Campbell, who reveals that he's finally uncovered the location of Liquid Ocelot, the Middle East. The three then head to the Nomad and discuss the current state of PMCs. Sunny prepares eggs for them and tries to serve them, but none of the three take her offer. Meanwhile, Otacon puts the finishing touches on his miniature Metal Gear Mark II robot to aid Snake on the battlefield. Campbell warns Snake that if Liquid and his Outer Heaven PMC conglomerate aren't stopped from executing his planned insurrection, he'll become the greatest threat the world has ever faced. Campbell then asks Snake to meet with his group of informants from the US Special Forces, Rat Patrol Team 01, to find and assassinate Liquid Ocelot. Snake agrees and deploys to the Middle East three days later. 
Traveling through the war zone to meet with his contacts, Snake avoids large, unmanned bipedal fighting machines called Gecko, using his Octocamo equipped sneaking suit to stay out of sight. Soon, Otacon sends in his Metal Gear Mark II to provide Snake with another useful tool of his, the Solid Eye, an eye patch like goggle to augment his vision with radar, night vision, and other battle data. Continuing on, Snake soon meets a member of the underground gun laundering group called Drebin, denoted as Drebin 893, as well as his pet monkey, Little Grey. This Drebin and his group replace the ID chips in weapons to allow anyone to use them, regardless of their nanomachines. In order for Snake to use these weapons, however, Drebin must inject him with new nanomachines to suppress his old ones. While Snake is initially skeptical, given his last experience with somebody injecting him with unknown nanomachines, he agrees and takes the injection and is able to use Drebin's weapons. Snake eventually finds Rat Patrol Team 01 and is shocked to find them led by Meryl Silverberg. Likewise, Meryl doesn't recognize Snake at first and is taken aback by his accelerated aging. Snake meets the other team members, including the ill-fated, same guard that Meryl knocked out at Shadow Moses, Johnny Sasaki, now going by the nickname Akiba. Meryl gives Snake the information she's uncovered on Liquid, including images of him now traveling with Naomi Hunter at his side. Snake and Meryl then catch up, and after learning about Snake's cooperation with Roy Campbell, she angrily tells him about her falling out with the former colonel after learning about him being her real father, as well as his marriage to the much younger Rosemary. Suddenly, Liquid's private troops, the Haven Troopers, known colloquially as the Frogs, catch the reflection off of Akiba's scope lens and storm their location. Snake and Rat Patrol then fight off the advanced Frogs through a grueling battle before going their separate ways. Snake continues towards Liquid's location, but on the way, he witnesses a shocking sight. Liquid Ocelot's Beauty and the Beast unit, a group of four women with past traumatic experiences that through the use of nanomachines and special suits have been turned into emotionally driven killing machines on the hunt for Solid Snake. After watching the unit take out an entire militia, Snake waits for them to leave the area before proceeding. Snake soon finds Liquid Ocelot at a PMC camp as Rat Patrol arrives from the other end. Liquid makes a command to, quote, activate it before all of the soldiers in the area begin to collapse, overcome by physical and emotional issues, save for Akiba, who is left completely normal. Snake fights through the influence and confronts his brother, but finds himself unable to find the strength to shoot at Liquid during the latter's ensuing braggadocious speech. Liquid then walks off, and Naomi appears before Snake, injecting herself with something before telling him to go fulfill his destiny before walking off as well. Liquid and Naomi then leave together on a helicopter as all of the gecko in the area follow. Snake then loses consciousness as Akiba carries him to safety. Snake later awakens aboard the Nomad, where Otakon informs him that they've received a video message from Naomi. In it, she tells them that Liquid has her captive in South America, where she's being forced to research the SOP system to find a way for him to seize it and directly control every soldier through their nanomachines. She then ends the message by asking Snake to rescue her, providing her location along with the video. On his way to Liquid's facility, Snake speaks with Campbell via codec about the SOP system, which they conclude must be the Patriots' doing, despite still not knowing who they actually are. They then determine that Liquid's insurrection must be against the Patriots, but with him under control, things will be no better. The pair then surmise that the best possible outcome would be taking down both the SOP system and Liquid Ocelot. Snake finds Liquid's safe house, but finds it under attack by guerrilla rebels. One of the Beauty and the Beast unit, Laughing Octopus, uses her Octo Camo suit and attacks the rebels before Snake spots someone working alongside her who he long thought was dead. Vamp. Laughing Octopus then disguises her face as that of Snake's before slaughtering the group of rebels in the area before Vamp stops her in order to leave one alive to remember the face of the man who killed his comrades. After Vamp and Laughing Octopus leave together, Snake follows a tip obtained from satellite images studied by Mei Ling to search for the facility Naomi is being held in. During his search, 
Campbell calls Snake and introduces him to his new wife, Rosemary, who also provides combat support via codec. Snake then finds Drebin once again, who tracked Snake through the nanomachines he injected at him in the Middle East. Drebin fills Snake in on the backstory of the Beauty and the Beast unit, warning him of their obsession with killing him. Snake suspects that by being able to hack into the SOP, Drebin must be a part of the Patriots, but he clears Snake's suspicion by being able to speak the word Patriots without it being censored into Lalilu Lelo. Drebin then explains to Snake how the Patriots, while starting as a group of humans, have since evolved into a governing group of AIs. Snake continues his search for Naomi, getting a call on the way which he's surprised to learn is from Raiden, who tells him about his mission to return Big Boss's body to Big Mama. Snake then finds Naomi's lab, where he finally finds her, injecting herself once again. The pair then discuss Naomi's situation, and she explains the depth of the SOP's mental suppression, revealing that in the Middle East, Liquid simply stopped the SOP momentarily, setting all of the soldiers' suppressed emotions free and overwhelming them. Before leaving, Naomi elects to give Snake a full-body examination. After he undresses, Naomi is also overwhelmed after seeing the results of his pre-programmed advanced aging. She then finally informs him of his shortened lifespan and sterility as part of the Les Enfants Terribles project, revealing that this curse was with him his entire life. Naomi then tells him that the fox dye virus in his body, originally designed to kill based on specific genetic code, has begun mutating due to his aging, and in about three months it will begin to kill indiscriminately, turning his own body into a walking biological weapon. She states that the only way to prevent the virus from spreading would be to kill the host. Finally, Naomi shows him a new strain of fox dye she found in his blood that must have been injected into him recently, and he immediately suspects Drebin. Naomi then gives Snake a drug to inhibit the nanomachines, instructing him to use it sparingly. Naomi tells Snake about Liquid's plan to seize control of SOP as part of a plan he calls Guns of the Patriots, and agrees to give Snake his location after he frees her. Before he can, however, Naomi begins to feel a pain in her head, and quickly rushes to her computer to grab something before a squad of PMCs grab her. A team of frogs then burst in, and Snake is forced to fight them, as well as Laughing Octopus. After a lengthy game of cat and mouse, Snake is able to defeat the beast before meeting the beauty, incapacitating her before taking her Octo Camo mask. Snake exits and finds Naomi's trail, following it to a helicopter where he finds Vamp loading the doctor in. Snake fires a bullet at Vamp, hitting him in the forehead, which again doesn't kill the man, simply knocking him down. Liquid's PMC operatives open fire on Snake, but during the battle the SOP system is halted once again, causing them to collapse. Snake injects himself with the drug Naomi gave him earlier, but he's still unable to save her. Suddenly, Drebin arrives in his armored vehicle, which Naomi is able to jump into from the helicopter. Snake jumps in as well and the trio escape from Liquid's forces. As they try to reach Otacon for transport, however, the vehicle crashes leaving them on a gecko-infested road. Snake looks up to a nearby roof and spots a familiar yet inhuman face, that of the cybernetically transformed Raiden. Snake and Naomi then run off as Raiden single-handedly takes out several gecko using his high-frequency blade and enhanced abilities. Snake and Naomi are able to reach Otacon's chopper, but as they ascend they spot Raiden being restrained by a group of gecko before Vamp arrives. Vamp then stabs Raiden, who bleeds artificial blood, before Snake is able to shoot his restraints and free him. Raiden and Vamp then have a quick battle, but the pair seem to be evenly matched. As more Gecko arrive, Raiden jumps to the helicopter to join the others as they escape, passing out from his injuries shortly after. Below, Vamp calls Liquid Ocelot and informs him of the developments, to which the man states that it's all part of the plan. Evidently, Liquid had used the blood collected by Naomi from Snake in an attempt to use his DNA to unlock the SOP system, but learned that the key to the system is the original genetic code of Big Boss. He then works to find the hiding place of the Paradise Lost Army in order to track down his remains. In the helicopter, Naomi nurses Raiden's wounds and reveals a secret about Vamp. As it turns out, he was never immortal, but rather she designed the nanomachines in his body that cause him to heal at an accelerated rate. Raiden begins to lose consciousness due to the lack of his artificial blood, but he's able to deliver a final message to Snake. Go find Big Mama. Back aboard the Nomad, 
Naomi helps Sunny with her egg cooking, and the girl opens up about her mother while the pair bond. Afterwards, Naomi tracks Liquid down to Eastern Europe, where he is searching for the remains of Big Boss in order to unlock SOP. Snake and Otacon wonder how Liquid could use Big Boss's biometric data to unlock the system while he's dead, and Naomi finally reveals to Snake that Big Boss's body still lives, just barely, in a lab. Raiden then awakens and confirms that the body is in Eastern Europe, along with Dr. Madnar, whose equipment can save his life. The Nomad then sets course to find both. During the flight, Otacon and Naomi speak about his sister, Emma, as well as their common love for science. The pair also share regret for what they've been forced to do with their skills. Naomi then takes a USB drive off of her necklace and prepares to give it to Otacon, but as he tells her about Sunny's advanced skills as a programmer, she changes her mind. Naomi then seduces Otacon, and the pair sleep together in the cabin of the helicopter aboard the Nomad. Snake later arrives in Eastern Europe and begins his search for Big Mama and the Paradise Lost Army, disguising himself using Laughing Octopus's face camo to mask his face to look like his younger self. Snake soon reaches a PMC security checkpoint and refuses to pass through, but he is quickly ushered away by an arriving Merrill, who happened to be there with Rat Patrol Team 01. The two then have a brief discussion about how Merrill plans to stop Liquid's insurrection by force, an idea Snake finds crazy considering Liquid can already somewhat interfere with SOP. The pair are unable to find common ground and regretfully part ways to see who can catch Liquid first. Snake finds a member of the local resistance and tails him to a church. As the man enters, Snake holds him hostage and demands to see Big Mama. Snake then single-handedly takes out all of the resistance guards who approach him and enters the nave, where he finds a very impressed Big Mama, finally meeting her face to face. Big Mama then introduces herself as Snake's mother, revealing to him her role in the Les Enfants Terribles project. Big Mama then proceeds to inform Snake about her past as Eva, the entire history of the Patriots, Big Boss's eternal battle with Zero, which inspired the former's actions at Outer Heaven in Zanzibar Land, as well as her cooperation with Ocelot to kill the founding Patriots, Paramedic, and Sigent. Big Mama further explains the Patriots' AI system, which consists of four AIs, GW, TJ, AL, and TR, governed by one core AI, JD, or John Doe. This system is locked behind Big Boss's DNA and biometrics, as Zero kept his former friend alive, but with his consciousness trapped by nanomachines. Big Mama then takes Snake to a van and shows him Big Boss inside, hiding from him the fact that it's truly Solidus. Snake then gets a call from Otacon, who tells him that after Sonny and Naomi got back from Dr. Madnar's place with the dialysis machine to treat Raiden, Naomi went missing. The pair then fear that she has returned to Liquid to continue the SOP experiments. Just then, a figure in a trench coat and hat strolls into the church, and when one of the guards confronts the figure, it's revealed to be a stack of small, black spherical machines with arms called Dwarf Gecko. Big Mama fights them off, and the group are forced to make a run for it. Big Mama mounts her motorcycle with Snake, who provides cover fire as the pair follow the van with Big Boss inside. After protecting the van from an onslaught of Liquid's forces, it is hit by a missile fired from one of the Beauty and the Beast unit, Raging Raven's, unmanned gliders. This sends the van crashing through a nearby building while knocking Big Mama and Snake off her bike. Snake gets Big Mama to safety inside a nearby tower, before heading up to the top of it alone to take on Raging Raven. Again, Snake defeats the woman's beast form to reveal her beauty, before incapacitating her and taking her grenade launcher. Afterwards, Snake returns to Big Mama, who reveals that the van they left with was actually a decoy. The real body is currently floating down the Volta River, and Snake helps her get there so they can reach safety along with it. After reaching the riverside, Snake is shocked to find Liquid Ocelot there, waiting for them. Big Mama then sees the boat that was carrying the body, now aflame and sinking into the river. 
On Liquid's boat, Snake spots Vamp and Naomi, who Liquid reveals led him to Big Boss's body, giving him the final key to unlock the SOP system. Snake tries to stop Liquid, but is quickly overpowered by him. Liquid then reveals to Snake that he has recovered and rebuilt the Patriot's GW AI, and by using it, he plans to destroy the JD AI with a nuclear strike in order to take control of the Patriot's entire AI system and rebuild the world in his image. Liquid then boards his ship and embarks, but is soon stopped by a fleet of US Army and Marines, led by Merrill and Rat Patrol. Snake and Big Mama board Rat Patrol's ship, which they pull up right next to Liquid's. Now surrounded, Liquid simply points his fingers and reveals that he was able to use the body's DNA, which he believed to be Big Boss's but was truly Solidus, his perfect genetic clone, to take control of the SOP system. First, he disables all of the soldiers in the area's weaponry before again forcing the nanomachine-controlled soldiers to collapse, leaving his frogs to slaughter all of them in the area. Liquid then fires a missile at Rat Patrol's ship, launching them into the waters while Akiba, still unaffected by the nanomachine control, grabs Merrill. With the Rat Patrol ship now aflame, Vamp grabs the body and tosses it aboard from Liquid's ship, where it lands in the flames. Big Mama then watches the body burn, and in order to convince Liquid of its authenticity, dives into the flames in an attempt to save it. Liquid then fires his weapon at the body, causing it to explode in a ball of flames, burning the entire left side of Snake's face as he shields Big Mama. As Liquid's ship escapes, Otacon is able to pilot the Metal Gear Mark II and secretly stow it on board. After the mayhem, Rat Patrol is able to wash up on shore, but Merrill nearly drowns. Akiba removes his balaclava and gives her CPR, saving her life. She then thanks him with a kiss, and the pair hold each other, with Akiba asking her to call him Johnny. Nearby, Big Mama gives Snake a final message to put out the light to erase the shadows before dying in his arms from her wounds. Returning to the Nomad, Snake and Otacon watch a recording made by the Metal Gear Mark II of Liquid planning his next move returning to Shadow Moses Island to retrieve Metal Gear Rex, which can still launch a nuclear warhead outside of the Patriot's control. Vamp noticed the device and destroyed it, causing Otacon to create the Metal Gear Mark III for Snake's further missions. Campbell then calls and reveals that under Liquid's control, the SOP system has completely shut down, creating the first universal ceasefire in the history of mankind. The group then determine that Liquid's next target is the JD AI, which still has control over weapons of mass destruction. In order to disable the JD AI, Liquid would have to physically destroy its host, a satellite in orbit, by launching a nuke using Rex. Snake decides to return to the place he first met his brother, Shadow Moses Island. Raiden, still recovering from his past injuries but feeling like he has nothing else to fight for, offers to help Snake. However, as he tries to stand to state his case, he collapses, asking Snake not to leave him alone, to which the old man replies that this is his fight. They then get a call from Mei Ling, who confirms that Liquid has returned to Shadow Moses Island, which hasn't been touched since the incident nine years prior leaving Rex and its nuclear warheads still there for Liquid's taking. Mei Ling then offers her help from the battleship USS Missouri, which she is now the commanding officer of. Otacon then flies Snake to Shadow Moses Island, and on the way, he dreams of his original visit all those years ago, before awakening just as they arrive outside the facility. Snake sneaks past some gecko to reach the Shadow Moses facility's heliport, Living through his old memories, he retraces his steps through the facility, finding Otacon's old lab so he can disable security. While Otacon hacks the security system through Metal Gear Mark III, he finds a recent surveillance video of Vamp arriving with Naomi. Otacon then unlocks the way, and Snake heads towards Rex's hangar once again. On his way, Snake is forced into another sniper battle in a familiar area this time with Beauty and the Beast unit member Crying Wolf. After yet another battle with the Beauty and the Beast, Snake emerges successful, taking her railgun before continuing on. 
Snake soon reaches the door to Rex's hangar, where he finds the Metal Gear unmoved from the exact spot he fought his brother atop of it nine years prior. However, they do notice one change. Rex's railgun has been removed, as Liquid needed only it to launch the nuke, not the entire Metal Gear unit. As Snake investigates, he's interrupted by Vamp, who reveals that the railgun has been taken out of the facility. Naomi then arrives alongside Vamp, and he refers to her as his new queen. Otacon then remotely uses the Metal Gear Mark III to try to take control of Rex to help Snake as Naomi leaves Vamp to fight him. Snake tries to take down Vamp, but the near-immortal man's nanomachines make him too powerful to take down. Snake has a trick up his sleeve, however, and grabs Vamp in CQC before injecting him with the nanomachine-suppressing drug given to him by Naomi earlier. With Vamp now mortal, Snake prepares to finish him, but he is stopped by a squad of Gecko who burst in. Luckily, a recovered Raiden arrives to fight alongside Snake, and the pair split responsibilities, with Snake fending off the Gecko while Raiden fights Vamp atop Metal Gear Rex. After a grueling battle on both men's ends, they both emerge victorious, with Raiden finally delivering a mortal sword slash to Vamp echoing his final fight with Solidus atop Federal Hall. Otacon activates Rex and kills the remaining Gecko, leaving Snake and Raiden to determine Vamp's fate. Naomi then arrives and Raiden delivers a message to her from Sunny, telling her that she cooked them right. Naomi lets out a tear and hands a vial of strong nanomachine suppressants to Metal Gear Mark III, allowing Otacon to remotely take revenge on the man who killed his sister. Vamp denies him this chance, however, and grabs the syringe himself, injecting it into his own neck and finally allowing his own mortality to catch up to him, dying instantly. Naomi then tells Snake that Liquid is down below, in the warship he stole from the Patriots, Outer Haven. She then atones for all that she's done before injecting herself with the suppressants, revealing that she has terminal cancer, with only nanomachines barely keeping her alive. Naomi then says her goodbyes to Otacon and Sunny before injecting herself again, apologizing before falling dead in the same spot her brother Frank Yeager did years ago. As more Gecko arrive, Snake enters Rex's cockpit while Raiden hangs on, and they use the massive mechanical beast to blast their way through the opposition and exit the Shadow Moses facility. Raiden jumps off as Snake emerges outside, and as the facility self-destructs, he's buried under the rubble. Snake doesn't have time to react to this, however, as he's soon met by a familiar sight, Liquid emerging from the waters, piloting the prototype Metal Gear Ray stolen from the tanker seven years prior. Snake is then forced to pilot Rex in a battle against the newer Metal Gear. While Ray was designed to destroy Rex, Snake is able to emerge victorious, finally destroying Metal Gear Ray for good. As Liquid crawls out from the wreckage, he calls out to Snake who simply states Fox, as Liquid replies, Die, echoing their final interaction before the latter died at Shadow Moses. Liquid then falls limp, but after a few moments he jumps up, revealing his joke before jovially running off. Snake tries to follow, but is unable to catch up due to the injuries sustained during their battle. Outer Haven then emerges from the waters, with its octo-camel hull displaying a Mount Rushmore-like facsimile of Big Boss and his three clones. Liquid then jumps aboard and aims his ship towards Snake, who is sitting on the harbor. Meanwhile, Raiden watches on, his right arm pinned under a giant piece of rubble. With no other choice, he grabs his blade and severs his own arm to free himself. Just as Outer Haven reaches Snake, Raiden rushes and stops it using what's left of his enhanced strength. Snake is able to get to safety thanks to Raiden's sacrifice, and he yells out Rose's name and remembers the day they met as he's crushed under the weight of the ship. Mei Ling then arrives in the USS Missouri and fires upon Outer Haven, annoying Liquid, who submerges his ship and escapes. Snake then looks into the waters, seeing only Raiden's blade remaining. Snake then collapses, and he and Raiden are picked up by an arriving helicopter and taken aboard the USS Missouri. Sometime later, Snake, 
Otacon, Mei Ling, Meryl, and Rat Patrol Team 01 discuss their next moves to stop Liquid from using Rex's railgun to fire a nuke on JD's satellite in orbit. Mei Ling determines that since Liquid controls SOP, the only way they can take out GW and stop the nuke is by infiltrating Outer Haven while Liquid has its exterior open to fire. Mei Ling and Otacon then reveal that before she died, Naomi left them information to help destroy GW, including a worm cluster virus based off Emma's work that she entrusted Sunny with completing called Fox Alive, which must be loaded into GW's physical server that's protected by a hall of microwaves leading up to it. Seeing this as a suicide mission, Snake figures it's the perfect job for him. Snake prepares to infiltrate Outer Haven with Meryl and Johnny's help, spotting Drebin along the way, who provides all of the Missouri's crew with his ID-hacked weapons so they can fight despite Liquid's control of SOP. Meryl then finally hears from Campbell, who tries to make amends with his estranged daughter. Suddenly, Outer Haven's exterior opens, and Snake, carrying Metal Gear Mark III, Meryl, and Johnny prepare to board the vessel while the Missouri provides cover fire. As Liquid's warship retaliates, including the use of unmanned Metal Gear rays, it collides with the Missouri. The trio make a jump onto Outer Haven, but it doesn't go as planned. Johnny misses his landing and falls into the waters, while Merrill makes a hard landing separated from Snake. Forced to continue alone, Snake fights through Liquid's forces on the deck before reaching an elevator he uses to reach the interior of the ship. Snake then finds himself inside a large, circular room where in the middle he finds an unconscious Meryl. Suddenly a squad of frogs advance, and Snake is forced to fight them off to protect Meryl. Afterwards, Meryl awakens but is suddenly pulled up and controlled through her nanomachines like a marionette by the final member of the Beauty and the Beast unit, Screaming Mantis. Controlling both Meryl and Snake, as well as the nanomachines of the slain frogs, Screaming Mantis engages Snake in a battle of wits. Snake uses the nanomachine-suppressing drug to regain control of himself before using it on Meryl as well. During the battle, Snake notices Mantis' abilities come from the puppets of the Sorrow and Psycho Mantis that she holds in her hands, and he takes them from her, allowing him to incapacitate her beauty and beast forms. Afterwards, Screaming Mantis' suit reassembles in air, and Snake is spoken to by the spirit of Psycho Mantis. After demonstrating his skills like he did in their first meeting, an unknown voice booms out, sending Psycho Mantis back to the land of the dead. Snake then looks up and witnesses another spirit, that of the Sorrow, who tells him that the spirit of the warrior will always be with him. Frog reinforcements then arrive, and Snake is forced to head towards GW's server room alone, while Meryl says her goodbyes to him before she stays behind to distract the frogs. As Snake continues on, Meryl is joined by Johnny, who arrives to fight by her side. He then reveals to her that he doesn't have any nanomachines in him, which explains how Liquid's SOP control never affected him. Finally, Johnny reveals to Meryl that he has always harbored feelings for her, and he proposes marriage, to which she agrees to, in her own way, before the two share a kiss and continue fighting. Snake is soon ambushed and outnumbered by more frogs, but he is quickly rescued by an armless Raiden. Wielding his blade in his mouth, Raiden fights off the frogs as Snake continues forward. Snake reaches the microwave hallway and enters. As he crawls through, the powerful waves destroy his suit and his solid eye, as well as overwhelming him physically. As things begin to look dire for Mei Ling, Meryl and Johnny, and Raiden, Snake pushes with all of his might to reach the end of the corridor. While it nearly kills him, Snake is able to reach GW's server room with Metal Gear Mark III, which they find to be adorned like a graveyard. Otacon then controls Metal Gear Mark III and begins to upload the virus, while Snake fights off arriving dwarf Gecko. Luckily, the virus is uploaded just in time, shutting down the nanomachines in all of Liquid's army and disabling the Metal Gear rays attacking the USS Missouri. Suddenly, a video transmission emerges from the virus, embedded by Naomi. In this video recording, she explains that the virus Snake uploaded didn't just destroy GW, 
but the Patriots' entire network, bringing an end to all of their artificial intelligence systems as well as the war economy. She then reveals that the Patriots had planned to control the entire population with nanomachines, not just the battlefield, and she developed Fox Alive with Sonny to prevent this and keep everyone free from the Patriots' control. Naomi then ends her message by apologizing to Otacon for her deception and encouraging Snake to move on and live the restful life he's earned. Snake then passes out, but is found and brought up to the deck. As Otacon goes to find help, Liquid Ocelot comes upon Snake's unconscious body and brings him up to the top of a tall tower. There, he wakes Snake and reveals that destroying the Patriot's system was his true plan all along. With the world free of the Patriots' control, their father's vision of outer heaven has been realized. Liquid then states that while the war is over, the pair still have a score to settle. They then fight hand to hand atop Outer Haven, much like they did during their first meeting. As the fight rages on, Ocelot's own personality begins to awaken inside of him, as Snake literally beats the self-hypnosis out of him. Once the battle is over and Ocelot's true self is reawakened, he tells Snake that he is Liquid's doppelganger before giving his signature salute, repeating Big Boss's words, you're pretty good, before dying. With another remnants of the Patriots gone from the world, Snake is recovered by Otacon in a helicopter. Otacon then reveals that while Sonny's virus destroyed the Patriots' AI system, it left intact various technological infrastructures to keep modern society running. Otacon is then left pondering if they made the right move, as Snake passes out in the helicopter. Sometime later, the Nomad lands at an airfield and is converted into a chapel for the wedding of Meryl and Johnny. Before the ceremony, Campbell meets with Meryl and the pair finally make amends before he walks his daughter down the aisle where she marries Johnny Sasaki. Drebin then pulls up to celebrate with flowers and drinks, which they can now enjoy thanks to nanomachines no longer inhibiting their alcohol consumption. Notably absent from the celebration is Snake, who Campbell quietly thanks. Drebin then speaks with Otacon, revealing that he was sent by the Patriots to assist Snake from the very beginning, as they had planned for him to take down Liquid. He further illustrates this point by showing Otacon that Rat PT-01 was simply an anagram of Patriot, displaying how deep the Patriots' ties went. They didn't realize, however, that this would also lead to their own downfall in the end. Sunny then gives Metal Gear Mark III to a boy she meets to celebrate her first real friendship before deciding to return to her life aboard the Nomad with Otacon. Elsewhere, Raiden recovers in a hospital bed after major cybernetic reconstructive surgery to make him appear more human. As he reawakens, Rosemary enters with their son, John. Rose reveals that her miscarriage and marriage to Campbell had all been a lie to protect them from the Patriots, apologizing to Raiden for her deception. The three then share an embrace, ready to finally start their lives as a real family. Snake returns to Big Boss's grave and prepares to execute his final mission, removing the new fox dye strain from the world before it can infect others. He then pulls out his pistol, ensures it's loaded, and drops to his knees before putting the weapon in his own mouth. Shortly after, a gunshot rings out. As it turns out, however, Snake had pulled the pistol out of his mouth before firing. He's then confronted by the real, living Big Boss, in the flesh, who had been watching from afar. Spotting the boss's machine gun, the Patriot, in Big Boss's hands, Snake holds him at gunpoint. Big Boss simply drops his weapon, engages in CQC before capturing his son in a hug, instructing him to drop his weapon, as it's time for him to put down the gun and finally live. Big Boss fills Snake in on how he survived, as well as the fact that the body Snake saw was truly Solidus. Big Boss then reveals that when the virus was uploaded into GW, he was finally able to learn the location of Zero. He then walks over to show Snake that he had brought the brain-dead man in his wheelchair to the cemetery along with him. 
Big Boss then states that the only way to truly destroy the Patriots for good would be to take everything back to zero by erasing the founders. He then cuts Zero's oxygen supply and holds his former friend in his arms while he suffocates. Big Boss then makes one final revelation to Snake. The fox dye Drebin implanted in him was a new strain from Zero meant to kill the remaining Patriots founders and was the true killer of Eva and Ocelot. He then tells Snake that Big Boss was the final target of Fox Die, and Snake will now kill him for the third time. Big Boss then collapses from the virus now within him, and Snake helps him walk to the boss's grave. On their way, Big Boss delivers a message from Naomi that the new Fox Die strain in his system is preventing the old one from reproducing, meaning he won't be able to infect anyone else, removing his fear of becoming a threat to humanity. Once at the boss's grave, Big Boss uses the rest of his strength to salute her one final time, telling his son to live the rest of his life, not as a snake, but as a man. He then collapses against her grave and regretfully reminisces about how he and Zero were trapped by their interpretations of the boss's will, before telling Snake to appreciate his newly gained freedom. The pair then share a cigar, and Big Boss asks his son, This is good, isn't it? Before he finally dies for good among a patch of the same flowers his mentor died upon. Snake is left to simply look upon the legendary soldier's dead body, the last spark of the Patriots finally snuffed forever. Afterwards, Snake returns to the Nomad and decides to live out the rest of his life with Otacon and Sunny. The girl then finally prepares three eggs, noting that they resemble the sun, which is rising again. Following these events, Raiden attempts to live a normal life, but is unable to find work due to the economic recession following the war economy's downfall. He is forced to return to military work, accepting a job from Maverick Security Consulting, personally offered to him by a man named Boris Vyacheslavovich Popov, a friend of the late Sergei Gerlukovich, as thanks for rescuing Sonny. To help his work, Raiden removes his artificial skin and enhances his cybernetic body. In 2015, Raiden begins working with a man named Kevin Washington as support to help rebuild a country in Africa alongside their Prime Minister, Nemani. Meanwhile, in the wake of Liquid Ocelot's death, the Outer Heaven PMC conglomerate falls apart and the void is filled by the Denver, Colorado-based World Marshall Incorporated, which becomes the new largest PMC. World Marshall is soon brought into scrutiny when their apparent ties to Colorado Senator Stephen Armstrong are discovered and subsequently investigated by a grand jury. Sunny, who has now taken on the surname Emmerich from her adoptive father Otacon, takes a job at Solus Space and Aeronautics in Colorado, despite her young age, thanks to her exceptional skill set as well as her father's connections. In the year 2016, a Brazilian mercenary named Samuel Rodriguez, known as Jetstream Sam, takes out a drug cartel in his home country before learning of Senator Armstrong's involvement with World Marshal. He then decides to assassinate the senator as justice for his supposed corruption. Sam fights through two police officers using his high-frequency blade to reach a sewer system that he takes to World Marshal's headquarters. Inside the building's newly remodeled indoor garden reception area, Armstrong speaks with a member of the Desperado PMC known as Monsoon, and the pair, knowing of Sam's plan, prepare for his arrival. On his way, Sam is attacked by the prototype LQ-84I, a mechanical dog-like weapon equipped with a conversational AI. LQ-84I was sent to kill Sam under the command of Desperado, to which Sam suggests the machine try thinking for itself. LQ-84I considers this, but knows that if it disobeys its orders, it will have its memory wiped. The two then fight, with Sam being able to defeat the dog in battle, boasting to the AI by Kodak afterwards. Sam then reaches the entrance to the World Marshal building and enters it taking out various forms of security as he makes his way through. Soon, Sam is stopped by Monsoon, who, after a short conversation, brings forth an unmanned Metal Gear Ray to take down the intruder. Sam fights off the Metal Gear, destroying it before getting a call from Armstrong, who invites him upstairs to have the face-to-face -face meeting he obviously wants. 
When Sam reaches the reception area, Monsoon calls and taunts him regarding his motives, stating that even if the man took down World Marshal, something else would simply pop up in its place, to which Sam responds that he'll take down the entire system propping them up. After fighting through more security forces, Sam reaches an elevator, where Armstrong calls him once again and claims that Sam is the most qualified applicant they've ever seen, asking him to meet on the roof for their final interview. On the roof, Sam meets the senator, whose surprisingly muscular body becomes even more massive and powerful as he pulls energy from nearby vehicles into his nanomachines. The pair then conduct the final interview, a grueling one-on-one -on -one battle that tests both of their strength and ability. When Sam emerges victorious, Armstrong asks for his help in putting an end to organized violence and war profiteering. While Sam admits that he may have initially misjudged Armstrong, he refuses to, quote, lend a hand, instead electing to take one of the senators, attacking him again and slicing off Armstrong's right forearm with his blade. Armstrong immediately evens the score, using his sharp stump to sever Sam's. Armstrong then reattaches his own arm before extending his hand to Sam, telling him the job is his. Sam simply responds with a laugh and reluctantly works with World Marshal, who later replaces damaged arm with a cybernetic. LQ-84I is reconstructed and taken under the guidance of another member of Desperado, a woman known as Mistral. She puts the machine through various AI training exercises, hoping to teach him to repress his emotions to become a literal killing machine. In 2018, Raiden is traveling in Africa with Prime Minister Namani and his aide inside a limo, and the Prime Minister thanks Raiden for Maverick Security Consulting's help in restoring his country back to its former glory in such a short amount of time. Suddenly, their convoy is halted and Maverick data analyst Courtney Collins notices that something is blocking the lead vehicle. This turns out to be Jetstream Sam himself, who, under orders from Desperado, attacks the lead armored vehicle, slicing up its gunner. As reinforcements rush in, the limo turns around and tries to escape, while Courtney calls Maverick's commander, Boris, to tell him about the attack. The limo is soon cornered, forcing Raiden to emerge from the vehicle. He unsheaths his high-frequency blade and takes out the hostiles while the Prime Minister's cyborg guardians, codenamed Gemini, take out more nearby. Suddenly, the coastal waters begin to rumble, and one of Desperado's unmanned Metal Gear rays bursts from the depths, firing a massive blast that overturns the Prime Minister's limo. Gemini attempt to rescue him but are both slaughtered by another Desperado cyborg elite, their leader known as Sundowner. Sundowner then pulls the Prime Minister from the wreckage and puts him over his shoulder. As he goes to walk off, Sundowner is stopped by Raiden, who asks what he wants with the Prime Minister. Sundowner explains that since SOP's shutdown killed the war economy, warmongers like himself have been unable to profit. He tells Raiden that he plans to use the Prime Minister to disrupt the peace in Africa before running off with him. Raiden tries to follow, but is stopped by the Metal Gear Ray, which he is forced to fight. Raiden takes it down and follows Sundowner, but during the pursuit, the Ray unit continues to block his progress, prompting another grueling battle culminating in Raiden finally finishing it off for good. Raiden catches up to Sundowner and finds him attempting to escape on a train. Raiden follows and boards the train, reaching a car where he finds Sam and Sundowner with the Prime Minister tied up. Sundowner then chastises the Prime Minister for him and others wanting to end warfare, killing the man by impaling him with a large cleaver. Sundowner then escapes via helicopter, leaving Sam behind to take care of Raiden. The pair battle atop the train, which enters a tunnel, but Sam overpowers Raiden, damaging his eye and severing his left arm. Sam nearly kills Raiden, but the train exits the tunnel, allowing Maverick backup to arrive and fire upon him. Sam then also escapes via the chopper, and while Boris tries to shoot it down with an RPG, it's able to evade the explosive and safely exit the area. Raiden is then retrieved from the train, along with his left arm. With the help of Dr. Wilhelm Voigt, known as Doctor, Raiden is given a new custom cyborg body. Around this time, LQ-84I is ordered to accompany a mercenary under Desperado's employ known as Kamzin on a coup d'etat mission in the Republic of Abkhazia. Mistral then takes LQ-84I to Abkhazia, removing its range inhibitor to allow it to roam wherever it chooses. 
She begins to warn LQ-84i that she can remove this freedom whenever she wishes, prompting the machine to cut off one of her mechanical dwarf gecko arms and take the security device giving her this ability away from her. Mistral then informs Desperado that LQ-84i has gone AWOL and issues an immediate order for their forces to destroy it on site. LQ-84i then fights through the Desperado forces, but is eventually stopped by Kamzin, the man he was originally supposed to work with, who is piloting a large mech. LQ-84i fights this mech, destroying it before killing its pilot, Kamzin, with the chainsaw attached to its tail. After the battle, Mistral appears before LQ-84i and reactivates its range inhibitor, revealing that she simply used LQ-84i to betray and kill Kamzin to get him out of her way. She then forces LQ-84i to shake one of her arms, before stating that the fight has nothing to do with freedom. But as a logical being, LQ-84i will never understand her fight. She then leaves, forcing the machine to be by her side once more. Maverick is then hired by the Abkhazian government to stop the terrorist coup, which they learn is partially orchestrated by Desperado, and Raiden is sent in to do so. Reaching the area, he fights through several Desperado cyborgs, using his new and improved body enhancements to make quick work of them. With radio support from Boris, Kevin, and Courtney Collins, Raiden learns that Mistral is with the terrorist leader, Andrei Dolceev, at a nearby refinery, and he makes his way towards it. After making his way through an old city filled with hostiles, Raiden is confronted by LQ-84i. Under direct order to kill Raiden from Desperado lest his memory be wiped, LQ-84i engages in battle. Raiden defeats the machine, and afterwards, it expresses its desire for freedom, something Raiden finds amusement in. Raiden reaches the refinery, where he spots Dolceyev with a woman, Mistral, who notices him and blows a kiss. Raiden then enters the plant and fights through the defenses, eventually reaching its top level. There, he meets Mistral face to face, and she gives him her story which, much like his, was changed by a man who gave her ideals to fight for. Raiden asks her who that man was, but she ignores the question, utilizing her dwarf gecko arms to prompt a battle. The pair fight atop the refinery pipes before taking their combat to the ground, where Raiden slices open a container of liquid nitrogen, instantly freezing Mistral, before he slices her frozen body into pieces, killing her. Afterwards, Raiden tries to get Dolceyev to surrender, but he refuses, stating that he is exactly where he is meant to be. He then pulls out a detonator and triggers an explosion on a power pylon where he stands, destroying the refinery, which was built with Russian money, and in his eyes setting Abkhazia free before the blast kills him. With his mission complete, Maverick sends a helicopter to extract Raiden. Sometime later, LQ-84i is recovered by Raiden, rebuilt, and given a new name, Blade Wolf. Continuing their investigation into Desperado, Maverick takes a job to investigate potential human rights violations and trafficking by them in Guadalajara. Raiden is sent in, wearing a very convincing disguise, and he infiltrates the sewer system with Blade Wolf at his side. Raiden follows the sewers to search for a research lab, fighting various defenses on the way. Soon, Raiden comes across a boy in the sewers and rescues him from Desperado Dwarf Gecko and Raptor Max. Afterwards, the boy introduces himself as George, and claims to have escaped the research lab, where other kids are going to be harvested for their organs. George tells Raiden where the lab is, while the latter arranges for the boy to be picked up. Raiden sneaks into the lab and finds a room filled with cyborg brain casings, likely removed from the children Desperado has been abducting. He then hacks a computer terminal using a reprogrammed dwarf gecko to uncover a security video recorded the day before. In the video, Sundowner speaks with a Desperado scientist about the Sears program, the training regimen that Solidus used on his child soldiers in Liberia, including Raiden. Sundowner then stresses that they need to ship the children's brains to their headquarters quickly as their cover is about to be blown. Senator Armstrong, who was also on site, then chimes in to tell the scientist to ship all of the brains he has ready while destroying the rest. As he and Sundowner then leave, Armstrong mentions that he's busy with something called Tecumse, which he believes will help America's suffering. Raiden sends the video to Kevin and asks him to find the identity of the man in the suit, who they don't immediately recognize as the senator. Raiden then goes to rescue the remaining kids, but is met with some bad news from Courtney. Maverick was unable to find George in the sewers. 
Raiden continues on his search, getting another call from Kevin, who reveals the identity of the man they saw, Senator Stephen Armstrong, who is currently a presidential candidate in the upcoming 2020 election. Armstrong's ties to World Marshal reveal to Maverick who is backing Desperado, and Raiden plans to take the fight directly to their headquarters in Colorado as soon as the kids are safe. After fighting through more defenses, Raiden finds a room with a machine that Doctor describes as an artificial blood cryopreserver, used to preserve harvested organs for several hours. Doctor then surmises that the scientist must be selling the organs they were told to destroy, prompting Raiden to hurry in his search. Soon, he finds the children's holding cell behind protective glass, but as he investigates, the lead scientist he saw on the recording walks in, holding George at gunpoint. The scientist then pumps the children's room full of chloroform gas, threatening to kill George if Raiden breaks the glass to free the children. George then tells Raiden to forget about him and kill the scientist, a request he fulfills by slashing through the both of them. George is later saved with the use of the cryopreserver in the adjacent room, and the children, as well as the cyborg brains, are brought to safety. Knowing Maverick wouldn't agree with attacking World Marshal, Raiden resigns, taking Blade Wolf with him to Denver, Colorado. During a drive towards World Marshal HQ, however, Raiden is attacked by highway patrol officers on their payroll. After a short pursuit, Raiden's car is destroyed by the police, causing him to take them on while Blade Wolf scouts ahead. After the battle, Raiden follows Blade Wolf to a building, where he receives a call from Boris. His former boss tries to talk him out of his current plan, but Raiden refuses to allow the children to suffer the same fate he did. Boris agrees to allow Maverick to secretly help Raiden, as Blade Wolf leads him to the rooftops. After traversing the rooftops, the subway, and the streets, Raiden finally reaches World Marshal Headquarters. As he arrives, however, he is met with a holographic message from Jetstream Sam, who questions his motives and actions, chastising Raiden for killing so many cyborg soldiers on his way. Sam then turns off the emotion-suppressing nanomachines of the cyborg police, who attack Raiden, forcing him to hear their cries of pain and despair as he kills them. Bladewolf arrives and speaks with Raiden about the difference between AIs and mankind, before Bladewolf tells Raiden about his past with Sam. The pair finally reach the headquarters entrance, where Sam appears in the flesh, gloating about how he's made Raiden realize his actions aren't so black and white. Suddenly, Monsoon arrives as well, and expresses his belief that everyone is compelled to fight not by politics or religion, but by memes, which he describes as the DNA of the soul. Raiden regretfully states that he was born to kill, but thanks Monsoon for his speech as it's reawakened his Jack the Ripper persona inside of him, which he unleashes to kill Monsoon's backup. Monsoon sends Sam off to report back to the Chief, while he stays behind to fight Raiden. After their battle, Raiden decapitates Monsoon, ending his memes for good. Raiden finally enters World Marshal HQ, where he hears Sundowner's voice over the intercom, telling him the brains are currently in the server room for VR training. Doctor traces the call to the top floor, and Raiden rushes up, finding the elevators out of service. Bladewolf hacks the system while Raiden protects him. Once functional, Raiden uses the elevator to reach the 20th floor where he'll have to get past a security gate to reach the confidential floors above. After unleashing the Ripper and fighting off strong reinforcements, Raiden scales the side of the building to quickly get closer to the server room at the top. Raiden passes through the indoor garden reception area and fights through more defenses before finally reaching the server room. Before he can enter, however, Raiden is stopped by AI-controlled body doubles of both Mistral and Monsoon, forcing him to fight them once again. Afterwards, he's finally able to enter the server room, where he meets Sundowner face to face. The man explains that the Sears program was extremely successful for Solidus, as it produced Jack the Ripper but in order to streamline the process, they've moved its execution out of the real world and into virtual reality, to better create moldable killing machines. Sundowner and Raiden then discuss the war economy, with the former explaining that the Patriots didn't invent it, they just took advantage of mankind's tendency to fight. Sundowner then states that none of that will matter in three hours, as the demand for PMCs will skyrocket after another event similar to Arsenal Gear's crash or the 9-11 attacks. Raiden follows Sundowner to a helipad, asking him what's going to happen in three hours, but he brushes it off, simply stating that he's already too late to stop it. After Raiden's most exhaustive battle yet, Sundowner is defeated, telling Raiden that Armstrong is about to launch Operation Tecumseh before dying.
Raiden then calls his contacts at Maverick, and they determine whatever Armstrong is planning is likely in Pakistan, where US President Hamilton is about to land. Knowing that an assassination of the president in the Middle East would create another war on terror, Raiden knows he must get to Pakistan and quick. Raiden then has Boris contact Solus Space and Aeronautics for a transport vehicle, as Doctor pilots a helicopter to take him there. During their flight, however, they are attacked by two unmanned drones. Raiden exits the helicopter and takes them out midair, but is unable to return to the helicopter and falls back down to the streets of Denver. Raiden fights his way out of the city, finding an escape route with Boris's help. Raiden then finds a motorcycle and steals it, driving it to Solus. As he gets close, however, Raiden stops the bike when he spots Bladewolf in the road, being pet by Jetstream Sam. Bladewolf tells Raiden that he's unable to determine what Sam's motivation is before the man tells Raiden that history will decide which of their ideals was right. Raiden brushes this off, caring little for what's right or wrong, wanting only to kill the man. The two then duel on the side of the road, and while their skills are closely matched, Sam eventually leaves himself open to attack, and Raiden stabs him in the abdomen. Sam succumbs to his injuries, laughing and giving Bladewolf a wink before dying. Bladewolf then tries to discern why Raiden had to kill Sam, to which he simply tells the AI to figure it out for himself. Raiden then grabs Sam's high-frequency blade, finding it to be ID locked. Raiden cleans the blood off of it before giving it to Bladewolf to carry in memory of Sam. With less than an hour before the president lands in Pakistan, Raiden and Bladewolf continue towards Solus. There, they meet with Sunny, who shows them to their ride, a reusable launch vehicle that she designed. Raiden and Bladewolf board the vehicle and fly off, reaching the Pakistan airbase with less than half an hour until the president is set to arrive. Bladewolf again heads in first to scout, while Raiden follows. Raiden decides to destroy the air control tower to prevent Air Force One's landing, but on his way he comes across an injured Bladewolf lying on the ground. Raiden looks for his partner's attackers, but the ground begins to collapse beneath him. Emerging from the giant hole left in the ground is the massive Metal Gear Excelsis, and its pilot, Senator Stephen Armstrong, steps out from inside. Armstrong tells Raiden that he's too late to stop him, and Kevin soon calls to inform Raiden that the news of the assassination plans leaked, causing the president to turn his plane around. However, just the news of the attempt was enough to throw the public into wanting a retaliation, successfully lighting the spark that will reignite the war economy. Armstrong then states that the Patriots planted the seed years ago, and now all Americans are sons of the Patriots. Knowing that reigniting the war economy will do wonders for American jobs and taxes, Armstrong elects to kill Raiden, to prevent him from complicating his message. Armstrong then returns to Excelsis, and Raiden engages the giant machine in battle. Raiden takes it down piece by piece, eventually destroying it for good. Armstrong emerges from the mechanical beast once again, and, after drawing the remaining power from the Metal Gear, elects to fight Raiden hand to hand. Raiden is shocked as a senator easily manhandles him, prompting a duel between the two. During it, Raiden quips that Armstrong is a typical politician, big promises, but all talk. Armstrong then tells Raiden his true intentions, to rebuild the American system so that every individual controls their own destiny through survival of the fittest, without the modern system of bureaucracy. Raiden takes offense to this notion, as he knows Armstrong was born privileged, and didn't have to fight to survive as he did. The pair continue to fight atop Excelsis, with Armstrong absorbing Raiden's every attack. When Raiden asks how the senator can survive his attacks, the man simply responds, Nanomachines, son! Armstrong then beats Raiden senselessly, pulverizing the Metal Gear in the process. As Armstrong prepares to finish Raiden, Bladewolf arrives with Sam's blade. Bladewolf explains that while his initial main goal had been to pass along the information stored inside him, he learned through working with Raiden that he must create his own future. He then tosses Sam's blade to Raiden, which is now fully unlocked. Armstrong kicks Bladewolf aside, angering Raiden, who uses Sam's blade in combat with him. After another excruciating battle, Raiden emerges successful, killing the senator and finally bringing an end to his master plan. As he dies, however, Armstrong hints that he's leaving a worthy successor in Raiden. Raiden then rips out his heart and crushes it, ending his fight for good.
Afterwards, the new war on terror rages on, and the war economy is re-established, while Maverick at least takes solace in knowing Armstrong couldn't be elected president. Doctor is also able to establish a cyborg staffing firm in order to give the children who had their brains removed a chance at semi-normal lives. Meanwhile, George joins Sonny and Blade Wolf at Solus, and the three prepare to live a new life together. Afterwards, Boris offers Raiden a place at Maverick once again, but he refuses, instead electing to fight his own war moving forward. At some point in the future, Blade Wolf tells Sonny about his history with Desperado, and the pair discuss Raiden, appreciating his character and motivations, with both pledging their loyalty to him. And with that, we reach the end of the Metal Gear Saga, as it was left, likely for good, when series mastermind Hideo Kojima tumultuously parted ways with publisher Konami back in 2015. While we may never see another mainline entry in the series, we have seen several side installments without Kojima's involvement in the past, and as promised in the intro, we'll go over the storylines of those games in release order, starting with the 1990 Western Market exclusive sequel to the Nintendo Entertainment System version of Metal Gear, Snake's Revenge. In 1998, three years after the fall of Outer Heaven in Operation Intrude N313, the U.S. receives intelligence that another hostile force has gotten their hands on Metal Gear. Solid Snake is again sent in to investigate the threat, this time leading a team including two men, John Turner and Nick Meyer, in Operation 747. The three land in the area by helicopter before splitting up, with Turner purposefully getting captured to provide a distraction for Snake to infiltrate the enemy stronghold. Inside, Snake learns that the enemy does in fact have Metal Gear, and even worse, they're being mass-produced and will ship soon. After taking out several defenses, Snake reaches the docks where the weapons will be shipped on a cargo ship, which Snake also learns Turner has been taken to. Snake boards the cargo ship just before it sets sail and begins his search. He finds no sign of Turner and elects to sink the ship in order to prevent its delivery. After planting and detonating explosives below the decks, Snake rushes back topside, where he's rescued by helicopter just before the ship sinks. Snake then receives word that the enemy has not only captured Meyer, but also created a new revision of Metal Gear, appropriately named Metal Gear 2. Snake heads to Meyer's last known position, a railway, and boards a train. Once he's on board, the train begins to move, but he soon gets a call from Turner, who tells him he's captive on the train and leads Snake to his position. When Snake finds the man, however, he discovers that it's not the real Turner, but instead a spy. The spy attacks, but Snake easily kills him before escaping the train. Snake then gets a call from Meyer, who apologizes for his lack of communication before telling Snake that the operation is still a go. Snake then works with the Outer Heaven Resistance member Jennifer, who has also infiltrated the enemy group as a double agent, and the pair plan to regroup with Meyer. When Snake finds Meyer, however, the man is critically wounded, and he informs Snake that Jennifer's cover was blown. He then makes a shocking revelation. The leader of this new hostile group is none other than Big Boss, who survived his first encounter with Snake. Meyer then dies from his wounds, leaving Snake to rush off to find Big Boss. Snake soon finds Big Boss, now transformed into a cyborg due to their last meeting. Wanting to avenge his defeat at Snake's hand three years prior, the cybernetic Big Boss attacks. While his enhancements make him a formidable foe, Snake outsmarts him and emerges the victor, killing his former commander for a second time. After his victory, Snake finds the captive Jennifer and frees her. After she gives him the location of Metal Gear 2, Snake rushes off to find it. Once in its hangar, Snake uses remote-controlled missiles to damage it, making quick work of the new weapon. With another Metal Gear destroyed, the UN declares World Peace Day. In the wake of Operation 747, John Turner is listed as MIA, and Nick Meyer is posthumously promoted three ranks. This brings us to the end of Snake's Revenge. Next up, the 2000 Game Boy Color game Metal Gear Ghost Babble, also known simply in the United States as Metal Gear Solid, which is another alternative sequel to the original Metal Gear. In the year 2002, seven years after Operation Intrude N313, Colonel Roy Campbell visits the retired Solid Snake at his home in Alaska. 
Campbell asks the snake to come out of retirement for one final mission, as the world is on the brink of nuclear destruction. A new Metal Gear, codenamed Gander, has been stolen by the terroristic Gindra Liberation Front, or GLF, who happen to be stationed in the same spot Outer Heaven was once located in South America. Snake agrees to the mission and meets his support team, led by National Security Advisor Steve Gardner, and including analyst Mei Ling, CIA agent Brian McBride, and mercenary contact Renard Lensenbrink, known as Weasel. In addition, Snake is to carry out his mission in concert with the U.S. Army Delta Force, who are already in the area, led by Army Chief of Staff General John Parker. Snake infiltrates the GLF Fortress, Galade, via Halo Jump, and is informed by Campbell that Delta Force has been wiped out during his travels. Shortly after entering the Stronghold, Snake is contacted by the sole Delta Force survivor, Kris Jenner, who explains that her team was ambushed and slaughtered by the mercenary group Black Chamber, led by a man named Blackheart Viper. This prompts a discussion between McBride, Weasel, and Campbell about how details of the mission could have been leaked. Following Jenner's suggestion, Snake makes his way through a sewer system to meet with her at a nearby watchtower. Snake finds Jenner, who had disguised herself as an enemy soldier, and the pair discuss their next steps. Jenner tells Snake about the chief researcher on the Metal Gear project, Jimmy Harks, and Snake elects to search for him while she heads off to investigate the facility's power plant. While Snake looks for Jimmy, he meets Black Chamber member Slasherhawk and the pair battle, with Snake killing the mercenary. Snake continues his search, finding the Metal Gear researcher held captive in the prison barracks. Jimmy then gives Snake Metal Gear's location as well as information on the U.S. Army's Project Babel, led by General Parker, which somehow involves Metal Gear, although he is unsure as to how. Suddenly, the facility's power cuts out, and Jimmy theorizes that they must be drawing all of the power for Metal Gear's railgun, which has the ability to fire a nuclear warhead, which would be ready in about a half an hour. Snake leaves Jimmy behind to be rescued by Jenner as he heads to stop Metal Gear. On the way, he encounters and defeats another member of Black Chamber, Marionette Owl, who before his death tells Snake about Black Chamber's history. As it turns out, they were originally under the U.S. government's employ, but were betrayed during a mission led by someone known only as Anonymous, who Blackheart Viper has sworn vengeance upon. Snake continues on and finds Metal Gear, now above ground and ready to fire. Blackheart Viper then confronts Snake from a helicopter, informing him that he's already too late. Snake is then powerless to watch Metal Gear fire a nuclear warhead from its railgun. Viper flies off, and Snake is left to avoid artillery fire. Snake reaches safety and learns that the warhead Metal Gear fired hid an unpopulated nuclear testing site in Nevada, as a warning from the GLF. Their leader, known only as the General, then sent a message to the President of the United States demanding that the U.S. remove troops from their country and recognize their sovereignty within three hours or else they'll fire Metal Gear at a populated area. Snake decides to take out the power plant to prevent Metal Gear from firing its railgun again. On his way, he contacts Jenner, who reveals that Jimmy had been captured again. Snake then meets another member of Black Chamber, Pyro Bison, who he also defeats, learning more about their group's history with the U.S. government. Bison then reveals there's a spy on Snake's team, feeding Viper information about his mission. After Pyro Bison burns himself alive, Snake's team begins to suspect one another, but he nonetheless continues on. He destroys the power plant, but the General sends out another message, stating that the nuke can be fired without the railgun, putting Snake back at square one. Snake then heads to Metal Gear's location to try and destroy it before it can fire. On his way, Snake is surprised to find Jimmy beside a dead soldier, who Jimmy claims was also from Delta Force. Even more surprisingly, Jimmy states that the soldier claimed to have no knowledge of Kris Jenner, making Snake suspicious of her story. Snake then asks Jimmy if he can stop Metal Gear, but when the engineer tries to respond, an explosive hidden in his handcuffs detonates, killing him. Afterwards, Snake talks to his support team, and McBride casts suspicion on Jenner, believing her to be the spy Pyro Bison spoke of. Snake, knowing destroying Metal Gear is more important at this moment, keeps focus on his mission. After a squad of F-22 aircrafts clear his path, he continues towards Metal Gear, 
but is stopped again by a helicopter, which opens fire on him. Snake takes down the chopper, and its pilot emerges from the wreckage, introducing herself as Sophie and Drom, the general's second in command. She holds Snake at gunpoint, but he overpowers her, turning the tables. Snake doesn't kill Sophie, and they instead find common ground, with her revealing that Jenner is still alive, and Viper has her captive. Snake continues to Metal Gear, but just as he reaches it, he's met face to face by Black Chamber's leader, Black Art Viper. Viper finally gives Black Chamber's full story. Two years prior, they were secretly tasked with recovering Metal Gear, which was stolen in South America. They were able to successfully destroy this Metal Gear, but when they returned home, someone, only referred to as Anonymous, tasked Foxhound with killing them to prevent the knowledge of Metal Gear's existence from leaking. Most of Black Chamber was killed, leaving only five members remaining, three of which Snake killed already on this current mission. Viper then reveals the captive, Kris Jenner, and states she had been busy destroying evidence related to Project Babel. Viper then engages in battle with Snake, who defeats him in turn. As Viper falls, he detonates explosives in the room, forcing Snake and Jenner to make a hasty exit. Outside, Jenner finally comes clean about her true mission. She was sent in separately from the other Delta Force members with strict instructions from U.S. Army General John Parker to destroy any information about Project Babel before assassinating GLF's leader, the General. Snake forgives her for her deception, focusing on the task at hand and instructing her to find a way to escape while he takes down Metal Gear. Snake leaves Jenner behind and finally reaches Metal Gear Gander. There, he finds the General already piloting it, who hints at a connection between GLF Outer Heaven and the United States, promising to tell Snake the whole truth if he defeats him in battle. Snake then battles Metal Gear Gander, taking down the massive mechanical beast in stages. Once it's defeated for good, the General rewards Snake with his prize, the truth. As it turns out, Outer Heaven was actually funded by the United States as a way to keep an eye on anti-American forces. However, Big Boss took matters into his own hands, forcing Snake's mission to destroy it. Project Babel then rose from the ashes of Outer Heaven as a way for the United States to become the sole superpower in Africa by working with the GLF. This project was the brainchild of U.S. Army Chief of Staff John Parker. The General then gives Snake a disc containing all of the information Parker wanted Jenner to destroy before dying from wounds he sustained during their battle. Afterwards, Viper appears before Snake, revealing that he not only survived their encounter, but also that he had been listening to the conversation with the General, which made him realize this true identity of Anonymous. Viper then reveals that Colonel Campbell was in charge of Foxhound during their mission to kill Black Chamber. Campbell then frantically calls Snake, revealing that they've learned the identity of Black Chamber's spy. Before he can reveal it, however, his feed is cut off, and the spy instead reveals himself to be CIA agent Brian McBride. Viper then prepares to launch the nuclear strike, confusing Snake, who had just destroyed Metal Gear. Viper then explains that Metal Gear was only one launch mechanism, as they took control of seven satellites in orbit armed with nuclear capabilities. Snake then battles Viper once again to try to stop him before he can activate the satellites. Ultimately, Snake emerges the victor, successfully shutting down the launch before Viper dies for good. Sophie then arrives, having heard everything that transpired, and elects to lead the GLF to build their own country with real ideals. Snake then spots Kris Jenner, who has arrived with a jeep. Before they leave, Snake gets another call from Campbell. During the call, Weasel reveals that he killed McBride, and Campbell explains that he was lied to about the mission to terminate Black Chamber, and the guilt of leading it has haunted him since. The group then deduce the National Security Advisor Steve Gardner is anonymous, and the true mastermind behind both Outer Heaven and Project Babel. Weasel then reveals that he was also under Gardner's command the entire time, and the man planned the entire mission to go exactly how it did go to regain Metal Gear from John Parker and the Army. Weasel then reveals that his final mission is to kill everyone involved as to cover up the operation, but having grown fond of them, he instead elects to let them go free. Snake and Jenner then escape in the Jeep, with Snake planning to return to America to take on Parker and Gardner for their deception, promising to return to Jenner once he's done. This concludes the story of Ghost Babble, taking us to our next bonus installment, 
Metal Gear Solid Mobile. As the name suggests, this was a mobile-exclusive non-canon side story which takes place between Metal Gear Solid and Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. Shortly after the events on Shadow Moses Island, Revolver Ocelot sells the Metal Gear Rex technology on the black market. After production facilities begin to spring up around the globe, Solid Snake and Otacon begin to work to gain intel on these productions. At some point, Otacon gets a tip from a scientist inside one of these facilities, and Snake infiltrates it to make contact with them and learn more. After sneaking through the facility, Snake gets a call from Otacon's contact, Dr. Victoria Reed, an artificial intelligence specialist on this Metal Gear project. Reed asks Snake to meet her in the security control room, and he heads towards her. On the way, Otacon calls, beginning to get suspicious about Dr. Reed, although he can't quite figure out why he doesn't trust her. As Snake nears her location, he is suddenly locked in a room. Dr. Reed then calls him, revealing that she never existed, but was in fact a VR construct designed to trick operatives like him. Her master then reveals himself as the commander of a terrorist group trying to steal Metal Gear from the facility. While Snake was trying to rescue Dr. Reed, he was inadvertently disabling the security to the entire area, allowing the terrorists to enter unhindered. Snake is able to knock out his guard and escape his confinement before heading out to search for Metal Gear. On his way, however, Snake begins to experience strange phenomena. Calls from an unknown party warning him that what he's seeing isn't what it seems, visual hallucinations akin to a computer game, and even Otacons starting to act strangely, such as reporting about some kind of simulation. As Snake reaches Metal Gear's hangar, the unknown party reveals to him that he's currently in a simulation, as his real self was drugged and placed there. Snake asks who this caller is, and he reveals himself as the real Otacon, calling from outside the simulation to try to help him beat the scenario while he tries to free him. On top of Rex, Snake finds the commander of the terrorist group. Snake battles him one-on-one -on -one as the simulation begins to break away, and he eventually kills his opponent. After the battle, the simulation ends in error, and Snake is awoken in an unknown room. He then overhears two voices discussing the results of the failed test, which are promptly deleted. They then wipe Snake's memory and discuss his usefulness later. When one of the voices discusses finding another test subject, the other states that there's already one lined up, a man named Jack, revealing that Snake's simulation was simply a test run of the S3 plan that Raiden was later sent through. Moving on with our bonus coverage, our next two games are the PlayStation Portable exclusive card games, Metal Gear Acid 1 and 2. These two games relate to each other, but are completely independent to the rest of the series. With that said, let's get right into the first installment, Metal Gear Acid. This story begins in the year 2016, when Passenger Flight 326 is hijacked by a seemingly sentient pair of dolls, sisters Francis and Elsie. The dolls bring a bomb on board and fill the plane with vecuronium bromide to temporarily paralyze all 517 of the passengers, including United States Senator Vigo Hatch, a major political figure and presidential candidate. The hijackers make one demand, something called Pythagoras, to be delivered within 10 hours. The US government discerns that Pythagoras refers to a top-secret research project being conducted in a lab on Lobito Island in the Maloney Republic in Africa. The US sends a SWAT-based hostage rescue team into Lobito to investigate, but they're all wiped out, save for one member, a woman named Teliko Friedman. Roger McCoy, a CIA agent, then convinces legendary mercenary Solid Snake to come out of retirement to take over the investigation into Pythagoras. Intelligence determines that the Lobito Physics and Chemistry Lab is owned by one of the largest conglomerate enterprises in the world, Beagle. Snake is then sent into the lab in search of Pythagoras' head researcher, Dr. William L. Fleming. As Snake reaches Lobito Island, he's shocked to learn that one of the members of his support team is Alice Hazel, a psychic known widely for her supernatural abilities. 
While Snake is skeptical of her usefulness in the mission, she nonetheless acts as his navigator, remotely viewing the situation to see what he cannot. As he reaches the research lab, Snake receives a distress call from the HRT team's emergency frequency, and the man on the other end introduces himself as Engineer Gary Murray. Snake responds, and Gary asks Snake to rescue him in the lab's control room. Hoping Gary can lead Snake to Fleming, he rushes off to find him. Meanwhile, on Flight 326, Senator Hatch speaks with his assistant, Lena Arrow, who decides to work up her strength to investigate the plane. As she walks off, the dolls appear before Hatch, and he notes that whoever's behind them must be a kid he's familiar with. One of the dolls, Francis, then reveals that she murdered the pilot and co-pilot of the plane before writing the numbers 1 and 14 on their uniforms in their blood. As Snake reaches the control office, Roger calls him to inform him that the identity of the group that took over the lab has been discovered to be the Leon Unit, a group of insurgents opposed to the Maloney Republic. It's believed, however, that they were hired as mercenaries by an unknown third party. With Alice's direction, Snake finds Gary, who tells him that while he was running to Fleming's assembly room, or FAR, he saw Dr. Fleming being taken to the residential quarters to the east. Snake then tells Gary to stay put as he goes off to look for Fleming. Back on the plane, Lena finds the bodies of the pilot and co-pilot, and returns to Hatch. The two then fear that somebody named Number 16 is behind the hijacking and currently on the plane with them. Shortly after, a girl sitting behind them awakens and introduces herself as Minette Donnell. One of the dolls, Elsie, then reveals that she has murdered the stewardess, carving a leaven into her forehead. Hatch is able to get to his phone to make a call to the White House, and he speaks with his contact about his fear of Pythagoras going public, learning that a man named Emilio is handling the situation using Solid Snake. Suddenly, Minette is contacted telepathically by Alice, who asks the girl to find the bomb on the plane so they can defuse it. Snake reaches the residential area and finds a secured room that Alice determines is holding a prisoner, potentially Dr. Fleming. Roger calls Snake to provide him with some potential passwords to open the room, but Snake is shocked to learn that he doesn't need one. The security system simply scans him in, identifying him as Hans Davis a name nobody recognizes. Snake enters the room and finds a man with a bag on his head, but as he goes to remove it, the towering leader of the mercenaries, Lieutenant Leon, enters with his soldiers, who hold up Snake. Leon then aims his gun at the prisoner and fires. He then turns his weapon on Snake, but before he can fire, a stun grenade goes off, knocking out Leon's men. Snake uses this distraction to escape, finding the sole survivor of the HRT unit, Teliko, outside, who introduces herself as Swallowtail. She then reveals that the prisoner Leon killed wasn't Fleming, as the real doctor was taken elsewhere, casting suspicion on Gary. Meanwhile, Minette searches in the plane's cargo hold for the bomb, while Alice begins to indicate that she might also know who's responsible. The dolls then reveal that they have control over every plane in the United States airspace, and they've killed another, this time writing the number 5. On Lobito Island, Snake reaches the location the real Fleming was taken to, and he gets a call from Roger, who has done some digging on the name Snake was recognized as. As it turns out, Hans Davis was Fleming's supervisor and the top brass at the laboratory years ago. Working for Beagle, he was sent to Lobito to act as lab chief, and after he arrived, several children in the region were abducted and taken to the island. Gary then calls Snake and reveals his secret, that he had been using them to buy him time to collect data from another project, called Acua, that he can sell to make himself rich. He then states that with the data in his hands, he'll need Fleming to sell it, and since he got his location from Snake, he'll get to him first. Gary then makes one final revelation, that Pythagoras somehow involves a nuclear-equipped walking battle tank, none other than Metal Gear. Snake and Teleco are then left to race to reach Fleming before Gary can. 
On the way, Snake starts to get sporadic headaches and begins to hear a voice inside his head telling Hans Davis to wake up. The pair then reach the room where Fleming is being held, and Snake sneaks through a vent alone to rescue him. When Snake enters the room, he's shocked to find Gary already there, but the man then reveals that Gary Murray never actually existed, as he made the name up. Gary was actually Fleming all along, and he greets Snake as Hans Davis. Snake suddenly has a rush of memories as Hans Davis, in which he worked with Fleming in conducting the Ritual of Conjuration, which was a battle royale in the storehouse with the kidnapped kids, the sole survivor of which would be given the title Neoteny. Number 104 was Fleming's favorite for the competition. Fleming cuts Snake's Kodak communications, then refreshes Hans's memory further, explaining that he was hired by Beagle to be an executive after they were impressed with his reputation. Snake then took on the name Hans Davis and led the lab on Lobito Island to develop Metal Gear Koduk. One day, Hans went missing, and Fleming theorizes that he must have returned to his life as Solid Snake, creating false memories to forget his days as Hans. Snake denies this, but Fleming notes that they were the only two people who knew about the term neoteny, while others referred to the experiment subjects as mind benders or puppet masters. Fleming then reveals that Hans had won their bet, as his pick, number 104, lost, while Hans's pick, number 16, was the survivor and neoteny. Fleming then reveals that number 16 is behind Flight 326's hijacking, and his daughter, Constance, is on the plane. Fleming holds on to the Pythagoras research data until Hans restores his memory, telling him to continue his solid snake facade to buy him time to figure out how to stop number 16. Fleming leaves to return to Far, and Teleco unsuccessfully tries to stop him. He does drop the disc with the research data, however, but it's encrypted. Teleco takes the disc, and while Snake is now under suspicion, she continues to work with him. Snake's communications are restored, and Alice directs them to the storehouse where soldiers are congregating. Roger then gets a call from Charles Schmeiser, a CIA operative under him, who reveals that the numbers being carved into the murdered flight passengers spell out a message, the word Snake. Charles then wonders why Roger recruited Snake for the mission, fearing that whoever recommended him might be involved. Charles then entrusts Roger with exposing Beagle to the world, as this may be their only chance. Roger confronts Snake about how the hijacker would know his name, but he keeps quiet. Teleco, trusting in Snake, vouches for him, keeping his secret from Roger before they're ambushed by Leon. Leon reveals that he's been working towards his own goals. As a former American soldier, original name Jeff Jones, Leon was betrayed by his country. Hoping to gain Pythagoras, Leon plans to use its massive power to take revenge on the United States. Snake and Teleco fight Leon just long enough for an opening to escape to get away from him. On Flight 326, Minette and Alice continue to search for the bomb, while Vigo awakens from being passed out to find Lena missing. Snake and Teleco meanwhile head towards Far to find Fleming and a drawbridge. After they get it in place, however, Teleco draws her gun on Snake. She fires, forcing him to dodge, and she crosses the bridge just before it's raised, blocking his path. She then reveals she's not Teleco, but Swallowtail, revealing that the Teleco Snake is known all this time was simply an imposter. Snake then follows this imposter to stop her from escaping with the disk of research data. On the way, Roger learns that this must be a beagle-hired assassin and master of disguise and hypnotism named Le Clown. Snake continues on and is met by a doppelganger of himself, who he assumes to be Clown disguised as him. This doppelganger introduces himself as Hans, claiming to be a physical manifestation born out of Snake's subconscious. Snake calls Roger to ask if he sees multiple people on the security cameras, to which Roger states that he only sees Snake, and one of him at that. Hans takes his leave to go meet with Fleming at Far, and as Snake tries to follow, his doppelganger disappears. 
Snake then finds Clown in a room arranged like an intricate board game. There, Snake meets the real Teleco for the first time, and the two are forced to fight each other. When Snake wins, this Teleco proves her identity by revealing something only the real version of her would know. Her father, Colin, was murdered by a secret society called the Six Searchers, consisting of Bob, Edward, Arnold, Greg, Leon, and another she never uncovered. With her identity no longer under question, Snake and Teleco continue towards far. On the plane, Alice remotely finds the bomb and instructs Minette to its location, and the pair begin to work to figure out how to disarm it. Meanwhile, Vigo awakens once again, this time finding Lena beside him. He asks her where she disappeared to, and she brushes it off, telling him she tried to explore the plane, but collapsed on the way. Snake and the real Teleco continue on, and find Leon waiting for them. Leon reveals to Snake that his unit had been destroyed by Fleming's drug, Acua, which turned his troops into zombies who now only follow the orders of the Neoteny. Snake determines that the Neoteny must be somewhere nearby, controlling the soldiers. Leon agrees to help Snake and Teleco to get into Far so they can stop Fleming and take down Beagle. Snake and Teleco then head towards the power plant to cut the power to the security system. Snake and Teleco reach the control terminals of the power station and prepare to cut the power as Leon reaches far and gets ready to input a security code at the same time. As they execute the plan, however, Acua troops kill Leon's remaining men, and Fleming arrives, revealing that he changed the security code following number 16's orders in order to keep his daughter, Constance, safe. On the plane, Vigo and Lena speak again, and Lena is revealed to be a member of Beagle, and worked under a man named Emilio to help kidnap the children to be taken to Libido Island. Alice leads Snake and Teleco to a system of sewers to get inside far, and on the way, Snake gets a call from someone who introduces himself as Buddy, who warns Snake that once he reaches the core of far, Hans Davis will awaken inside of him and take over. Another caller then interrupts, number 16, who indicates that Buddy is currently on flight 326. The two then argue and threaten each other before they both hang up. Back on the plane, Vigo finally realizes that Lena is not who she says she is. She had simply been pretending to be paralyzed, operating the twin dolls and providing their voices with a microphone. Meanwhile, Alice and Minette continue to disarm the bomb, with Alice providing instructions. As the pair discuss, Minette deduces that Alice holds deep regret for something and tries to convince her to let it go. Alice then changes her instructions last second, and Minette successfully disarms the bomb. Snake and Teleco finally get inside far and try to call Roger, receiving no answer. They begin to search for Fleming, but Teleco gets a secret call from Alice. Alice reveals that Snake is indeed Hans Davis, or at least it's one of his personalities, and his men have captured Roger. Alice then tasks Teleco with killing Snake before Hans can take over, but suddenly, Teleco hears a gunshot on the other end of the call. Snake and Teleco then find Leon, but the man is under heavy influence of the Acua drug, which clouds his judgment and makes him attack. Snake and Teleco are forced to battle Leon and eventually take him down. As he lays dying, he tells Snake to deliver a message to Roger, that he wasn't the mole revealing that Roger had been the one who betrayed Leon and sparked his hatred for the United States. After this battle, Snake and Teleco are met by another form of opposition, Clown, still disguised as Teleco. Snake is forced to fight Clown while making sure to hit the right woman, eventually emerging victorious. After the battle, Clown tells Snake where Fleming is, as well as how to reach him. Clown then reveals her true face before she dies. Teleco then smells Clown's perfume and recognizes it as the same odor she smelled the night her father was murdered. Teleco then grabs the disc and tells Snake about the call she got from Alice earlier, but she decides to put her trust in him and continue on. The pair soon reach Metal Gear's hangar and climb atop it to reach its hatch. Fleming then calls Snake and his Hans personality seemingly awakens. 
As Snake begins to threaten to launch the nuke and blame Fleming, the Doctor realizes that Snake is being controlled by Number 16's psychic abilities. Fleming then activates Metal Gear, and Teleco drops down into the hatch while Snake is thrown to the ground below. Snake then gets a call from Roger, revealing he was never actually captured. Teleco tells Snake that Fleming isn't inside Metal Gear, and then they hear him shout out, angered that Number 16 hasn't released his daughter back to him yet, but agreeing that he'll kill Snake. Snake and Teleco then work together to destroy Metal Gear from the inside and out. After enough damage, they're able to disable the mech and prevent its nuclear launch. After the battle, Fleming tries to shoot Teleco, but she's quicker on the draw and kills him. Alice then calls and drops a massive revelation. She is none other than number 16. Snake was never Hans, and Alice had only planted that suspicion to try to get him and Teleco to kill each other. All of Snake's memories were simply implanted by Alice, who was secretly injecting him with Accua. As it turns out, the real Hans Davis never showed his face to anyone working on the project. Snake asks why she tried to make him into Hans, and she explains that she's not just number 16. While number 16 survived the ritual of conjuration, when she killed the other last one standing, number 104, 104's spirit entered 16's body and took over. She then tells them that they only have 13 minutes to escape before the facility explodes. On Flight 326, Lena kills Senator Hatch and carves a number into him. When Minette arrives, Lena states that she'll have to kill her too, but not before revealing that Minette also had false memories implanted from Alice, and is actually Constance Fleming. Snake and Teleco escape the lab explosion, and Alice calls again, telling him that she killed the real Hans Davis, Senator Vigo Hatch. She then reveals the number carved into him, 12. Snake then realizes that this doesn't make the secret message spell Snake, but instead Nikol. Alice explains that Nikol is one of Beagle's brands, and she had dosed their product with the Accua drug. It is then discovered that Accua stands for Acting Cells Under Alice, revealing that she now has hundreds of thousands of Nikol customers under her control. Alice then tells Teleco that the man who ordered her father's death was Hans Davis, also known as Emilio, the E in Beagle. In Killing Hatch, Alice claims to have avenged Teleco's father's death, a claim Teleco takes offense to. Alice, giving up her plans to take control of all of the jets due to Constance's kind words, then begins to feel the memories of all of the people she's taking control of at once. This overwhelms her, and she goes into shock, biting off her own tongue and dying. Snake then gives Roger Leone's last message, allowing him to move on. CIA agent Charles Schmeiser then debriefs Snake, and he sends a chopper to come rescue him. On Flight 326, Lena lays dying on the floor, with Minette standing above her, who reveals that she is truly the spirit of number 104. As it turned out, Number 104's spirit was unable to enter the body of Number 16, so it instead entered the body of Dr. Fleming's daughter Constance, who happened to be there. Number 16 then simply believed she was possessed, when truly, she never was. Sometime later, Charles Schmeiser reveals to an unknown party that he, not Vigo Hatch, was Emilio. But after seeing Beagle's incompetence during the last incident, he chooses to pursue something new. Sometime after the events on Lobito Island, Solid Snake is traveling with a woman named Consuela Alvarez in a plane piloted by Dave Copeland and Roddy Louise. Snake, who had lost his memory three years prior, was brought into a resistance force by Consuela right after the Pralia Massacre, in which the natives of the Serena Public were slaughtered. The plane touches down in the United States, and the group are immediately captured by the FBI, led by Agent Dalton, 
who accuses them of murdering the Serena Republic's Secretary of State, Mr. Perez. Dalton interrogates Snake, who claims that they've been framed by a drug lord named Escobar. Dalton then threatens to extradite them over to Escobar unless Snake helps them with a mission, an offer he reluctantly accepts in exchange for $15 million and a new life. Snake is tasked with infiltrating private arms provider St. Logic Incorporated to access their computer network to obtain their files. After Dalton takes Snake to their facility by boat, Snake finds the correct terminal and downloads the files. They turn out to be a list of clients and account ledgers, and when Snake asks what they're for, Dalton simply responds, children, revealing that St. Logic's operations are much darker and more nefarious than they seem. Suddenly, an alarm goes off, but Snake notices that no guards arrive, leading him to believe something somewhere else triggered it. Snake heads for a nearby communications tower so he can transmit the files back to the FBI, but when he reaches it, he gets a call from Dalton and overhears his boat getting raided by an unknown party. On the boat, the Department of Defense's Joint Chief of Staff, Wiseman, informs Dalton, who he refers to as ex-agent, that he's taking over this operation. Wiseman then reveals that St. Logic's Vice President, Thomas Copplethorne has taken over the facility and is demanding the U.S. hand over several VIPs and government officials, threatening to use a nuclear weapon if they don't. This nuclear weapon, as it turns out, is Metal Gear, a name the amnesic snake immediately recognizes. Snake's mission changes to investigate this new incident, and Wiseman promises to reveal Snake's past to him if he cooperates. Snake heads for the research block, receiving help from an unknown hacker observing his communications who refers to himself as Blackboard, or BB. Snake reaches the research block, where he's shocked to find all of the researchers in the area killed by St. Logic's patrol bots. Dalton calls Snake in private and tells him about his investigation into St. Logic after he learned that their president, Rodzinski, was working with government connections to cover up his company's smuggling of children from South America and Africa to act as subjects for their research. Dalton's poking into this business got him fired from the FBI, but he couldn't let the chase go, so he posed as an agent to convince Snake to obtain the information for him to leak online and expose St. Logic. Snake and Dalton then decide to work together, with Dalton keeping an eye on Wiseman, while Snake continues to look into taking down St. Logic. Snake continues on and soon finds a female researcher with a little girl, who she calls Lucy. The pair escape from Snake, and Wiseman calls to inform him that the researcher was Dr. Michiko Takiyama, psychological engineer. Snake is then tasked with tracking her down for questioning, and he does so with BB's help. Snake then reaches Takiyama, who reveals that Copplethorne was carrying out some kind of experiment to the chagrin of St. Logic's president, and Wiseman asks her to help them stop him. Snake tells Takiyama to hide and continues on his mission. After making his way through the facility's security section, again with BB's help, Snake is confronted by a giant, green monster who refers to himself as Harib Serap. After a grueling battle, Snake kills this beast and immediately after, a woman drops from the ceiling. She identifies herself as Venus, a member of Wiseman's team, before opening the path to the research block. Snake follows Venus into the research block, and in their wake, the security chief, Vince, arrives, who shares with his men his fear that the intruders are part of the International Criminal Court, investigating some incident three years prior. Unbeknownst to him, BB eavesdrops on this conversation from afar. Snake and Venus return to Takiyama, but when they arrive, they find her and Lucy missing. Vince then barges in and initiates a battle. Snake and Venus are able to work together to take the hulking security chief down, and afterwards, he reveals that Takiyama is in charge of something called the Ego System, before telling them her last known location. An alarm then sounds, indicating that Metal Gear's activation test has begun, and Vince escapes in the commotion. Snake and Venus then find Takiyama and Lucy being attacked by patrol bots, and they rescue them from the mechanical aggressors. 
Afterwards, Takayama confirms that Metal Gear is ready for launch, and Copplethorne's motives have to do with something called the Lucinda File. Dalton then secretly makes a call to BB and tasks the hacker with finding whatever he can on Wiseman, Metal Gear, and the Ego System. Wiseman then instructs the group to travel aboard a cargo train to the facility's northern block. On their way, Venus mentions to Snake that they're more similar than they think, as they both have no memory. The group are able to board the train, on the roof. Soldiers begin to climb up to stop them, but Snake and Venus take them out. The train then reaches a bridge, but is stopped by the sudden arrival of Metal Gear. The train stops and the group climbs down from it. Copplethorne, piloting the mech, spots Lucy and shouts out to her. He then convinces Takayama to join him in his plan, and she and Lucy rush over to the Metal Gear. Vince then arrives and orders Copplethorne to stand down, but he simply fires Metal Gear at his fleet. He then recognizes Snake, and seemingly wanting revenge on him for something, fires at him, knocking him out before destroying the bridge and leaving Venus to recover Snake as Metal Gear escapes. After Snake wakes up from being knocked out by the blast, Wiseman instructs him to take down Metal Gear. After getting back on his feet, he and Venus head out to find the mech, Copplethorn, and Takayama. The pair soon reach the locked room where St. Logic President Rodzinski is holed up, and they speak with him through a monitor. Rodzinski tells them about another route to the hangar through the sewers, also mentioning the ecosystem and the Lucinda file having to do with Copplethorn's experiments. More shockingly, Rodzinski reveals that Snake killed Copplethorn's wife three years prior, fueling the man's revenge. Snake and Venus then find the entrance to the sewers and make their way through them. After finding that they'll need a sniper rifle to take down some UAV ciphers, they go hunting for one in the labs, where Snake gets another call from BB, who tells him that Copplethorne's wife was a Saint Logic researcher named Lucinda. Snake and Venus then find the non-operational Metal Gear Kaduk that was recovered from Lobito Island and used as research for Copplethorne's new model. After Snake and Venus find their sniper rifles, they're attacked by another one of Copplethorne's elites, a fire-breathing man named Golab, who introduces himself as Snake's brother. After a battle, Golab warns Snake of the fertilization, claiming that if it's successful, he'll merely become a helpless slave to the queen. Snake is confused by this, but doesn't have much time to consider it, as Golab triggers an explosion. As he and Venus escape from the blast, they spot Metal Gear Kaduk activating, and they're forced to take it down quickly before the factory is destroyed by the explosion. After the tense battle, Venus and Snake make a daring escape just before the factory is completely destroyed in the fiery blast. They soon reach the hangar, and BB calls Snake to give him a rundown on the new information he's gathered. Copplethorne's operating system for the new Metal Gear, dubbed the Ego System, has been his main project. The first model was simply source code, while Model 2 was capable of duplicating a human mind into a computer application. Lucinda Copplethorne then used this operating system to enhance the original mind and give it, and its host, new powers and abilities, leading to the enhanced soldiers like Harib Serap and Golab. The data from these experiments led to a Model 3, but BB is unsure of what that is. Snake and Venus then reach the central operations room, but Venus is unable to find the Lucinda file. Shortly after, they are ambushed by another Model 2 test subject, Chigadale, who has the ability to hypnotize them. After battling him, Chigadale reveals more information to Snake as he lays dying. Chigadil reveals that through Copplethorne's experiments, he has been able to rebirth his dead wife Lucinda's mind. As it turns out, Copplethorne was purchasing children on the black market to find a suitable subject to transplant her mind into. He eventually found this subject in the young girl who he named Lucy, and he's currently preparing the fertilization of her mind with Lucinda's. After Chigadil dies, BB calls once again and tells Snake and Dalton that he found more information about Lucinda's death. 
Apparently, she died in the Serena public during the Praulia massacre while conducting research for the Ego system. After she died, her data was recovered and compiled into the Lucinda file. Snake and Venus are soon stopped by Vince, and another battle between them commences. After, Vince calls Radzinski and learns that he's escaping the island, as the ICC has decided to carry out their investigation. Vince then orders his men to retreat as well, leaving Snake and Venus to confront Copplethorn and Metal Gear with no opposition before he dies from his wounds. BB then calls Dalton once again to reveal more information he's found on Saint Logic. This time, BB reveals that the Praulia massacre was committed by Model 2 test subjects that went out of control during a field test. This makes the Lucinda file not only valuable for its test data, but also for the evidence that could lead to those responsible for the massacre being prosecuted. Dalton then tasks BB with somehow getting this information to the Secretary of Defense, as Wiseman is seemingly trying to keep it under wraps for his own gains. Snake and Venus then finally reach the main hangar and come face to face with the massive Metal Gear, codenamed Chayoth Ha Kadesh. Inside the beast are Copplethorn and Lucy, whose mind has been overtaken by the recreation of Lucinda. Copplethorn then finally refreshes Snake's memory of his past. In reality, this snake is not the real legendary mercenary Solid Snake. The real Solid Snake died after the events on Lobito Island, and his body was recovered by Saint Logic. Lucinda then used his genetic material to create a clone that could quell the Model 2 uprising in the Serena Republic. This Model 3 was none other than him, the amnesic snake, who killed Lucinda in his attempt to escape. Copplethorn then activates Metal Gear, forcing Snake and Venus to fight it off. After they destroy its arms and ray cannon, Lucy convinces Copplethorn to activate the Ego System to allow her to take full control over the mech. After this activation, however, Lucy reveals that she was only pretending to be Copplethorn's wife, and in reality, her ego combined with the artificial Lucinda's into a new personality. Lucy then reveals that Snake didn't kill Lucinda, as the woman had a fondness for him and helped him escape, effectively giving up her own life in the process. Lucy then takes control of Metal Gear, destroying the cockpit and killing Copplethorn. Another battle with Snake and Venus then ensues, with Snake and his cohort able to bring the mech down. Afterwards, Lucy is ejected from the machine, and she tells Snake where Takiyama and the Lucinda file are before dying from her wounds. Snake and Venus then head to Takiyama's location and find the woman alone. Suddenly, Wiseman gives Venus the order to kill Snake, and she holds him at gunpoint, revealing that Wiseman was the one behind the Praulia massacre. As it turns out, Wiseman sent the Model 2 test subjects to the area, which the Lucinda file would reveal. Venus, another test subject, was sent in to obtain the data and eliminate anyone who could incriminate Wiseman. Wiseman then reveals that BB had been discovered by the Secretary of Defense, who was also involved in this entire operation, leaving them hopeless. Snake then tells Takiyama to escape while he fights Venus one-on-one. -on -one. After Snake defeats her in battle, BB calls to reveal that he was able to use Chigadel's hypnotism techniques to convince the President of the United States to investigate the situation. More importantly, however, BB learned that Metal Gear's destruction has initiated a self-destruct mechanism of the entire facility. Venus, realizing her employer's game is now over, decides to work with Snake once again. Takiyama rejoins them, but when they try to escape, Snake stays behind to protect them while they can. Outside, Metal Gear arrives and fires its warhead, which lands in the surrounding waters before it deactivates. Venus and Takiyama reach safety, and afterwards, Takiyama is taken to a hospital. Wiseman is arrested for his shady activities, and Dalton is taken back into the FBI while being reprimanded for his actions. Venus goes on to live a normal life, working at a supermarket. 
Snake also survives the ordeal, revealing that he had crawled inside the Metal Gear's warhead, disabling it, and launching himself to safety. He then speaks with Dalton, who tells him that the entire incident, including the Lucinda file, has been revealed to the public. Dalton then gives Snake and his team his agreed-upon payment, and Snake goes off to live his new life. This brings us to the end of the Metal Gear Acid series, leaving us with one final Metal Gear story, that of 2018's Metal Gear Survive. This installment is an alternate, what-if style sequel to the events of Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zeroes, and possibly the last Metal Gear story Konami will ever tell. So, let's take it away. During Skullface's attack on Mother Base in 1975, one of the MSF soldiers provides cover fire for Big Boss and Kaz's escape chopper, preventing it from getting shot down. After the chopper flies off to safety, a wormhole inexplicably opens above the wreckage of Mother Base and begins to absorb everything in the area. Another MSF member named Seth is pulled up, and the soldier grabs his arm to try to rescue him. The soldier's efforts prove futile, however, as Seth is pulled into the wormhole, which closes, severing the soldier's arm in the process. Shortly after, the few remaining survivors recover as many bodies as they can and prepare to give them a burial at sea. Before they do, a U.S. government agent known as Goodluck, working for the Wardenclyffe section, a secret research organization, locates the soldier's body and has it recovered after it's sent out to sea. As it turned out, the soldier survived due to their contact with the wormhole, which has infected them with some kind of otherworldly organism that not only kept them alive, but caused their severed arm to grow back. This organism, which first appeared on Earth during the Vietnam War, has been known to eventually turn any human it infects into a zombie-like monster called a Wanderer. Fortunately, when the wormhole opened, the Wardenclyffe section was able to locate the organism's origin, a parallel dimension called Dite. Knowing that they can extract energy from Wanderers, called Kuban energy, that would drastically shift the balance of power in the world, the section sends a team called the Charon Corps into Dite. However, they soon lose contact with the team, leading Good Luck to execute an alternate plan. Now six months after the attack on Mother Base, Good Luck wakes the soldier. Due to their contact with the wormhole and subsequent infection, the soldier is the perfect candidate to follow the Charon Corps into Dite to find their research data on Kuban energy, as well as any survivors. The infection also leaves the soldier no choice but to accept this duty in hopes to find a way to prevent themselves from becoming a wanderer. The soldier is then sent into Dite, given the title of captain for this mission. The captain then searches the Charon Corps' base camp, coming across an XOF soldier named Reeve, who was sucked into the wormhole above Mother Base. The pair form a shaky partnership to escape from several wanderers to the base camp, composed of various Mother Base structures that were pulled in through the wormhole. There, they find the Charon Corps' artificial intelligence pod, Virgil AT-9, which awakens from its sleep protocol to find all of the information regarding the Charon Corps' research has been deleted. The captain then goes out to search for Virgil's memory boards, which have been scattered across the area. Through this data, Virgil uncovers research allowing them to build a device to utilize wormholes to quickly travel around Dite. During their travels, the captain uses an oxygen mask to travel through a hazardous area covered in what's only known as the dust. The captain then comes across a nurse named Miranda, rescuing her from wanderers and bringing her back to base camp, where she and Reeve butt heads over the more important task at hand, rescuing survivors or returning home. The captain is able to locate enough data to obtain the wormhole digger, which could transport them back to their home dimension. While doing so, however, they witness a giant creature that the Charon Corps called the Lord of Dust. After bringing the wormhole digger back to base camp and activating it, several wormholes open around the area, bringing attacking wanderers. The captain is forced to fight them off while the wormhole digger stabilizes, and while they're successful in protecting the camp, the device requires more energy to open the path back to Earth. After the wormhole digger shuts off, however, the team are able to receive a call from Wardenclyffe's section member and current leader of the DTA research program, Joseph Gruen. Gruen reveals that Goodluck had worked against his superior's orders by conducting the current mission, leading to his termination and Gruen's taking over. 
Gruen then instructs the captain to forget about collecting the research data, as he believes Goodluck only wanted it for his own means, and instead focus on getting home. The captain then goes back out to retrieve a more concentrated crystallized form of Kuban energy called Iris energy to power the wormhole digger. During this mission, the captain rescues two more castaways and brings them back to base camp, a young boy named Chris and a policeman named Nicholas. Once they obtain enough Iris energy for the wormhole digger, the captain activates it again. This causes another wave of wormholes to open up and bring forth more and more wanderers for the captain to fend off while the wormhole digger stabilizes. When the device is at 90%, Guren is able to call again and he issues a warning that the wormhole will collapse again unless they increase the device's output to its maximum. He also reveals that Goodluck installed some kind of black box inside of Virgil before his termination, which he believes was some sort of sabotage. Virgil wishes to speak to Goodluck directly but Gruen explains that this won't be possible, as good luck is dead from an apparent suicide. Virgil increases the wormhole digger's output to maximum, and the wormhole stabilizes. The energy released by the wormhole attracts the Lord of Dust, forcing the group to escape from its attack so they can quickly enter the wormhole. After they all make it through, Virgil closes the wormhole, getting them safely away from the Lord of Dust. When the group emerge on the other side, however, they find that they not only didn't make it home, but they're instead simply in a different section of Dite. As they find safety, Virgil plays the recording left by Goodluck before his death. In it, Goodluck reveals that he knew they wouldn't make it home, as he orchestrated all of the events so far. Goodluck then tasks the captain with one final, most imperative mission, to destroy the Lord of Dust using a powerful weapon in the area. He further states that a Charon Corps survivor is in the area, and he'll hold the key to find and use that weapon. After securing more memory boards for Virgil to gather information about this new area, the captain finds the Charon Corps survivor, holding Seth, the man who the captain initially tried to save from the wormhole above Mother Base, at gunpoint. The captain's regenerated arm starts to react, startling the survivor, who runs off. The captain takes Seth back to their new forward operating base, where he fills everyone in on what's been going on. Seth, who was discovered by the Charon Corps and recruited into their group, claims that the man holding him at gunpoint, Dan, had betrayed the rest of the Charon Corps, killing every single one of them besides himself. Seth then reveals that the weapon the group was sent in to secure was called Sehelanthropus. The captain locates Sehelanthropus, which is completely in disrepair, but as they analyze it, Dan arrives and holds them up. Virgil then speaks with Dan, who states that he didn't kill his squad mates, but rather claims that Seth did the deed. Before he can continue his story, however, the pair are attacked by wanderers and are split up in the ensuing chaos. The captain returns to the FOB and speaks with Seth, who predictably denies Dan's version of the past events. Regardless, Virgil determines that the railgun attached to Sehelanthropus must be the powerful weapon Good Luck told them to find. The captain heads back to Sehelanthropus and is successfully able to transport it back to base camp using a wormhole, but when they return, they're met with a shocking sight. Seth is holding Chris hostage, revealing that he has been infected by the same organism that turned the Wanderers, which he reveals to be called the Dread Dust. Seth, or rather the sentient Wanderer now in his form, had wiped out Charon Corps in an attempt to use the wormhole digger to travel to Earth and infect a whole new world with the Dread Dust. Seth then infects Virgil with the dust before turning his sights on the captain, using his abilities to trigger their arm's reaction once more. Reeve then arrives and shoots Seth before grabbing Chris and running to safety. Seth then transforms into a powerful wanderer, and the captain is forced to fight this beast. After a long and arduous duel, the captain destroys the monster that was once their friend, but in the wake of the battle, their arm begins to react once more and they collapse. When the captain awakens, Virgil reveals that through contact with Seth, the dread dust in their arm has activated, and they'll likely soon turn into a wanderer themselves. That is, unless they kill the Lord of Dust first. Virgil also explains that like the captain, its own reconnection with Seth allowed them to regain all of their access to the Charon Corps' research. Virgil then makes a shocking revelation. Dite was never another world, nor did it exist in another dimension. Dite is simply the Earth, around 200 years in the future. As it turns out, the Lord of Dust, an aggregate of the hive-minded Dread Dust, 
creates wormholes to the past in order to constantly obtain material to consume in an infinite time loop. In order to stop this cycle, the captain must use Sehelanthropus' weapons to destroy the Lord of Dust. But in doing so, the wormhole back to their own time will be closed forever. After making the last preparations to the weapon, the group discuss their plans for the final battle. Reeve tasks Chris with returning back to their time with a device containing the data on the wormhole technology so he can come back to rescue them after they destroy the Lord of Dust. Finally, the captain activates the wormhole digger one last time, attracting the Lord of Dust for their final battle. Once the Lord of Dust is stuck in a trap made of metallic archaea, the wormhole opens and the captain lifts Chris into it, returning him to the past to conduct his own mission. At this point, the captain can decide to leave the mission and their new friends behind and follow Chris into the wormhole. If this is the case, they simply wind up as one of the wandering soldiers Venom Snake finds in the past. If the captain instead decides to continue the mission, they are able to hold off the wanderer forces long enough to use Sehelanthropus' railgun to fire at the Lord of Dust. While this heavily damages the creature, it is able to simply repair the damage and attack the wormhole. Virgil then reveals that since the Lord of Dust has no concept of death, it cannot die. Virgil then plays another, final message from Goodluck, who reveals himself to be none other than Chris. Chris was sent back to 1943 and spent his entire life working to get into Wardenclyffe's section so he could provide these recordings that could eventually lead to them destroying the Lord of Dust. Virgil then reveals the only way to defeat the beast would be for the AI to become one with it and reveal to it the concept of death which Virgil inherited from what remained of Seth's human mind. Virgil then flies into the Lord of Dust, and the captain fires the railgun once again. This time, the Lord of Dust understands death, so the shot destroys it for good. The survivors look upon the dead beast, before Reeve leads them back to camp to find their way home. There, while they find the wormhole now closed, Virgil reveals that it survived the blast, having been designed to survive a nuclear explosion. The AI then resumes its job as mission support, promising to help the captain find a way back to their own time someday. Back in this new version of 1975, with the Lord of Dust's time loop destroyed, good luck is scolded by Joseph Gruen for predicting a wormhole opening above Mother Base, which didn't happen. After Gruen leaves, good luck realizes that this means his friends were successful, and he thanks his friends and the captain aloud before vowing to complete his own mission of bringing them home. And this finally brings us to the end of Suggestive Gaming's journey through the Metal Gear franchise. Through 35 years, 20 plus games, and several snakes, this vast storyline has touched the hearts of many gamers through its lifespan. One of those gamers being myself. I rarely get personal on this series, but seeing as this will likely be the largest video I'll ever make, I think I'm due for a bit of a celebration. This video took, on the whole, over a year of my life to complete, with at least six months of that time solely dedicated to this one video. I wouldn't make that commitment if this wasn't something I truly cared about, and I know Greg wouldn't have dedicated his own time and effort to proofread the script and of course provide his own voice for the video if he didn't have a deep love for this series as well. Metal Gear, and specifically its characters and story, are very near and dear to my heart as they are to Greg's and so many others out there. I can only hope that what we've put together for all of you was not only a worthy trip through one of the best stories ever told, but also that it serves as a love letter to my favorite game series of all time. Hey everybody, I'd like to take this time to thank everyone who made this possible, specifically Greg once again for all of his help. If I had to record all of this voice over myself, this video never would have happened, so make sure you check out all of his goings on in the description to show your support. I'd also like to thank my fiance for putting up with me basically being non-existent and locked away in my office while working tirelessly on this project for like a year. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you, the viewers. Without you folks enjoying what I do so much, I wouldn't still be doing this, let alone making a video this long and extensive. I even asked if you wanted me to split it up into multiple parts in a poll, and you all overwhelmingly voted for me to just release it as one epic video. So, I thank you for that feedback. As always, if you'd like to support, you can click the link for my Patreon or become a channel member in the description. 
Besides financially, a like and a subscribe go a long way with supporting me as well, as does a comment suggesting what you'd like to see me cover next. Thanks again, everyone. I'll see you much sooner, hopefully, for the next one.